Business Audio presents the unabridged recording of 69 Million Things I Hate About You by Kira Archer, performed by Kate Waldron. Chapter 1 Kirsten Abbott jogged on her tiptoes after her boss, Marie, trying to keep her heels from clacking too loudly on the marble tile while still managing to keep up. Moving at high speed through the office, laden down with coffee cups, coats, bags, briefcases, file folders, laptops, and any other number of items had become second nature to Kirsten. She handed off two of the three coffee cups to her besties who worked in the same office, Izzy and Cassie, who each mouthed, thank you, and quickly went back to looking busy. Marie wasn't technically their boss but she was the first assistant to Cole Harrington, president and founder of Harrington Enterprises, the biggest think tank and development firm in Manhattan, which made her a sort of supervisor over Izzy, Cassie, and the rest of the assistants in the office. Kirsten was second assistant, which made her Marie's go-to girl. All the work, none of the credit. That went to Marie. Keep up! Marie said over her shoulder. Kirsten jumped, almost spilling the remaining coffee in her hand, and hightailed it to catch up to Marie, who was marching straight for the dragon's lair. Kirsten made it two feet inside before the sight of Mr. Harrington froze her. The man was on his treadmill, in a pair of loose sweatpants that fit low on his hips, and nothing else. And from the looks of him, he'd been on the thing a while. A few beads of sweat ran in rivulets down the hard, planed muscles of his chest and abs, and whatever the hell those amazing V-muscles were called, pointed in stark relief to what one tabloid had called the treasure every woman in Manhattan wanted. Kirsten had scoffed when she'd read that. Seeing everything up close and personal had her rethinking her skepticism— when one errant drop slipped beneath the band of his sweatpants, Kirsten nearly lost her grip on the coffee. Lucky little sweat drop. Marie handed Mr. Harrington a towel and followed him to the bathroom hidden behind a cleverly disguised wooden panel in the wall. She stood outside the door, grimacing at the sound of the shower turning on. After a minute or two, she finally spoke, raising her voice to be heard over the running shower. Mr. Harrington, I'll be out of touch this weekend, but Kirsten will be on call for you, and... The water cut off and his voice floated through the door. The conference is this weekend, and I'm the keynote speaker, he said. I need you there. It'll be much easier to reschedule your thing than it would be to change the conference at this late date. My... Thing? Marie took a deep breath, her fists clenched at her sides. Oh, shit. She was going nuclear. Mr. Harrington came out of the bathroom, buttoning a fresh shirt. Yes, your thing. Whatever it is, cancel it. Change it. Move it. I don't care. My thing, as you call it, is my wedding, Marie shouted. I've told you about it repeatedly. I've spent over a year planning it. It can't be rescheduled. Kirsten's jaw dropped. No one yelled at Mr. Harrington. Hell, no one even questioned him. If you can't fulfill your job obligations, Marie flung her hands up. Don't bother firing me. I quit. She tossed a ring of keys and a phone onto his desk and marched out, pausing only long enough to grab her coat and purse from her own desk. Oh, my God! That felt good! She glanced at Kirsten and snorted. Good luck! And then she breezed out, with a spring in her step and a smile on her face. Kirsten stood rooted to the spot. She risked a glance back at Mr. Harrington, who was slipping into his suit jacket and coming her way. Oh, shit, she whispered under her breath. He finally pinned his gaze on her, looking her up and down, and she prayed he hadn't heard her. Those eyes of his were startling. 
She'd never gotten a close enough look to really see the color, and the steel gray with a darker ring of almost black surrounding them was unexpectedly mesmerizing. He took his coat and coffee from her. Who are you? Kirsten, sir. Her voice was barely audible, and she cleared her throat. Your second assistant. Well, Kirsten, you've just been promoted. Let's hope you last longer than the last three. She opened her mouth to correct him on her name, but before she could, he was already firing orders at her as he went back to his desk and started packing up his briefcase. I have a meeting in 20 minutes with my project manager, and after that I should have dinner reservations at... He frowned and Kirsten piped up. Le Bernardin, sir. Your reservation is for 8 o'clock. Thank you. Confirm that and clear my schedule for the rest of the evening. At least her first task was an easy one. I confirmed it this afternoon, Mr. Harrington. You're all set. Working with Marie had been great training. She'd pretty much been running Mr. Harrington's life anyway. Only now she had to deal with Harrington himself. The prospect sent jolts of terror and excitement zinging through her. She could finally show what she was made of and get credit for the work she was already doing, not to mention a nice raise. Her bank account would be happy to see that. The $43 currently sitting in there would love the company, and if she had to spend her days glued to the side of her asshat of a boss, well, at least he was easy to look at. Wonderful, he said, turning those piercing eyes of his back on her. He stared long enough that she dropped her gaze, looking down to see if she'd spilled something on her blouse or had forgotten a button or something. Nope, nothing wrong. She met his gaze again, and this time she didn't look away. Yes, the man practically made her shake in her knockoff Louboutins, but there was no reason he needed to know that. His lips twitched with a hint of amusement. Call me Cole. Kirsten blinked at him. Marie had never called him by his first name. No one did. Mr. Harrington makes me feel old. I don't look old yet, do I? He asked in that charming bedroom voice of his that she could swear would melt M&Ms while they were still in the bag. Her eyes flicked over him, making his lips twitch further. No, sir. No, sirs. Just Cole. Yes, sir. Damn, she couldn't stop. He made a sound that might have been a snort, and then turned back to his desk to grab his briefcase. Here, he said, handing her the phone Marie had left. Keep it with you at all times. I keep weird hours. Consider yourself on call. All the contacts you'll need should be in there. He paused for a moment, his brow furrowing. Get a hold of HR. Tell them to send over the paperwork for your new position and we'll make everything official. I'm assuming you know where Marie kept my calendar and all the other information you'll need. Kirsten nodded, but he wasn't really paying attention to her as he rattled off more instructions. Make sure you're up to date on all my pending contracts and current projects. We've got deadlines to meet, and I have no intention of missing anything because of this ridiculous upset. If you need help with passwords or anything to get into the computers, get IT up here to get everything changed around. See security on your way out for your new badge. You'll need an upgrade to have access to all the floors and offices. He stopped and glanced back at her. Shouldn't you be writing this down? No, sir, I've got it. Thankfully, she was quick on her feet and had a memory to match. Clearly, Mr. Harrington, or... Cole was going to keep her hopping. Cole, and I hope so. He went back to gathering his things, moving about his office like a mini tornado looking for a place to land. He grabbed the ring of keys Marie had left and tossed them at her. These should get you into the building, all the offices, my apartment, and anywhere else you might need access to. I don't know which is which, so you'll have to figure it out. My security company will need to be notified to change the passwords for the keypads at my apartment. You'll need to be there for the voice recognition and fingerprint software to be up to date. 
There should be a list of people somewhere on Marie's desk who will need to be notified that you're my new assistant. Make that happen. I don't want to deal with delays on anything while we argue with someone over whether or not you're authorized to have the information. Switch Marie's plane ticket and hotel reservation to your name for the conference this weekend, or make your own reservations if needed. I assume you're available to go. He gave her a look that would freeze a polar bear's balls, and she nodded. Thankfully, she had no life. She'd rather be making money than sitting at home with Ben and Jerry's. Good, he said. You'll need to change her info to yours for anything else conference-related. Also, he stopped and grimaced a little. Make sure Marie's benefits remain in place until she finds new employment, and put a reference letter on file for her. In fact, one of the firms I met with last week is looking for someone. Send them a recommendation. Also, authorize a severance package and double the usual amount. He gathered up the rest of his stuff and headed for the door. He paused just before he walked out and sent her a wedding gift. Kirsten's jaw dropped again, and this time Mr. Harrington, Cole, did give her a smile. What? I'm not always a dick. Not always, but often. Mr. Larson, Cole's partner, said from the doorway where he'd apparently been waiting. He smiled and winked at Kirsten. Cole brushed by him, muttered, don't even think about it, and kept on going. Mr. Larson shrugged and followed him out, leaving Kirsten standing there staring after them, shell-shocked, her mind still trying to process what had just happened. She'd been thrown into the deep end, no doubt about it. On the bright side, her salary would nearly double. Then again, she knew she'd be earning every penny of it. Cole Harrington was the dream of practically every woman in the world. Young, gorgeous, richer than God, and in many opinions, more powerful. He'd developed one of the most popular dating apps around, almost before he was old enough to date himself owned entire islands, gave generously to charities, and loved puppies and children. Everybody loved him, except the people who worked for him directly. The phone in her hand buzzed a notification before she could even finish the thought. And so it begins, she muttered. Chapter 2 So, new assistant, huh? Brooks Larson, Cole's longtime friend and business partner, sat across the table, nursing the dregs of a glass of wine while looking at him with that gleam in his eye he always got when he had an ulterior motive. Yes, and? Brooks shrugged. Nothing. You just go through them pretty fast, especially for a guy who refuses to sleep with his secretary like any other self-respecting CEO. Cole sighed and pushed away his half-eaten dinner, focusing his attention back on the files on his tablet. Brooks had been his best friend and business partner for the better part of a decade, but the man had no filter. This isn't 1950, Brooks. She's my executive assistant, not a secretary, and she's there to work, not get hit on by a sleazy boss. Mixing business and pleasure is a good way to fail at both. Besides, I need my assistants focused on work, not me, or shit would never get done. I thought you were their business. My business is their business. My personal life is off limits. Brooks shrugged. If you say so, though I'm not sure how you get anything done with the revolving door you've got going on. What did you do to piss off Marie? I needed her to work the weekend. And she quit over that? I thought that was part of the job description. It is. She had plans. What kind of plans? Cole took a sip of his water and went back to staring at his tablet, not wanting to answer, but he knew Brooks wouldn't leave it alone. Her wedding. Brooks stared at him like he'd grown two heads. You expected her to cancel her own wedding so she could work? Cole grimaced. It sounded so much worse coming out of Brooks's mouth. 
She knew I needed her at the conference. It was non-negotiable. Why the woman would book her wedding the same weekend is beyond me. Did it ever occur to you she may have had the wedding booked long before the conference was set up? Women plan those things years in advance. Cole sighed again and scrolled through the file on his tablet. I didn't give it that much thought. At some point, she would have realized they were the same weekend and she should have changed her plans. Her job was to make my life easier. I paid her very well to be at my beck and call. It was not my job to accommodate her. Brooks' brows rose and Cole squashed the slight twinge of guilt that tried to take hold. Yeah, he'd been an ass. What else was new? Didn't change the facts. I extended her benefits and doubled her severance package, neither of which I had to offer at all since she quit. But despite her failings, she was a decent assistant, while she lasted. Brooks shook his head. You sentimental devil, you. Cole ignored that. Don't you have work to do? Always. Now, back to this assistant problem you have. I don't have an assistant problem. That's one of the reasons I've always got more than one. Right. You're the king of backups. I'll always have a backup for everything, and you never have to worry about being without, right? Cole shrugged. It's worked so far. Fine. So get another backup. This one is seriously hot. I hadn't noticed. Then the first thing you should do is have her schedule you an eye appointment. I thought you were busy, not dead. She has that sexy librarian thing nailed. Cole wasn't blind or dead. He was lying through his teeth so he didn't have to put up with his friend giving him shit. How the hell Kirsten had been in his building without him noticing her, he'd never know. His only excuse was that Marie must have been hiding her or keeping her so busy she never managed to be in his presence. Because one glance at those big brown eyes staring up at him, her thick blonde hair just begging to be released from her tight bun, had his body screaming. Brooks was still rambling on. Even her name, Keston, so close to kiss Kirsten. What? Her name is Kirsten, not Keston. Then why did you call her Keston? Because I didn't catch it when she said it, and that's what I thought it was. She didn't correct you? I know. Why? Cole sighed again and flicked his finger on the tablet a little harder than necessary, sending the digital pages flying. I don't know. You'd have to ask her. Hmm. Maybe I will. Maybe over dinner at no. Cole glared at him. Brooks wasn't going to get near Kirsten, even if Cole had to set her up with a full-time bodyguard. Jealous already. Cole rubbed his forehead, trying to stave off the ache that talking to Brooks often brought on. Good assistants are hard to find. As you rightly pointed out, I have a hard time keeping them around. It's bad enough with my first assistants, but the second assistants rarely last longer than a month. But from what I can tell, Kirsten has basically been running things since she was hired. Marie had her doing everything already, so there won't be any irritating transition period to disrupt my life. I don't want you chasing her off, or I'll have to go through the trouble of training someone new, especially since I have yet to hire someone to be her backup. How'd you find out her real name? Cole held up his tablet. Had HR send over her file? Anything interesting in there? Yes. Now go away. Why? Do you have a hot date showing up? I don't have time to date. Brooks scoffed at that. You need to start making the time. Maybe it would loosen you up a bit. Cole ignored that. He had no trouble getting a date when he needed one for whatever function he might need to attend but he rarely let his associations get too involved. It worked great. He had the company of a beautiful woman when he wanted it, and his life to himself the rest of the time. No fuss, no future. He'd yet to meet a woman who inspired any hint of desire to change his M.O. 
The sudden vision of big brown eyes blinking at him sprang up and wouldn't leave. He shook his head in irritation and did his best to shove Kirsten's image to the back of his mind. Dating makes women clingy, he said. I don't do clingy. I do work. Yes, I've noticed, Brooks said, his voice thick with an implied eye roll. What about that woman, Betsy or Becky or Rebecca? Yes, her. You dated her for a while. Cole frowned, irritated at the reminder of his last girlfriend. She hadn't worked out any more than the others had. She objected to the prenup. Brooks raised an eyebrow. There was talk of a prenup. I didn't realize it had been that serious. It wasn't, but she started hinting around, so I showed her the prenup. That's usually enough to get them to lay off the wedding nonsense. Why? Prenups are fairly standard procedure for someone in your position. Cole sighed. Because my prenup isn't standard. We both agree to leave the union with what we had when we entered it and with what was individually made during. Brooks' eyes widened. In other words, they'd get nothing. Correct. No matter the reason for the breakup, even if you cheat? Correct. And if you die? Then our union would be very decisively over. Well, obviously, but... It doesn't change anything. Brooks blew out a long breath. Well, no wonder they don't stick around. Cole frowned again. He knew his prenup was a bit unorthodox, but he had his reasons. He'd had it drawn up after he'd made his first hundred million and had his heart broken by the first woman who'd been more interested in money than matrimony— it had taken several million to keep her from writing a tell-all book and selling it to the highest bidder. Now his girlfriend signed non-disclosure agreements, and anyone even hoping to be more than a girlfriend was going to get the prenup. So far, none had stuck around long enough to actually use it. I don't see why it's such an issue, Cole said. Brooks laughed. <laughs> really? The woman would be marrying me, not my money. She'd get to enjoy a certain lifestyle during the marriage, of course, but if the marriage ends, I don't see why she should continue to enjoy what I worked hard to make, especially since the women I date typically make a better-than-average living on their own. You're never going to find someone who will agree to that. Someone who loved me more than my money would. It was always the same. They always wanted to be Mrs. Harrington, not because they loved him, but because, as his wife, they'd have better access to his fortune, a hefty settlement if it didn't work out, widow money if they could stick it out for the long haul, bonus money if kids were ever a part of the picture. Hence, the prenup. He'd probably never follow through with it, not that he'd admit that to Brooks. But it didn't matter since so far no one had ever loved him enough to try it out. A document stating they had got nothing was enough to make them all run. Well, good luck with that, Brooks said. He finished the last swallow of wine in his glass and wiped his mouth. I don't need luck. I just need to focus on work. Brooks shook his head and gave him that motherly look that made Cole cringe. He glared, and Brooks laughed, holding his hands up in defeat. All right, all right. I'll leave you to it. I've got a few late-night plans to get to anyway. Cole couldn't hold back an indulgent smile. What a shock. You're just jealous, he said. He drained the last of his wine and stood to leave. I'll see you tomorrow. Cole watched him leave and then turned back to his files doing his best to ignore the now-familiar twinge of regret that poked at him. His life was what it was. He occasionally wished he had someone, but they all wanted one thing, and it wasn't him. Sometimes he didn't know why he bothered, but hell, even moguls got lonely. He sighed, 
gathered his things, and shoved a few hundreds into the restaurant's billfold and walked out into the night. Alone. He was better off that way. At least alone he couldn't get hurt. Used. He grimaced and pulled out his phone. He might as well get some work done. He dialed Kirsten and asked her to meet him at the office. If she was surprised that he was calling her into work at 9 p.m., she didn't say anything. Just agreed to meet him in his office. She was working out perfectly so far. He headed back toward his office with an extra spring in his step, re-energized and ready to work. Chapter 3 Cole picked up his coffee cup to take a drink, but his lips met nothing but air. He stared into the empty mug. Okay, the day had been long when he couldn't remember drinking a single sip of coffee, let alone draining it dry. He put the cup down with a thump and turned back to the files in front of him with a scowl. The paperwork that wallpapered his life never seemed to go away. Ten minutes later, he was reaching for his cup again, only this time he found it refilled. He hadn't heard Kirsten come in, but then he rarely did when he was focused on work. Plus, the woman moved like a cat. She'd scared the hell out of him more times than he cared to admit in the six months since she'd been promoted. He was tempted to put a bell on her just so he'd know when she was about. She removed a stack of files from his desk to return them to the filing cabinet in the corner of the office, and the gentle scent of her perfume floated over him, something subtly floral that reminded him of the magnolia tree in his grandmother's front yard. He'd always loved that scent. It was home to him. Kirsten had only recently started wearing it, and he wasn't sure he approved of the new development. He needed to concentrate, not sniff the air like a schnauzer every time the woman walked by. New perfume? he asked. She looked up from the folder she was filing, her mahogany-colored eyes widening slightly. Yeah, so he didn't often ask her personal questions. First time for everything. Lotion, actually. It was part of a bath set. A gift? Her lips twitched, and she turned back to her filing. Yes, from you, last Christmas. Ah, of course. Which meant she'd either purchased it for herself or one of the other assistants had. They took care of all the shopping for that kind of stuff for him. Well, as long as she'd ended up with something she liked. The phone rang, and she hurried back to her adjacent office to answer it. A moment later, the intercom beeped. Your mother, sir. Take a message, he said. Blowing his mother off was going to bite him in the ass later, but he didn't have time to deal with her at the moment. He needed to get back to work. It seemed like he'd been on an eternal carousel of contracts, conferences, mergers, and board meetings since he'd sold his first app back in college. The money had enabled him to start a development company, which had quickly gone lucrative. It had been a ceaseless parade of projects ever since. Though, as far as problems go, steady, profitable work wasn't so bad. Kirsten came back in, carrying another stack of files. It would probably be easier and save a ton of trees to keep everything digital. But being on the computer 24-7 was killing his eyes. Paper didn't bother him nearly as much. He reached for his mug. One sip and he held the cup back out, already cold, again. Kirsten took the cup without a word and marched back out. He returned to the paperwork in front of him until she came back with his newly filled cup. This time, the sweetened liquid pleasantly burned down his throat, the bitterness hidden under two creams and four sugars. I don't know why you bother giving him the coffee, a male voice said. Cole looked up to see Brooks waltz in and drop into a chair in front of his desk. You should just stick a straw in the sugar dispenser and call it good. It's not that sweet, Cole said. Ah, don't get too offended. Something about you should be sweet. A snort that quickly turned into a gentle cough came from Kirsten and Cole raised his eyebrows. He'd never heard such a sound come from her before. 
Then again, he'd only been working face-to-face with her for half a year, and she'd been nothing but strictly professional. Not that that had made those months any less distracting. Oh, she was an amazing assistant. Anticipated his needs before he knew what they were himself half the time. She had a quick intellect and ran a tight ship. His office was a well-oiled machine that she kept running so smoothly he had never had to worry about anything. She was no-nonsense, dressed almost exclusively in pencil skirts and button shirts, her blonde hair usually slicked back into a bun or ponytail. But the more prim and proper she behaved, the more Cole was tempted to break his anti-office romance rule and rile her up just to see if she had any passion in her for anything other than spreadsheets and color-coded files— The woman was wound so tightly he was afraid that one of these days she'd come apart at the seams. "'Can I get anything for you, Mr. Larson?' she asked Brooks. He shook his head. "'No, thanks. I'm good for now.' He winked at Kirsten, and she smiled, her cheeks flushing slightly. Cole frowned as she went back to her office. "'Quit flirting with my assistant,' Cole said. "'Why?' Someone should. That woman is like a champagne bottle someone shook up. And you will not be popping any corks. You calling dibs? Cole's frown deepened. You are so juvenile. Brooks shrugged, completely unfazed by Cole's bad mood. Someone needs to be around here. You are more than uptight enough for the both of us. Just because I prefer working to fucking every female that crosses my path doesn't mean I'm uptight. Brooks slapped a hand to his chest in mock offense. You make me sound like such a nympho. You are a nympho. What are you doing here anyway? You're... Cole glanced at his watch. An hour and a half early. I'm starving. And since Kirsten has to practically force food down your throat, I know you haven't eaten. I thought maybe we could grab something before the game tonight. Cole glanced at his watch again. He, Brooks, and two buddies they'd met through their various ventures had a regular poker game every Thursday night. Brooks claimed it helped them practice their poker faces for business meetings. Cole was fairly sure it was an excuse to drink his best scotch and legally take money from all his friends. If Brooks wasn't a genuine card shark, he was damn close. I've got a few more files I need to go over first. I can have Kirsten order something up. Brooks groaned. Come on, Cole. Get your ass out of the office for once. Cole sighed and pushed away from his desk. Brooks wasn't going to leave him alone until he agreed to go. And he had a point. Cole hadn't left the office all day. It would be nice to get out for a minute. Fine. Let me just... Before he could call Kirsten in, she poked her head back into the door. I'm going to head out, Mr. Harrington. Is there anything else you need before I go? He'd given up on getting her to call him Cole after the first week. Stubborn woman. Yes. A slight tightening of her lips was the only indication she gave that he might have shattered her hopes for the night. He pointed to a stack of about fifteen thick file folders. Take those home and have a quick look over them. She gathered them up, jaw clenched, and he found himself waiting to see if she'd argue. Refuse to do it? Yell at him for ruining her weekend even more than he already had? Stick her tongue out at him when she thought he wasn't watching. Something. Instead, she quickly flipped through them. Certainly, sir. What are they? She asked. Background information for a new project. I need you to tell me if anything in there is useful. Are you looking for something specific? He sighed and sat back in his chair. I don't know what I'm looking for, as I haven't gone through them yet. That's what you are here for. Yes, sir, she said, her voice tight but still controlled. He had no doubt she was seething, but she hid it well. I'll see if I can find anything useful. Thank you, Cruston. That'll be all. Kirsten's eyes flashed, and for a moment, 
Cole thought the moment had finally come. He could practically see the ass chewing trembling on her lips. Any time, sir, she said, her tone cool. Impressive restraint, he had to admit. Had their roles been reversed, he'd have definitely lost his temper by now. He barely held in his exasperated sigh. Her expression warmed slightly when she bid Brooks good night, and Cole once again had to keep himself from complaining. Neither one of them had done anything remotely inappropriate. It was none of his business even if they had, except for the inconvenience it would be to him. As soon as she'd left, Brooks turned to him. Creston, Really? Cole shrugged. I'm running out of things to call her. It never occurred to me she'd let me go on calling her the wrong name this long. I've had to start getting creative. Brooks chuckled and shook his head. I'm surprised she hasn't dumped your coffee on your head or something else equally painful that you totally deserve. I think she's come close a time or two. I'd prefer it to the ice queen routine she usually has going on. If she annoys you so much, why don't you fire her and get someone else? Cole frowned again. I never said she annoyed me. Besides, she's an excellent assistant, and those are hard to find. So keep your hands off her, he added, a little more vehemently than he'd intended. Brooks held his hands up. Hey, I know the rules. Poker club etiquette. No dipping dicks in anyone's company ink. Isn't that the saying? Cole snorted. Close enough. No wives or girlfriends, no sisters, and no assistants. I got it. Or mothers. Oh, one time. Cole laughed. Let's go eat. Finally. Brooks pushed himself out of the chair and followed Cole out of the office. They were just in time to see the elevator door closing on Kirsten's pert little ass. Brooks let out a low whistle. Don't know how you do it, man, but more power to you. I'd have to fire her so I could date her. Cole glared at him. You don't date. For her, I'd make an exception. Cole kept his mouth shut in the interest of maintaining his friendship. Brooks was just being Brooks. So why the hell did it bother him so bad that all that testosterone was directed at Kirsten? Chapter 4 Kirsten hurried out of the little convenience store, lotto ticket tucked safely in her bag. Hopefully the little slip of paper or one like it would pay off one of these days. Probably not a great retirement plan, but hell, nothing short of winning the lotto was going to give her enough freedom to ditch her miserable job for good and do something amazing with her life. Not that she'd quite figured out what that was yet, either. She hurried up the block to Cole's apartment building and nodded at the doorman, giving him a grateful smile when he held the door open for her. Many days, she'd stay and chat, but she was already running late for her night with the girls. She headed straight through the lobby to the elevator, using her keycard to gain access to Cole's floor. If she took care of things here quickly, she should be able to get home with enough time to get some food in her before they drew the lotto numbers. The doors opened onto the huge loft space that was a tasteful mix of old-world elegance and modern lines, with every smart device known to man tucked away in some corner or another. The place was totally wired, but hidden cleverly enough you'd never know it. Kirsten marched through the entryway and into the kitchen area where Linda Rosnizikov, Cole's housekeeper, was straightening up. Good evening, Mrs. Roz, Kirsten said, giving the woman a warm smile. Hello, dear. I'll be finished up in a bit. No rush. I'll be a few minutes. Mrs. Roz nodded and went back to her work. Kirsten made her way upstairs to Cole's bedroom, her eyes straying as they always did to his bed. Yes, the man was aggravating to the thousandth degree, but he was pretty to look at and he'd be sexy as hell laid out on that bed. Of course, the fact that she was there to lay out his clothes for the week kind of killed the image. 
She went into his giant closet and took out her phone, pulling up his schedule. She made sure all his week's clothes were in the pile for dry cleaning and went to work pulling outfits for the coming week. The closet had a long cubby for each day. She selected seven suits, shirts, and ties for each day and hung them in their respective cubbies, adding socks, shoes, and underwear to the shelf above each rack. Cole always went to the office, no matter the day. She also added a golf outfit for Tuesday, something for tennis and more casual drinks at the club clothing for Wednesday, a second less powerful suit for the art gallery opening Thursday, a club-appropriate outfit for Friday. She shook her head and laid out a fresh pair of socks and underwear with each outfit. Okay, the guy was busy. She'd give him that. And she had no doubt it saved him a ton of time every day to just walk into his closet, go to that day's cubby, and pull out whatever outfit he needed for wherever he was going without having to even think about it. She got it. Really. But seriously? Wasn't there a limit to this whole pay-people-to-run-your-life thing? Though, hell, she'd love to have someone take care of her needs half as well. Once she got his clothing for the week squared away, she did a quick sweep through the bathroom, making sure he was set for toothpaste, shampoo, soap, and anything else he needed. Then she went back out to the kitchen for her bi-weekly meeting with Mrs. Ross. The housekeeper was already at the counter, tablet and calendar pulled up and ready to go. I've got his dry cleaning ready to be sent out, and everything else is good to go for another week or so. Mrs. Ross nodded and made a note on her list. Appointments? she asked. None for this week. He has a dentist appointment coming up next month, but we'll go over that closer to the day, in case it needs to be moved. Mrs. Ross snorted. His appointments almost always had to be moved at least once. Here are his requests for meals this week, Kirsten said, handing Mrs. Ross a list. He won't be home most nights again, but... Mrs. Ross nodded. I'll make sure there's food he can reheat in the fridge. Kirsten smiled. They had this routine down pat. Excellent. All right, then. I think we're good to go for a few days. Make sure he gets out the door by eight every day. If anything comes up that affects that, I'll text you, as always. Mrs. Ross nodded and then cocked her head, looking at Kirsten. Are you hungry? There's plenty to eat in there, she said, jerking her thumb at the fridge. I can heat you up something. Under normal circumstances, I'd say definitely, but my roommates have pizza waiting. Mrs. Ross grinned at her. Well, get going. I'll take care of everything over here. Kirsten nodded and gathered her things. I'll see you Wednesday. Mrs. Ross waved her out. Kirsten punched the number for the ground floor and looked at her phone. 9.43. What a freaking long-ass day. She hurried to the subway, managed to slip between the train doors just as they were closing, and slumped into a seat. She took a couple of deep breaths and tried to will the stresses of the day to dissipate. It would probably take less willpower and more like a few drinks and a half a pint of Ben and Jerry's to really relax. She wrapped her arms around her bag and leaned back against the seat. She had a few minutes to indulge in her favorite pastime, fantasizing about her boss. Not about his incredible smoke-gray eyes with the dark gray ring that had once had her envisioning staring deep into their depths amidst heated, passionate kisses. It should be a crime for such dreamy eyes to belong to such an ass of a man. No, her fantasies were kinkier than that. Like dumping his coffee on his head the next time he grunted at her with his empty cup— she wondered how quickly she'd be escorted from the building if she gave in to the temptation and upended the thing, or took that pen of his that he loved so much and shoved it up his nose, or told him exactly what he could do with all the files that were oh so important, even though he had no idea why. Of course, while it might be incredibly satisfying, incredibly, it might inflict serious damage 
and she didn't truly want to hurt him most of the time. But it would be amazing to watch him squirm for a minute, since that was never going to happen, envisioning a little retribution helped pass the time. Then again, going through those files he'd given her would be a better use of her time. Maybe if she could find something useful before she hit home, she'd be able to salvage some of her weekend. At least until Cole called her to come find his favorite pen or pick him up a new toothbrush or some other equally irritating task. She pulled out the files and flipped through the first couple. Land measurements, building specs, sale histories. What was this stuff for? Cole didn't typically deal with real estate. He bought ideas and turned them into apps and products. But these were all files on various properties throughout the state. Strange. Since she had no real clue what the man wanted, she arranged the files in order of best to worst purchase option and then put them back in her briefcase. She'd go over them more at length later. Maybe. It was Saturday night, and she'd been working for ten days straight without a real break. She was going to take the next day off, whether he liked it or not. She'd known the job would be involved. But if he called her one more time in the middle of the night to ask her some question that could easily wait until morning, she'd pull her hair out. Her jaw throbbed, and she realized she'd been clenching it again. It happened so often she'd had to get a guard to wear at night, so she didn't grind her teeth down to nubs while she slept. She closed her eyes and did the breathing exercises her yoga instructor had taught her. Breathe in, calm, serene, life is beautiful. Breathe out, push the frustrations away. Breathe in, breathe out. She continued breathing until she had relaxed enough to save her enamel another grinding and went back to fantasizing over all the ways she could make Cole's life miserable, if she didn't want to keep her job, of course. Two trains and a brisk four-block walk later, she was running up the five flights of stairs to the apartment she shared with her friends. She actually enjoyed the lack of elevator in the building. It was the only workout she got every day. She didn't have time to hit the gym. Plus, she loved the old-world feel of the place. Only one of the many reasons she'd resisted Cole's offer to install her in one of the apartments he owned closer to his home. The last thing she wanted was to be more accessible to him. He'd never stop calling. "'You're late!' Izzy yelled over her shoulder the second Kirsten got through the door. Kirsten dumped her bag and kicked off her shoes, accepting the plate piled high with pizza that Cassie handed her with a thankful groan. Food, she said, inhaling deeply. Her stomach growled in anticipation. Izzy passed her a glass of wine as she slumped onto the couch. Hungry? she asked. Kirsten nodded, depositing her glass on the coffee table so she could shove a huge portion of the slice into her mouth. I ate half a blueberry scone for breakfast and a handful of the leftover crumbs for lunch. Cassie frowned. Boss man wouldn't let you out of his sight long enough to let you eat? Kirsten shrugged. To be fair, he didn't eat either. Izzy rolled her eyes. You don't need to be fair to that man. He works you to death. There should be a law against calling you in on a Saturday. Yeah, well, that's one of the perks of being the assistant to the big boss— when he works, I work. Izzy snorted. Yeah, lucky you. He always works. And unlike him, we have plans tonight. Speaking of, Cassie said, did you get it? Kirsten nodded and gestured to her bag. In there. Cassie hurried over and dug through the bag until she found the lotto ticket. Every time the jackpot went over $100 million, they each kicked in a couple bucks to purchase three tickets from three different locations, with the plan to split any winnings three ways. Their tickets to freedom. Of course, she'd been buying a ticket at least once a month since she'd been old enough to buy one for herself and had yet to win more than $20, but she remained hopeful. Cassie put the tickets on the coffee table. 
Please don't tell me those files I saw are more work for you to do this weekend. Okay, I won't tell you. Seriously. He calls you in on Saturday and then gives you work to take home? I don't know how you keep from shoving his coffee where the sun don't shine. Kirsten sighed. That would be incredibly fun. But aside from coffee enemas being supposedly healthy and therefore a horrible act of revenge, I've got three very good reasons why I can't do that. Bills, rent, and food. I've kind of grown accustomed to luxuries like cereal and shelter. So, unfortunately, I need my job too much to give in to my fantasies of paying him back for every miserable second I've spent as his assistant. I'm sure you could find something else, Izzy said, snagging another slice of pizza. Kirsten shook her head. I've looked. While Cole Harrington might be one of the biggest D-bags on the planet, he also pays well and offers killer benefits. And like I said, I have to pay rent and student loans, and eating regularly is always nice. She grabbed another slice and held it up in salute. Don't worry about me. He's an ass, but nothing I can't handle. At least he's nice to look at, Cassie said. Izzy glared at her, and she shrugged. What? He might be dead inside, but the outside is freaking hot. She wasn't wrong though Kirsten had no intention of admitting that out loud. Seriously, though, the rippling muscles beneath Cole's $600 shirts really did put on a nice show. Too bad the man who owned them seemed determined to be a complete jackass. Well, you're a stronger woman than I am, Izzy said. I'd have introduced my foot to his crotch a long time ago. The girls dissolved into junk food and wine-induced giggles, and Kirsten finally fully relaxed, all the pressures of the day disappearing, at least for a little while and enough that she'd apparently dozed off. She awoke to Cassie lightly kicking her hip. Ow, what? Kirsten said, sitting up with a yawn. It's time. They're drawing the numbers. Oh, Kirsten grabbed her ticket off the table, and all three girls raised their tickets into the air and said, Freedom! in their best Braveheart accents. Cheesy, maybe, but traditions were traditions, and they'd been saluting their freedom tickets since college. They were too superstitious, at least when it came to the lotto, to muck things up by changing now. Kirsten chewed on her bottom lip. She knew the chances of winning were probably only slightly better than the chance that Cole would suddenly get her name right, but she couldn't keep the rush of adrenaline from trickling through her system. Because the what-ifs were too juicy to contain. The first number was drawn. Thirteen. Whoop, got it, Cassie yelled. Me too, said Kirsten. Not me. Next number, fifty-six. Got it. Kirsten said again, her breath coming a little faster. She'd never hit two numbers before. If she hit the Powerball number two, she might actually win a few bucks. Not me, said Cassie. Izzy shook her head. Me either. Seven. Kirsten's head spun. Got it, she said. The other girls dropped their tickets and rushed to her side, hanging over her shoulder. Forty-three. Holy shit, Izzy murmured. No way we'll hit another one, Cassie said. Izzy waved her hands. Shh, don't jinx it. Twenty-two. Oh, my God, Cassie shrieked before promptly slapping a hand over her mouth. Kirsten's hand started to shake. Izzy had a death grip on her shoulder, and she was almost positive Cassie was hyperventilating. Even if they didn't hit the Powerball number, they were going to win a nice big chunk of money. The announcer pulled the ball. And the Powerball number is... Two! Kirsten's stomach dropped. None of them made a sound. She wasn't even sure they were still breathing. Then Cassie drew in a ragged breath, and Izzy shot to her feet, her eyes as wide as a Cinnabon roll. Kirsten lurched to her feet, dragging Cassie up with her. They looked at each other, at Izzy, back at the ticket still in Kirsten's hand. Excuse me, 
Izzy said. But did we just win the fucking lottery? Kirsten's hand shook. I, yeah, check the numbers again. They looked back at the numbers flashing on the screen, down at the ticket, back at one another. We won, Cassie said, her voice almost a whisper. She slapped her hands over her mouth and then squealed like a six-year-old girl who'd just been given free reign inside an American girl doll store. We just won $585 million. Kirsten dropped onto the couch, running the math in her head. Oh, my God. If we take the lump sum buyout, even splitting three ways and paying taxes, we're still looking at, like, $69 million each. Or more. I can't think straight right now. Sixty-nine! My lucky number! Izzy said with a wink. Kirsten rolled her eyes. You're such a prepubescent boy. Make that a rich prepubescent boy, because, baby, we just won the fucking lottery! The girls looked at each other, grinned, and then screamed at the top of their fabulously lucky lungs. Chapter 5 Kirsten raised the hair off her neck to try to get some cool air on her heated skin. But there wasn't any cool air in the press of bodies twerking and grinding on the dance floor. Another round of champagne? Cassie yelled, holding her glass over her head. The strobe lights of the club glinted off the remaining amber liquid in her glass that sloshed dangerously close to the edge. Izzy and Kirsten laughed and pulled her back into her seat. Take it easy there, princess. We aren't rich yet. We still need to claim this baby. Kirsten patted her left boob where the ticket was wrapped in a plastic baggie and riding cozy in her bra. No way was that little slip of paper leaving her for a second. Ah, uh, come on. Let's live a little. We just won the shh. Kirsten leaned in. Remember, no telling anybody until this is a done deal. We'll have the crazies coming out of the woodwork. That finally got through to Cassie. Ugh, you're right. Well, she said, perking up again, we can still party our asses off without people knowing why. Hell yeah, we can, Izzy said, holding up her glass. To freedom! Freedom! They all shouted, clinking their glasses. Kirsten's phone went off. They all looked at it like it was a snake getting ready to strike. You have got to be kidding me, Izzy said. What does the man have, some sort of fun radar that goes off any time you aren't working your ass off for him? Kirsten picked it up. What are you doing? Cassie asked. Seeing what he wants. Kirsten swiped open her screen, but Izzy yanked the phone out of her hands. You don't need to be at his beck and call anymore, remember? The knot twisting in Kirsten's gut at the need to see the text lessened a bit. I, oh my God, she said laughing. I seriously forgot. It was a total reflex to just pick it up and do whatever. You're right. Though I haven't told him yet, and it's not really fair to him when he's counting on me. Izzy groaned. Fair to him? And when is he ever fair to you? Izzy was right. But the anxiety at not doing her job ratcheted up a notch, and Kirsten tried to force it back down. She didn't have to be at Cole's beck and call anymore. She didn't have to work for him at all, ever again, or work for anyone else. Still, she couldn't help wondering what he wanted her for that late at night. Nothing fun, that was for sure. She snagged the phone back from Izzy. Let's see what boss man wants me to do tonight. She opened the text and scanned it. Well, Cass said. Kirsten shook her head. The man is unbelievable. It's almost midnight on a Saturday, and he wants me to run down to the office quick and check a file he left there. No way did she want to leave her celebration to do what Cole asked but it didn't stop her stomach from plummeting at the thought of saying no. She'd never said no to Cole. No one did. 
Tell him to kiss your ass and let's get back on the dance floor, Cass shouted, already bouncing in her seat to the music. I can't do that, Kirsten said with a nervous laugh. She'd love to say that. But even if she didn't need her job anymore, that just seemed so rude. I will, Izzy said, plucking the phone out of her hands again before she could say anything. Izzy's thumbs flew over the screen, hitting send before Kirsten could grab the device back. Holy shit, she muttered, reading the text Izzy had just sent. It had, in essence, told Cole what he could go do with himself. He's going to fire me for sure. Good riddance, Izzy took another swig of her champagne. Actually, it'll be perfect. He can fire you, and then Cass and I will march out of there in solidarity. It'll be a real hallmark moment. The phone buzzed in her hand again. It's him. So? Cass asked. What did he say? Are you drunk? Kirsten laughed. Well, he didn't fire me yet. She wrote back. Yep, having a hell of a time, too. Izzy hooted with laughter. Oh my god, you are so getting fired! They only waited a few seconds before the next text came through. I take it this means you can't bring me the file I need. Kirsten shook her head. Nope, sorry, busy getting my groove thing on. Groove thing? Izzy asked. Cassie was almost doubled over on the table laughing. Kirsten flashed a huge grin. Give me a break. I'm new to this rebel thing. Cass snorted. Obviously. The three of them sat with their heads together, staring at her phone until it buzzed again. Go home and sleep it off. I'll see you in the office tomorrow. Wow, he's harder to crack than I thought, Kirsten said. Sorry, boss man, I've got a lot of party left in me and not nearly enough hours, not wasting any sleeping. They waited again, but no returning text came. Well, what does that mean? Cass asked. You getting fired or not? Kirsten shrugged. I have no idea. I can't imagine he'll let me get away with basically telling him to fuck off so I can party. Maybe he just wants to do it in person, Izzy said. Kirsten's stomach sank. She would so rather get fired over the phone. Fired by text was vastly preferable to having to look Cole in the face while he told her to get lost. I don't know, Cass said. I filed your hiring contract, remember? If he fires you, you get a great severance package. Maybe he's trying to save himself some money by cutting her a little slack. Or maybe he just likes her, she said, winking at Kirsten. Because I doubt he'd let anyone else talk to him that way for any reason. Oh, please. It's just because if I walk, he can't run his life. Or maybe he's drunk, too. They all laughed at the thought of the always-together coal being hammered. I'm sure even I would get fired eventually. He might cut me a little slack because I know where all the bodies are buried. There are bodies? asked Cass. Figuratively speaking, Kirsten said, but even I can't get away with too much. Izzy shrugged. I don't know, Kirsten. Looks like you're getting away with more than anyone else I've ever seen. So why don't we put it to the test? Cass asked with a mischievous grin. What do you mean? Kirsten asked. Cass shrugged. I wonder how far he'd let it go before caving and firing you. Kirsten looked around at her friends and opened her mouth to say no, but she smiled instead. Izzy whipped out her phone and pulled up a calendar. Pick your date. Kirsten laughed. He'll throw me out on my ass the second I walk through his door Monday. Izzy grinned and typed her name into the square for Monday's date, May 1st. Cass shook her head. I don't know. You do everything for him. I don't think he can function without you anymore. You could probably get away with a lot more than just a drunken late-night text and still keep your job. I give it two weeks before he snaps. I'll go halvesies and say your history by the end of the week, Izzy said, typing her name into her square. 
And just to make this really interesting, Izzy fiddled with her phone for a minute, and then Cass and Kirsten's phones both beeped. Kirsten looked at the notification, her eyes growing wide. You posted it to the assistant's email loop? Why not? Might as well go all in here and really have some fun. They're going to wonder why. Cass laughed. She said why, see? She pointed at the description. Kirsten has had enough and is going to have some fun messing with her boss. How long before she gets fired? As she was speaking, dates started filling in on the shared Google Doc. Well, that'll get me fired for sure, Kirsten said. You know IT monitors everything on the company computers. Izzy snorted. Please, he barely checks his own stuff, let alone anything with the word assistant on it. That's what he has you for. Not for long, Cass said. Kirsten grinned again, excitement building in her. She'd never been anything but 100% totally professional around Cole. Hell, she still refused to call him by his first name, despite his repeated attempts to get her to do just that. Plus, Cole was the most organized person she knew. He liked order and went through meticulous lengths to get it. His assistant coming in and throwing a wrench into things was sure to stir up some trouble. Izzy raised her glass again. To the lotto pool! Kirsten and Cass clinked their glasses with a little nod to each other, and they all drained their drinks. Wait, we can't call it that or everyone will know, Izzy said. Oh, yeah, right. Okay, to the termination pool, Cass said. They all clinked glasses again before dissolving into alcohol-infused giggles. Well, Kirsten said, putting down her empty glass and standing up to smooth her dress down to her hips. Since I'm not working tonight, I say some dancing is in order. Laughing, the other two girls got up and followed Kirsten to the dance floor. Come morning, Kirsten was going to see what her boss was really made of. She just hoped she could pull it off. In the meantime, she was going to party her ass off. Chapter 6 Cole stood near the entrance of the club, waiting for his eyes to adjust to the seizure-inducing strobe lights that flashed in time to the beat. You're never going to find her in here, Brooks said, leaning closer to shout in Cole's ear. Cole ignored him and kept scanning the interior. He realized that tracking the GPS in Kirsten's company phone and following her to the club was teetering into creepy territory, but she'd never done anything like this before, not since she'd worked for him in any case. And he couldn't shake the feeling that something was going on. Those texts from anyone else he'd be livid. They'd have been fired before they'd hit send. Coming from Kirsten? Once he'd gotten over the shock, he'd laughed, and then he'd decided to cross the line and find her before she got herself into trouble. He finally spotted her dancing with her friends and elbowed Brooks. Brooks gave him that you're crazy look and stood back to watch. Cole ignored him and went to fetch his wayward assistant. The gyrating crowd parted before him like an ice cutter slicing through a frozen sea, he stopped a few feet from Kirsten and her friends. She looked nothing like herself. He nearly lifted a hand to make sure his jaw wasn't hanging open. Her thick hair flowed over her shoulders in a honey-colored wave, and her tight little body was encased in a sparkly black dress that hugged every curve. Curves that were an incredible display as she moved to the beat of the music— he knew the exact moment she spotted him. She froze on the dance floor, causing the friend she'd been dancing near to bump into her. Her friend glanced over, saw him as well, and leaned over to talk into Kirsten's ear. A slow smile grew on Kirsten's full, tempting lips. She kept her eyes locked with his as she made her way through the crowd to him. He stood there and watched her come to him. She didn't stop until she was only a couple inches away, far closer than she'd normally stand, 
invading his personal space. He had to hold his breath to keep from closing his eyes and inhaling her scent like it was a fine wine. Mr. Harrington, didn't expect to see you here tonight, she said, her words nearly lost in the blaring music. His forehead creased in a frown, and she leaned up on her tiptoes so he could hear her better. Just couldn't live without me, huh? How'd you find me? He cocked his head, taking in everything about her appearance and demeanor. She hadn't said anything out of the ordinary, had she been speaking to anyone else, but her whole attitude seemed to have shifted. There was something more open about her, more real. She spoke to him like he was a man, not her boss. It was tantalizing, probably inappropriate, and completely intoxicating. I tracked your company phone, he said, leaning into her so she could hear him, and so he could get closer to her. The temptation to reach out and wrap his hands around her luscious curves was almost overwhelming. She looked back up at him, her eyes widening. That's some next-level Christian Grey stalker shit right there. That startled a laugh out of him. Fan of Fifty Shades, are you? She gave him a slow, sensual grin that had fireworks going off in his veins. The fact that you got the reference intrigues me. He shrugged. Old Christian and I have quite a lot in common. Money. A helicopter. He looked her up and down, heat shooting through his body at just the luscious sight of her. A fondness for innocent assistants who have no business being anywhere near us. That smile of hers grew wide. I've got a secret, sir. She moved in closer to whisper in his ear. Sometimes we aren't as innocent as we look. She took his hand and crooked her finger at him with the other, pulling him with her onto the dance floor. Come on, Mr. Gray. Dance with me. Oh, that was such a bad idea. He wouldn't even have time to name all the ways it could blow up in his face. Didn't matter, because at the moment he really didn't give a shit about anything but getting his grind on with whoever had body snatched his assistant. Maybe it was the alcohol. He couldn't recall ever having seen her drink before. Then again, he only saw her at work. Well, he'd seen her at practically every moment of the day. He spent more time with her than anyone else, but it was all in a work context. He liked this one much, much better. He briefly glanced at Brooks, who was staring at him with an almost cartoonish expression of pure shock. Yeah, he was about to do something out of the ordinary and completely ill-advised, and he had never felt more alive. He wrapped a hand around Kirsten's waist and drew her against him. She already swayed to the music, and his body followed her lead. Within a second and a half, he knew he'd made a huge mistake, but there was no turning back now, even if he wanted to. She draped an arm around his neck and leaned back, the bottom half of her body pressed against him while the rest provided an enticing view. He pulled her back up and moved with her, their bodies grinding and swaying. The beat of the music pumped through him, amped him up even more. How the hell people danced like this without flat-out fucking on the dance floor, he didn't know. Well, looking around, it seemed several people were very nearly full-on screwing. Lucky bastards. Kirsten spun around and pressed her back to him. Her hair flipped to one side, leaving her neck exposed. He wrapped his arm around her waist, keeping her locked to him, and leaned down to breathe her in. The line of her shoulder into the graceful curve of her neck might be one of the most beautiful things he'd ever seen. Her arm came up to cradle his head, bringing his lips oh so close to the creamy expanse of her neck. It took every ounce of willpower he had not to lean down a fraction of an inch more 
and taste her. Maybe she sensed his struggle because she stopped and slowly turned in his arms. She stared into his eyes for what felt like an eternity. Her hands came up to rest on his chest, not pushing him away, not pulling him closer. He had no idea what she wanted him to do. Kiss her? Release her? Maybe she didn't know herself. He knew the feeling. Then her eyes widened, not in lust or surprise or even anger. The only thing he saw reflected in those gorgeous brown depths was sheer panic. He realized what was happening just about the same time she did and pulled her off the dance floor toward the nearest planter. They got there a fraction of a second late, and the spectacular display of vomit coming out of her sprayed across his shirt before he could aim her into the plant. He scooped her hair out of the way and held her while she puked up everything she'd eaten since she was eight. Well, not quite the way he'd seen the night ending. Within moments, her friends had rallied around her. He passed her into their more capable hands, though he found he was reluctant to let her go. Even with the aroma of what had just happened stinging his nostrils and the near certain destruction of his favorite shirt, his uppermost desire was to make sure she was all right. Mr. Harrington, she said, covering her mouth with her hand. I'm so sorry. He waved her off. Don't worry about it. He pulled out his phone and quickly texted his driver to meet them at the door. You, Izzy, is it? he asked, pointing to one of the ladies who was dabbing at Kirsten with a tissue. The woman's eyes widened. Yes, sir? Kirsten snorted. Oh, sure, her name you remember. It took about everything he had not to grin at her just then, so she had noticed he kept botching her name. He kept his attention on Izzy. My driver will meet you out front to take you home. Make sure you get her taken care of. Izzy's eyes narrowed slightly. Of course we'll take care of her. She's our friend. He defended her, which hadn't been his intention. But he'd found the facade of asshole boss man handy over the years. So instead of apologizing, he raised an eyebrow, staring at her until she broke eye contact. We'll make sure she's all right. The other woman, Cassandra, if he remembered right, chimed in. Good he said, rewarding her with a slight smile. He escorted them to the door and practically shoved them into his waiting car. The urge to get in himself and pull her onto his lap so he could hold her all the way home was too appealing. And irritating. He didn't have the time or energy for whatever nonsense was happening in his head. Best course of action was to fall back on old habits. No more rocking the boat. I need her back in working condition by Monday morning. Kirsten perked up at that, her face flushing with anger. She sat up to retaliate, but he shut the door before she could say anything. The door muffled her actual words, but the heat behind them was evident, and he chuckled as the car pulled away. He wasn't sure what was going on with her, but the new spirit she was exhibiting had awakened something in him that he'd thought long dead. Whatever had caused the change in her, he hoped it didn't go away any time soon. He'd admired and relied on the old Kirsten. Discovering she had a passionate, spunky side made her damn near the perfect package that he could never touch. His amusement died away, but the memory of her moving in his arms was one he'd never forget. Kirsten was one of the very few he'd let his guard down with, and he was beginning to think he'd made a grave mistake. Her behavior in the club was a case in point. The woman who was responsible for the cold shower and sleepless night he was about to have was not the woman who'd been showing up to his office every day for the past six months. So who was the real Kirsten? The uber-reliable assistant who had unfailingly run his life for the last several months? or the tempting bombshell who would feature prominently in his wet dreams for the next forty or fifty years? Or was she someone else entirely? He had to know, for the sake of his company and his own sanity. 
Chapter 7 Kirsten leaned against Cass's desk, trying to control her roiling stomach. Cole hadn't come in yet, but he should be there any second. And after Saturday night, the thought of facing him made her want to run and hide under her desk. He hadn't called her once the day before, and that was incredibly unusual. Maybe she'd stepped over the line with her bump-and-grind routine. At least that should make getting fired easy. Relax, Cass said. You'll be fine. That's what you said before I made him dance with me, and then instead of firing me on the spot, he actually got into it. Izzy snorted. Pretty sure you were getting into it, too. Kirsten threw the last of her bagel at Izzy, who just ducked and laughed. Sorry, I didn't realize you weren't aware of your enthusiastic participation. If Kirsten had something else to throw at her friend, she would have. Unfortunately, she was all out of bagel. I thought the whole point was to make it appear enthusiastic so he'd think I was into him and fire me for trying to come on to him. Izzy nodded. You did a really, really good job. Kirsten's jaw dropped, and she grabbed the nearest thing she could find, a cup full of paper clips, and started chucking those at Izzy's head while her friend dodged the projectiles behind a file folder and laughed. Hey, I need those, Cass said, confiscating the paper clips. She looked Kirsten up and down. Aren't you a little put together? I thought you were going full-on crazy cat lady today. I had an appointment with Mr. Meyer, remember? Izzy came out from behind her folder. I thought that was later today. Kirsten shook her head. He called and rescheduled. So what did he say? If you guys had come with me, you'd know. Izzy threw one of the paper clips back at her. People would notice if all three of us got to work late because we were talking to some big-shot lawyer. Kind of hard to keep this whole thing under wraps if we're all doing something weird like that. You're always running in and out for Mr. Harrington, so I doubt anyone who saw you would think twice. So, Cass said, what did he say? She glanced around to make sure no one was paying attention to them. He's going to get everything set up for us, so it'll be all ready once we claim the money. Financial consultants and getting the money transferred to different accounts and all that. I mean, we can't just go to the bank and hand them some massive check. He'll get everything taken care of for us. I still can't believe we won the whole pot, Cass said. Kirsten grinned. And she said, making sure Cass and Izzy were still paying attention. He suggested I keep the ticket in a safety deposit box until then, so we got that set up. They all grabbed hands and did a mini squeal, which was interrupted by a beep on Cass's computer. She opened the inter-office message. Harrington's on his way up, she whispered. All around them, people were scattering, putting away their coffee, breaking off conversations, and pulling out paperwork, opening computer files, and doing their best to look busy. Showtime, Kirsten muttered, her stomach fluttering at the thought of going head-to-head -head with Cole. Normally, she'd rush to his office to make sure everything he needed was at hand and ready for him. Today, she stayed put. While she was nervous, excitement built in her as well. She'd spent the last six months anticipating his every need and carrying it out before he even had to ask. The thought of what his current needs might be after their dance Saturday night made her cheeks flame hot and sent her stomach into overdrive. Because if they were anything like hers, they could probably both do with a cold shower. Another one. She'd been sure Cole would have at least pretended to object to her behavior at the club. He was notoriously anti-office fling. Instead, he'd wrapped those big hands of his around her and... The elevator doors dinged and opened to reveal the man himself. He marched across the floor, face in his phone as usual, conducting business too important to wait until he got to his office... He glanced up when he passed her, the slight raise of his eyebrows the only indication he was surprised to find her out chatting with her friends instead of in his office, 
waiting for his first command. He took off his coat and tossed it in her direction. It took every ounce of willpower she had to ignore the instinct to catch it and just let it fall to the ground. A muted but collective gasp rippled through the cubicles when the coat dropped to the floor, and it spurred Kirsten's resolve. This was supposed to be fun, and it had been until things had gotten a little kinky on the dance floor. But since he wasn't acting out of the ordinary, maybe he wasn't inclined to mention it. Worked for her. He apparently wanted life to get back to normal. Well, she was going to have to disappoint him there. She bit back a smile and stepped over his coat following Cole into his office. He went to his desk. She went right for the coffee, as per usual. Only instead of making Cole's sickeningly sweet brew, she made herself a cup the way she liked it. One cream, one sugar. She carried it to Cole's desk. He stuck out his hand. She raised the mug to her lips and took a healthy sip. At that... He finally glanced at her and gave her his full attention. Coffee? he asked. Oh, she said, giving him the brightest grin she could muster. No, thanks. Already have some. She dropped into the chair in front of his desk and put her feet up. He glanced at the coat rack near the door and frowned. Where is my coat? She shrugged. I think you dropped it back there. She took another sip of her coffee and sighed. So, what's on my list for the day? He stared at her a few moments, and Kirsten could almost see the wheels turning in his head. Before he could say anything, his phone pinged again and he picked it up. His forehead furrowed, and then his lips twitched. His eyes flickered up to her and back to his phone, and he rubbed his finger over his mouth, though it did little to hide the fact he was on the borderline of full-on smiling— he slowly put the phone down on his desk. So, Crispin. All right, I can't take it anymore. She dropped her feet and slammed her coffee mug down hard enough some sloshed over the sides. Cole cocked an eyebrow at it, but didn't interrupt her. My name is Kirsten. Kirsten. Rhymes with seer. Not Kristen, or Kirsten, or Keston, or Kaysen, or Kesson, or Creston, or Christine, or Creston, or freaking Crispin, or anything else you've called me. I've worked with you directly for six months now and have been at the company even longer. I've scheduled your doctor's appointments, been up to my elbows in your underwear drawer, and as of Saturday night, had my hands just a few inches from your most prized possession. And you still can't get my name right. You know the name of everyone who works for you, even the seasonal employees who are only here for two weeks a year. Why the hell can't you get my name right? He sat back in his chair with that strange, half-amused, half-serious smirk on his face. Kirsten braced herself. No way would he let an outburst like that pass. Time to pack her box, collect her severance, and get her ass away from the aggravating twit before she lost her marbles. He opened his mouth, and Kirsten took a deep breath. But instead of firing her, he just said, Why the hell have you never corrected me? She released her breath with a slight frown. That was not what she expected him to say. At all. Most people don't. You aren't most people. His voice was low, almost sultry. Her eyes locked with his, and suddenly she was back on that dance floor, his arms around her, his breath hot on her neck. Having a man who held the world at his fingertips tell her she stood out for him, well, that was just overwhelming. I've always known your name. You just never corrected me, so I thought I'd see how long I could get away with it. And there went the warm fuzzies. Jackass! He shrugged and grabbed her coffee, taking a sip before grimacing and setting it back down. You held out longer than I thought. I should have had a pool going or something. She froze, hardly daring to meet his gaze when it flickered back to her. Did he know? 
That was a rather spot-on statement to make unless he knew, right? Now, as for today, he glanced around his desk, his gaze coming to rest on a large stack of file folders. He stood and gathered them, coming around the desk to drop them in her lap. I need you to go through the client folders and restaple them. She looked up at him, not sure she'd heard him right. Excuse me? Restaple them. He opened one and showed her the documents each folder contained, usually a stack of 30 or more pages all neatly stapled with an industrial stapler in the upper left-hand corner. Having them stapled in the corner like that has become a real problem. The papers tear off too often and it makes the stack awkwardly bulky when I'm reading through them and folding the papers back. If it were stapled perpendicularly here he said, indicating a spot about an inch and a half down from the corner. Then I could fold the pages over like the pages of a book. It would make going through the information much easier, so I need them restapled. He had to be kidding. But he stood there, staring at her expectantly. Just the current files? No, I'd like them all done. Well, I suppose we don't need the archived files. Oh, good, she said with a slight laugh. There were easily several thousand old client files. But everything from, say, the last five years should be done. I don't want to have to deal with the corner staple if I ever need to go through an old file. Might as well have them all done. She stared at the stack on her lap and then back up at him. The last five years? That was several hundred files at least. He gave her a tight smile and reached across her to grab his phone from the desk, totally invading her space as he did so. She tried not to take a deep whiff of him as he went by. The man was an ass, but he smelled divine. I'll be back in a few hours. Try to get those files done quickly. I have some other jobs for you. I bet you do, she muttered at his retreating back. She watched him through the open door until he disappeared into the elevator, and then she dropped the files back on his desk with a muttered curse. So? Kirsten turned around to see Cass and Izzy with their heads poked through the door. He wants me to restaple every file from the last five years, she said, thrusting her hand out to indicate the wall of files in her connecting office. He's insane. I mean, seriously, what the hell? Is he trying to drive me nuts? She stopped short in her tirade. Wait, yes, he's trying to drive me nuts. Get me to quit. I bet you anything. Why would he do that? Cass asked. He must have figured out what I'm doing. Maybe not the reason why, since we haven't told anyone that. But he must realize I'm planning on leaving and is trying to get me to quit. What are you going to do about it? Izzy asked with a wicked grin. Oh, the game is so on, Kirsten said, laughing. He thinks he's got me, that he can outplay me? Not a chance. I think he forgot who runs his life. Cass and Izzy grinned back at her. Come on, she said, hurrying through the connecting door to her office. He's got a meeting with accounting. He should be back in about an hour. She sat down at her computer and pulled up his calendar. Time to make things a little more interesting. What are you going to do? Cass asked. Just move a few things around on his calendar, Kirsten said, scanning Cole's schedule for a few likely candidates. Her mouse hovered over a meeting with an architect for one of Cole's projects, but she couldn't quite make herself screw that up. Too many people's jobs depended on those projects running smoothly. She had no qualms about meddling in Cole's life a bit. He'd meddled in hers often enough with his constant and unreasonable demands. But she wouldn't adversely affect any innocent parties to do so. Then she saw the entry for the following Friday and smiled. Oh, this will be perfect. She made a few corrections and sat back, resisting the urge to cackle like an evil genius. Two events, one black tie, one costume, held at the same venue a week apart. Cole's life was about to get very interesting. What do you want us to do? Izzy asked. 
Round up as many interns as you can find and whoever isn't doing anything at the moment and tell them to get in here with their staplers. I have an appointment to make. She shared a grin with her two besties and picked up the phone. Chapter 8 Cole leaned back against the elevator wall, his mood surprisingly great for a man whose trusted employee seemed hell-bent on wrecking his week. Getting some coffee in him had helped. If he could walk around with an IV drip of the stuff, life would be much easier. Nothing like a good caffeine jolt to start the day. And he'd had a productive meeting with his accounting department, which always put him in a good mood. But what was really putting the smile on his face was his current battle with his errant assistant. The info from Trevor, the IT guru, had been illuminating indeed. Cole pulled up the document Trevor had located on the company servers and scanned it again. The termination pool. He had no idea why she was trying to get fired. The most likely scenario, she'd gotten a better job offer and instead of quitting, she'd decided to have a little fun at his expense. The clause in her contract was quite specific about what would happen if she quit without just cause and what would happen if he fired her. Quitting would cost her money. Firing her would cost him. He shook his head, faintly smiled, and clicked over a screen to call Brooks. When he answered, Cole quickly filled him in, knowing he'd get a kick out of it. Holy shit! That's crazy dedicated revenge she's got going on! I'm kind of impressed! Cole snorted. Whose side are you on? Not sure yet. Gee, thanks. Brooks laughed. Sorry, man. I mean, I know I should be all bro code here, but I gotta say, I didn't think our sweet little librarian had something like this in her. Cole hadn't either. He'd never had someone so flagrantly defy him before. It was uncalled for, annoying, and coming from Kirsten, unexpectedly sexier than hell. He'd been trying to get her to show some spark of personality for months, He'd seen glimpses when she was chatting with some of the other assistants and secretaries, and in the photos she had of her with her family and friends arranged around her office. But with him, it was nothing but business all the time, which was how it should be, of course. Still, he'd craved more of that fire he'd seen simmering beneath the surface like that morning. It took serious balls to walk into his office and do what she did, it's creative. I'll give her that. Brooks laughed again. That's one way to put it. So why do it? Why not just quit? My guess? Because if she quits, she gets nothing. If I fire her, she gets a very nice severance package. After the fiasco with Marie, we drew up new employment contracts that covered both our asses. I didn't want my highly trained assistant walking out on me, and she didn't want to risk getting fired unexpectedly. The contracts make it advantageous for us both to keep her employed here, so she must be trying to get fired. I need to know why. Maybe your charming personality finally drove her away. Cole frowned, but wasn't going to admit he was afraid of the same thing. Or maybe she's got a lucrative job offer somewhere else. I know of several firms who would love to hire her away from me. They get a great assistant with inside knowledge of my business and get to piss me off all in one. You think she'd do that? Cole's frown deepened. Everyone has their price. Maybe someone found hers. Until we find out, it's probably best if we keep her off our major projects. I've got plenty of other jobs she can do. A slow smile spread across his face. In fact, I'm going to keep her so busy doing ridiculous bullshit jobs, she'll quit long before she can get me to fire her. If she thinks a little inappropriate behavior is going to get her terminated, she can think again. Two can play her little game, and I'll win, because I always do. Brooks let out a barking laugh. You two are going head to head to see who can drive the other one nuts first? All oh, this I gotta see. And everyone is in on it? Nearly every employee on the floor has bought into it so far. All betting to see when you'll finally snap and fire Kirsten? Yes, 
though I think they'll be surprised at what I'll put up with now that I know what I'm dealing with. Not as surprised as he'd been to see it, though. He hadn't figured Kirsten for the vengeful type. Mr. Never Goes Down Without a Fight. Ha! We'll be lucky if the damn building is still standing by the time you two are finished with each other. Cole shook his head. It won't be that bad. I'll be surprised if she lasts the week. Actually, I'm not all that sure what she has to be so pissed about. Seriously? What? Yes, I'm a tough boss. I have to be to get things done. Does that really justify payback? Apparently. Certainly makes things more interesting. How many squares are left? I should get in on the action. And let on that we know what's going on? No way. Besides, there aren't many left. Just a few days toward the end of the month. Everything else has been taken. The spots that had been open for this week got filled sometime in the last hour. Cole's forehead creased. Which is interesting. What could Kirsten be up to that has people thinking she's on her way out the door sooner than later? She should be neck deep in files and staples by now. Why? Cole grinned and told Brooks. You should have seen her face when I told her what I wanted her to do. I wish I had, Brooks said with a chuckle after Cole described it. Shit, man, that's ice cold. That's got to be the most mundane, menial, pointless job you could think of. At least on the spur of the moment. But come on, it's genius. It has a twisted, anal logic to it. So she couldn't really argue with it. Not that she ever argues with me. <laughs> At least not until today. True. With any luck, she'll realize I'm more than up for her challenge, and she will just give up and walk away. She was probably ready to pull her hair out within five minutes of starting those files. It'll be a fucking shame if this works. She's fun to have around. Cole's smile faded. Was her leaving what he really wanted? He needed someone he could trust, and the fact that she was apparently jumping ship stung more than he thought it would. He'd come to rely on her maybe a bit too much, but the thought of not seeing her every day. He cut those thoughts off. She was an employee. That was it. He didn't have the time or energy for any emotional entanglements, especially for a woman who was bailing on him because something better came along. He had enough women in his life doing that on a depressingly frequent basis. What really pissed him off was his surprise at her betrayal. He should know better by now than to expect anything different. She was like everyone else in his life only in it to get what they could from him and then gone the second there was no more advantage in it for them. The elevator reached his floor and bumped to a halt. Gotta go. It's showtime. Keep me posted, Brooks said. Cole ended the call and walked off the elevator, his heart pounding in anticipation. It wasn't often that he was at a loss. He was always in control of the situation, could anticipate almost any outcome— always knew what he was walking into and what he'd be walking away from. Except for now. Kirsten had turned his world upside down, made him feel out of control for the first time since he and Brooks had started their company, junior year of college. On the one hand, he despised the feeling. Being in control at all times was something he prided himself on. But on the other, it was exhilarating. The anticipation swelling in him at the impending battle had him on edge with excited energy. He was ready for anything she could throw at him. He was wrong. He passed her office first and glanced in, expecting to find a frazzled Kirsten buried in files and ready to throw the stapler at his head. Instead, three of the company interns occupied the office. They'd formed a sort of chain— one woman pulling the files and handing them to a woman who removed the staple, who handed the file to a woman who restapled the papers, who handed them back to the woman pulling the files, who refiled the folder and pulled another one. Neat, organized, incredibly efficient. It had Kirsten written all over it, but she was nowhere to be seen. Cole frowned and continued to his office. Absolutely nothing could have prepared him for what he walked into. The lights had been dimmed, 
Someone was burning some kind of aromatherapy crap, and in the middle of the room, Kirsten lay face down on a massage table covered with nothing but a sheet, while a big blonde hulk of obvious Viking descent diligently rubbed her down with glistening oils. Cole stared, momentarily stunned. What in the ever-loving fuck was she doing? Well, if you wanted to get fired, getting the interns to do your job while you got a massage in the boss's office was a good way to go about it, and explained why everyone in the office behind him was doing their best to peek over their cubicles and watch the show. The masseuse glanced up at him, and Cole held up his finger to his mouth, hoping the man kept his mouth shut, and then jerked his thumb at the door. The guy nodded. Just one moment, he said to Kirsten, then he left them alone. Cole quietly closed the door behind him and stripped his jacket, then took the masseuse's spot. He looked down at the tapered lines of Kirsten's back, glistening with warm oil. Flashes from the nightclub invaded his mind. Oh, this was such a bad idea. Then again... She willingly stripped down in his office for a massage, so a massage was what she was going to get. He took one of the bottles of oil and liberally coated his hands. The masseuse had been working on her shoulders, so that's where he started. He hesitated only briefly, his hands hovering over her skin. Then he committed. He pressed his fingers into her muscles. Good God! She had rock-hard knots beneath that porcelain skin of hers. And whose fault is that? He shook off the thought and kept massaging, working at her shoulders until her muscles were loose and pliant, and she was moaning beneath his fingers. He closed his eyes and tried to get a grip on himself. This was turning into something far more erotic than he'd anticipated. She uttered another small moan. Oh, that feels amazing. Cole's head nearly spun at the speed with which his blood rushed south of the border. He let his hands drift lower, working the muscles through her back, his fingers trailing along her spine, over and over, running down her sides, skimming oh so close to those tantalizing breasts of hers. This had been a terrible idea. He was supposed to be trying to get her to quit, not get her into bed. That would be exceptionally bad. Well, actually, it would be fucking amazing, but afterward would be a nightmare. And none of that made a damn difference because he couldn't make himself stop to save his life. Her breathing sped up and he moved back to her neck, slipping his hands beneath her hair. The faint scent of magnolia floated to him, and he leaned forward so he could get a good whiff, sliding his hands down her arms while he did so. Then he moved to the head of the table so he could get her back, leaning forward to press into her flesh, his hands drifting under the towel and stopping just before the top of her buttocks. The precariousness of his position didn't escape him. Her head was mere inches from a body part that very much wanted to meet her. He dipped back down, trying to keep himself in check, but with her body warm and slick under his hands and soft moans emanating from her as he touched her, he was seconds from having to excuse himself. His hands skimmed up her sides again, and she dragged in a tremulous breath, and then she raised her head. He'd been leaning over to reach her back, which brought her face to face with him, mere inches away. Her eyes stared directly into his, widened, their gazes locked for exactly half a second. And then she was scrambling up, clutching the sheet to her chest like it was the last barrier between her and a fiery pit of scorpions. Chapter 9 What are you doing? Kirsten nearly shouted at him. Her heart slammed against her ribcage so hard it had to be doing damage. The rest of her, though, still tingled from where he'd touched her. She wasn't sure if her trembling legs stemmed from the shock of finding out who was massaging her, 
or the fact that she'd been fantasizing that it had been his hands on her when she'd found out they actually had been. Either way, she needed to sit down before she fell down. She plopped onto the couch and drew her knees up to her chest, trying to make herself as small and inaccessible as possible. Thankfully, the sheet was large enough to cover everything, and she draped as much of it over her shoulders as she could while still leaving plenty to cover her vital bits. Cole, damn him, didn't seem phased at all. He calmly took a towel from the sideboard where the masseuse had left his things and cleaned the oil from his hands. I thought it was fairly obvious, giving you a massage, which you were apparently enjoying. I was not! That damn eyebrow of his cocked up. The moans coming from you said otherwise. She glared at him, trying to think of a good comeback to that. Hard to argue with the truth, though. I didn't know it was you. I thought Toby was massaging me. Toby? Yes, Toby, and those moans were for him. The other eyebrow went up. Not like that, she said. She dropped her head on her knees, trying to remember why she'd thought this was a good idea. Well, in her defense, she hadn't expected him to come in and participate. He was supposed to march in, get pissed she was using company time, assets, and his office for something so personal, and fire her on the spot. Not join in! How was she supposed to get herself fired if he kept responding in ways she never expected? I'm sorry you were moaning for the wrong person, but really, what else is a man supposed to think when he walks into his office and sees his assistant nude and oiled up? Um, maybe that he should go back out and give her some privacy? You were in my office. If you wanted privacy, you could have done this in your office, or better yet, at home. Hard to argue with that point, but it's hard to get fired from home. You were at a meeting. I thought I'd have enough time. Well, you thought wrong, and I'm sorry if you were upset that I took Toby's place, but in my defense, the poor guy had worn himself out trying to work those knots out of your shoulders. Yeah, and whose fault is it those knots are there? His eyes widened. You're not suggesting it's mine, are you? She uncurled her legs, her embarrassment giving way to irritation. Of course it's your fault. You're the one who has me running off my feet 24 hours a day doing the work of five people, and you knew that was the job when you took it. She stopped and took a deep breath. Surprised, she dared speak to him that way. Yes, I know. But knowing something and experiencing it are two completely different things. His gaze raked over her. That is very true. That fine-tuned tremor ran through her body again, and she clenched her muscles against the delicious sensation. Oh, he was good. But she wasn't one of his models he could play with and put away when he was bored. Time to turn the tables on the boss man. Okay, you're right. It was bad of me to use your office. She stood and let the sheet fall from her shoulders, though she kept the rest of it clutched tightly to her chest, her fist right between her breasts. A perfect vision of sexy modesty, if she did say so herself. The sudden flush of his cheeks gave her a hint. She was probably right. I know what a breach of protocol this was. I'd completely understand if you'd rather not work with me anymore. Okay, that might have been a bit too strong of a lead, but come on. The man was being impossible. What did a girl have to do to get fired around here? He stood much too close for her comfort, but no way was she going to step back and let him know that. I agree. It was completely inappropriate. She held her breath. This was it. Finally. But then it wasn't entirely appropriate for me to take over for Toby like I did. Seriously? She released her breath. Not entirely appropriate? I think I could successfully argue that what you did was worse. Are we playing mine as bigger than yours? She couldn't quite keep the smile from her lips at that one. No, I just meant I used your office space. You used my space. The words tripped out of her mouth, and there was no stopping her cheeks from flaming red-hot. 
That was so not what she meant to say. That intense gaze of his raked down her again, and her breath caught in her throat. I don't think I'd phrase it quite like that. No? He shook his head, scraping his bottom lip ever so briefly with his teeth in a tiny, insanely sexy bite. Where the hell did he learn moves like that? I think I gave you exactly what you needed. She was starting to understand why the women of the world seemed unable to keep their silk thongs on around him. She swallowed hard and tried to hold it together. A few days ago, she'd have willingly shoved this man in front of a train. And now it was all she could do to keep from dropping the sheet she held so she could climb him like a tree. When had all that changed? probably somewhere between her third and fourth shots of tequila and a hot beat on the dance floor at the club. Kirsten? She blinked and brought her gaze back into focus, realizing much too late that she'd been staring at those full lips of his while he rambled on about whatever it was he'd been saying. What? He gave her an overly amused half-smile and repeated himself. I said that under the circumstances, I'd completely understand if you'd rather not work for me. Yeah, she didn't think so. They stared at each other, totally at an impasse. No way was she going to quit, and he apparently had no intention of firing her. She narrowed her eyes, staring at him more intently. He merely stood with that calculating, stoic stare, that had sent more than one power-suit-wearing scion into hiding. Finally, she blinked. Damn it! She never was good at playing chicken. Why don't we just forget it? She said. He nodded. If that's what you want. He turned and walked to the other side of his desk, breaking the spell between them and leaving her standing naked in a sheet in the middle of his office, feeling like a total jackass. I'll, um, just go get dressed. Probably a good idea, he said, already busy on his computer with something as if nothing at all out of the ordinary had just happened. She didn't bother to hide her eye roll. It wasn't like he was watching anyway. She hiked up her sheet and dragged it into the bathroom, where she got dressed as quickly as possible. Once she was ready, she stood staring at the door, supremely unwilling to face him again after what had happened. She leaned her head against the door and breathed deeply. What was she doing? She was supposed to be getting herself fired. Instead, she kept getting herself in great positions to get royally screwed by her boss, and not in the way she was going for. That tremor that she was starting to associate with him ran through her again, and she took another deep breath. Keep it together, Abbott, she muttered. This shouldn't be so hard. Kirsten? She squeaked and jumped back from the door, the proximity of his voice startling her. After months of him calling her by every name under the sun but her own, it was odd hearing her actual name coming from him, and much nicer than she'd expected. Everything all right in there? he asked. Yeah, she said, clearing her throat to remove the strangled sound. I'll be right out. She needed to hurry and get fired before she lost her damn mind. The thought of what she set in motion for that Friday night brought a smile to her lips. Oh, yeah, public humiliation. Surely he wouldn't be able to keep from firing her after the goof she was about to make. You won this one, Harrington, but the war isn't over yet, she whispered. She smoothed out her skirt, gave her hair a quick check in the mirror, and went back out to face her adversary. Chapter 10 Kirsten took another sip of her champagne, hoping the bubbling liquid would calm the riot going on in her stomach. Cole should be walking in the door any second, and the shit was going to well and truly hit the fan. Part of her wished she could have stayed home that evening, 
where it was safe. The rest of her wouldn't miss it for the world. The charity ball that evening was a costume event, but the outfit she'd chosen for him wasn't quite what the event planners had in mind, she was sure. If he wore it, the photos were going to be priceless, and he'd definitely wear it. He never questioned what she selected for him. She brushed invisible lint off her tasteful black-and-white polka-dotted cocktail dress with its full skirt and sweetheart neckline and lightly touched her 1940s curls, making sure her hair was still in place. Then she checked her phone again. 9.45. The annual Henry and George Ball had been in full swing for almost an hour now, swing being the operative word. The Swing Kings were on stage and had the ballroom hopping. Despite her anticipation of Cole's arrival, she couldn't help but tap her toes with a little surreptitious sway of her body. The music was infectious. She wanted to grab the nearest guy and have him toss her around the floor like they were on Dancing with the Stars. But her eyes were glued to the entrance. Five minutes later, she was rewarded. She took another sip of her champagne just as Cole came striding into the room, staring at his phone as always. She spit her champagne back in her glass before she choked on it. Oh, this was better than she'd ever dared to hope. He was totally decked out like some Baroque king, complete with the curled wig, overly bedazzled velvet jacket and satin breeches, and high-heeled shoes. He glanced up, and she knew the exact moment he realized something was off. She also knew the exact moment he spotted her. His expression went from confusion to flat-out fury. At least she thought that was fury. Maybe it was extreme surprise. Either way, he was making a beeline for her, and those eyes of his had her rooted to the spot, though every instinct she had screamed at her to run— Weren't her fight-or-flight instincts supposed to kick in during moments like this? Science didn't say anything about coal-induced paralysis. He came to a stop in front of her. The band still played, but the utter stillness around them made Kirsten fairly certain no one was paying attention to anything but the guy in the crazy King Louie costume. Kirsten, he said, drawing her name out like a parent would to a misbehaving child. Showtime. She leaned in. Didn't you get my text? What text? She pulled up her text history on her phone and gave what she hoped was a believable gasp. Oh, my God! I didn't send it. I mean, I thought I did, but I must not have hit the button hard enough. She showed him the phone. He glanced at the message she'd typed out earlier that day in anticipation of this moment, the message explaining she'd misunderstood the theme and that he could just wear one of his pinstripe suits as a costume. He raised his eyes to meet hers. So, the theme is Swing Kings, give it a twirl, instead of King of the World, huh? I tried to let you know, she said with her best contrite voice. Cole's gaze never wavered. If he didn't turn down the intensity soon, she was going to start sweating. He opened his mouth to say something, but before he could, a man in a bright red zoot suit, complete with a black shirt and white tie, clapped him on his shoulder. Harrington, I think you missed the memo. The theme is the 1940s, not the 1740s. He chuckled at his own joke, and Cole gave him a strained smile. Oh, you know me, Perry. I like to shake things up now and then. Old King Louis was supposedly a major swinger back in the day, if you know what I mean. Perry Michaels, CEO of one of the largest financial consulting firms in the city, clapped him on the back again, guffawing at Cole's naughty implication. Ha <laughs> you old dog. Better watch out, young lady, he said to Kirsten. Oh, I will, she said. Cole's gaze shot back over to her, and she hastily drained her glass, praying the alcohol would quickly go to her head. I think I'm going to take this young lady for a spin, Cole said, plucking the glass out of her hand and handing it to a surprised Perry. Before either of them could say anything else, 
Cole had grabbed Kirsten's hand and tugged her onto the dance floor. Mr. Harrington, I really don't know how. Follow my lead. You'll be fine. He wrapped an arm around her waist and pulled her against him. If I can manage in this ridiculous outfit, which we will discuss later, by the way, then I'm sure you can figure it out. He grasped her waist and spun her away from him before she could protest, though she still worried about what sort of retribution he'd take for the pictures and video that were probably already popping up all over social media. The music was incredible, a mix of swing and electronics that she hadn't even known existed until that night. She couldn't help but get into it. And Cole was just another huge surprise. How do you know how to dance like this? she asked during one of the sections of the music when he drew her in and held her close while they danced in a fast, tight circle. Dance lessons as a kid. He spun her out again and worked some fancy footwork while she tried desperately to keep up. Why, impressed? he asked, his cocky grin already sure of her answer. She was impressed. Wasn't going to tell him that, though. Then he picked her up, one arm behind her back and one under her legs, and spun. She clung to his neck, biting her lip to keep a shriek from erupting. Hold on, he said. He flipped her legs so she did a somersault over his arm, landing on shaky legs with his arms firmly around her as the song ended. She laughed, still holding on to him until her equilibrium returned. Their fellow dancers applauded. Kirsten looked around, her cheeks burning as she realized a circle had formed around them, and they were currently the center of attention. While she completely intended for Cole to be front and center in the spotlight, joining him had not been part of the plan. He held out his arms, forcing her to do so as well, as he still held her hand, and took an exaggerated courtly bow. She managed a quick head nod and then tried to duck away. But Cole kept her hand firmly in his, bringing her closer to wrap her hand through his arm. I think we should probably call it a night, he said, leading her toward the exit. What? But you just got here. The party is only getting started. Shouldn't we stay a bit longer? Being alone with him seemed like a bad idea. Then again, if he was angry, he might fire her, and wasn't that what she wanted? She was so accustomed to demanding absolute perfection of herself in her job, it was hard to remember that torturing her boss until he fired her was the whole point of all of these shenanigans. We came, we danced, you can send them a check in the morning. I think we've put in enough of an appearance. Yes, but... He pulled out his phone, to text his driver, she presumed. I didn't realize you were such a fan of Electro Swing. It's growing on me she said faintly, which was the truth, but not why she wanted to stay at the party. Now that the moment of her termination was upon her, she found it wasn't quite as satisfying as she'd thought. She'd never been fired from anything in her life, and even though this is what she wanted, it still irked her sense of perfectionism. Cole was looking at his phone again, and Kirsten stifled an exasperated sigh, there were so many times she wanted to chuck that thing. Well, she was trying to get fired. She plucked the phone from his hands and tossed it over her shoulder in the general direction of the street. Cole stared after it, his mouth hanging open. She did the same. She couldn't believe she had just done that. That had been fantastic. Adrenaline coursed through her. She must be out of her mind, but holy hell, what a rush! He took a step toward the street, but it was far too late for that. A large truck hit it square on, followed by several cars, a tow truck, and a neon green moped. Cole's cell phone was toast. What the hell was that? Cole asked. She couldn't tell from his tone if he was pissed, amused, or just seriously confused. Probably all the above. I've been wanting to do that forever. You are always on that thing. Live a little. The car pulled up and Luke, his driver and head of security, hopped out to open the door. Cole gestured for her to get inside first. She climbed in and scooted as far from him as she could. 
just in case. He got in after her, yanking the wig off his head as soon as the door was closed, tossing it to the bench across from them. Ah, he said, rubbing his head. Feels good to get that thing off. He told Luke to take them to Kirsten's place, and then stripped off his coat, unbuttoned the embroidered vest, and undid the elaborately tied linen at his neck. By the time he was done, he looked like those male models on the cover of the supermarket romances, all tight breeches and chest hair blowing in the breeze. She'd always found the covers on the cheesy side, but faced with the real thing live and in person? Well, damn. Romance publishers knew what they were doing. Her mouth practically watered her hands itching with the urge to shove them through the open V of his shirt. He sighed and sat back, finally comfortable, or at least as comfortable as he could get in the back of a limo. She watched him warily. She'd just thrown his phone into oncoming traffic. Surely he wouldn't ignore that. He opened a console cabinet and retrieved another phone. Her jaw dropped. Oh, you have got to be kidding me. Since when do you keep a stash of backup phones in the car? Since I dropped one in a puddle on the way into a meeting a few years ago. Always good to have a spare on hand. He leaned to the center a bit so he could call up to Luke. I'm on the backup line, Luke. Spread the word. And have someone forward calls from the old number to this one until it can be switched over. Yes, sir, Luke said. He held his wrist up to his mouth and quietly spoke to whoever was listening on the other end. It's already activated? Kirsten asked. Of course. Doesn't do me much good if it's not. But what about your SIM card, all your contacts? Everything is saved to a Google account and syncs automatically. It's easy enough to restore my info. Plus, I usually back everything up to a memory card once a week, just in case. I'm good. She shook her head. Typical. Backups for everything. She crossed her arms and looked out the window, not that there was much to see. The talk had to be coming soon. Maybe he was letting the anticipation build up as some form of weird punishment. After a few more minutes of nothing but him playing with his phone, she finally couldn't take it anymore. Are you really not going to say anything? His gaze flicked up to her. What is it exactly that you expect me to say? I don't know, but something. I totally screwed up with the costumes. I sent you into one of the biggest fundraisers events of the year dressed like a... A buffoon, yes. Well, under normal circumstances, I probably would have fired you on the spot, especially after the prank with the phone. But you're right. I do spend too much time on the damn thing. However, he said, turning the phone so she could see what he was looking at, her eyes widened. She scrolled through image after image on Twitter, Facebook, Snapchat, Instagram, and a few social sites she'd never even heard of. The King of New York. Eligible bachelor Cole Harrington rocking the riches. Hashtag sexy in satin. Bring back breeches and a host of other headlines, hashtags, and gifts of them dancing all drooling over the handsome prince dressed like every woman's historical fantasy. Got to love the internet. It still amazes me how fast shit goes viral. You've managed to pull off an incredible PR run for me with this little stunt. It draws attention to my charity work, shows off a few of my best angles, and got me 3,000 new Twitter followers all in the last half hour. And we didn't have to spend a cent on marketing. I should give you a raise. Kirsten barely managed to keep from groaning into her hands. He should be chewing her out until her ears bled. Cole Harrington was a young man in a world mostly dominated by men who had been running the world since Cole was in diapers. Credibility and appearances were extremely important to him. What she'd done should have damaged both, though not so badly he couldn't recover but enough to give him a little taste of what the rest of the population who weren't so pathologically confident felt like from time to time. Instead, 
at least according to the email he flashed at her, they were getting requests from magazines for full-on photo shoots, taking the whole bejeweled king thing and running with it. But I tossed your phone into the street. Cole shrugged. Needed a new one anyway, though I would appreciate you not making a habit of that. She almost threw her hands in the air. He couldn't be serious. Was saving some money on her severance package really that important to him? She'd love to tell him she had an appointment at the lotto office in a few weeks to officially claim her winnings, and he could keep his damn severance package, but that would give up the game. And as he didn't seem remotely phased by her behavior, she'd have to step it up a notch. In the meantime, it was ridiculously quiet in the car. You took dance lessons as a kid? She asked. He gave her a small smile. I grew up in one of those small towns, very Gilmore Girls. You've seen Gilmore Girls? It was on one night when I was stuck doing paperwork. Don't judge. She held up her hands but couldn't keep her smile from popping out. Anyway, you know the type. Everyone knows everyone. Not a whole lot to do. Kirsten nodded, and he continued. Well, one summer, my mom was helping out at the dance studio teaching a few classes. You know, those sample classes designed to give kids a little taste of everything. She didn't want me staying home all day, bored and unsupervised, or have me sitting around the studio board either. And they didn't have a whole lot of boys signing up, so I took a few classes. Kirsten laughed, picturing Cole being dragged around a studio by his mother. I bet that was a blast for you. Cole shrugged. It wasn't so bad. Only boy in a class full of dancers? My friends were kicking themselves for not thinking of joining, too. Kirsten rolled her eyes and let loose an exaggerated sigh. Typical male, he chuckled. It wasn't like I had too much choice in the matter, but I was used to being around it. My sister used to dance, and I'd always liked watching her. His eyes grew distant, sad. She'd never seen that look on his face before and wondered what caused it. He didn't talk about his family much. In fact, it was probably only the second time he'd ever mentioned his sister. Kirsten thought about being pushy, obnoxious, pry some more details out of him, but that was the last thing she wanted to do. It was one thing to forget his coffee or trick him into dressing up in front of everyone he knows— it was another to pry into whatever personal pain he was obviously feeling. She changed the topic. So, how do your feet feel? The sorrow cleared from his face, and he snorted. Whoever invented these things should be shot. Why the hell do women wear these on a regular basis? Kirsten laughed. They make our asses look great. He leaned over like he was trying to get a peek of hers. She glared at him, and he held his hands up in surrender. Hey, I was just seeing if it was true. You should always be able to back up your claim. Noted. Now stay on your side, she said. How had they gone from personal revelations to mundane chit-chat to flirting in the space of twenty-three and a half seconds? Flirting? Ah, hell no. She was not flirting with him. Or not much, anyway which would stop immediately. Back to mundane. No, scratch that. Maybe a tad inappropriate was better. She was trying to get fired, after all, and the man was being stubborn about that. Well, heels aside, you are a surprisingly good dancer. I bet that serves you well with the whole notorious ladies' man thing. He frowned slightly. The tabloids call me a ladies' man. That doesn't mean I am one. She gave him her best, seriously, look. I've seen the parade of women, put a few in cabs the next morning myself. I don't think I've ever seen the same one twice. Seems like typical ladies' man behavior to me. Did it ever occur to you that I'm not the one who is at fault here? Not really, no. His eyes widened and she shrugged. You look at your relationships with all those women and how they end, and the common denominator is you. So... Cole chuckled and shook his head. No one has ever put it to me quite like that before. 
she shrugged. They are probably afraid to make you mad. And you aren't? She met his gaze and debated how truthful she should be. But hell, no reason not to speak her mind now. Not any more. He leaned in a little closer. But you were once. Admitting any kind of weakness was not something Kirsten did often or easily, and she wasn't going to do it now. I believe we were talking about you and your apparent fear of commitment. I'm not afraid to commit. Kirsten's brows went up at that. I'm not. I just haven't found a woman who wants to commit to me. She snorted. Says every commitment-phobic man in the world. Maybe they all say it because it's true. I very much doubt that. You've been in People Magazine's Sexiest Man issue three years in a row now. You've got women literally throwing themselves at you, begging you to marry them. Exactly. They don't even know me. I go out on a first date and these women are already talking honeymoon destinations and babies' names. They don't want to commit to me. They want to commit to my bank account. Kirsten didn't answer for a moment, momentarily surprised into silence. I, I guess I never thought about it that way, she said. He looked at her like she'd missed the most obvious question on an open book test. I don't even know if it's possible to know for sure if a woman is interested in me, for me. She really had never thought about it that way, and now it was a problem she would face as well. Once she and the girls claimed that money and everyone knew who they were, they'd have the same problems as the people they used to make fun of. How would she ever know if a guy liked her for who she was and not what he could get from her? That's kind of depressing, he laughed, though there was little amusement in the sound. Yes, it is. Well, in the meantime, you are now a hashtag on Twitter and Instagram. Hashtag Mr. Sexy Pants. So that's something to be proud of, at least. This time, his laugh was amused. I might change my email signature to reflect that, he said. She grinned. I'll get that updated first thing Monday morning. We could make it a whole campaign. Maybe I should leave the pants on and we could get some photos. Do a whole photo shoot. Time to kick the flirting up a notch. Her inappropriate work environment skills were sorely lacking. She gave him what she hoped was a sultry smile. Only if you take a few with the shirt off. His gaze roved over her face, focusing for a moment on her lips. She sucked the bottom one into her mouth more to wet it from the sudden desert her mouth had become than to be sexy, but if it worked for both, more power to her. You know, I'm happy to take my shirt off for you any time. You just have to ask. I know how much you enjoy the view. Oh, hell yes, she did. Wait. She frowned slightly. What do you mean you know I like the view? The day you became my first assistant? He said, leaning in closer. You came into my office and I was on the treadmill, sweaty, shirtless. He leaned in even closer and took her chin in his fingers. You couldn't keep your eyes off me. His voice had hit a husky low level that had her belly tightening. I'm afraid you're mistaken, she said, though her voice came out far too breathy for someone who wasn't supposed to be affected by her boss. I was merely concerned you were getting dehydrated. With the amount of sweat I saw, I was afraid you were going to dry up like a cockroach and die. She smiled sweetly at him. He hadn't released her face yet. He opened his hand to trail his fingers along her jawline, cup her cheek. It was good of you to be concerned. No worries, though. I have amazing stamina. Her face was so hot, he could surely feel it flaming in his hand. I'm sure you do, she said, trying to force herself to stay unaffected. Mind over matter and all that. Her mind, however, was going AWOL, along with the rest of her traitorous body. The car pulled to a stop at a light. 
Cole gave her a slow, sexy smile that had her toes curling in her four-inch heels. It was a damn good thing she wasn't walking. Although she was going to have to get out and walk up to her door while he watched her ass sashaying away. He leaned in the rest of the way and gave her a sweet, gentle kiss on the cheek. Her eyes met his again. That hadn't been at all what she expected, and, if she were honest, not at all what she wanted. She wanted him to pin her back against the seat cushion and take advantage of the floofy skirt she wore. She'd even gone through the trouble to wear authentic undergarments, complete with a garter belt and silk stockings. It seemed a shame to waste them. But it would be such a bad idea. Horrible. Catastrophic. Right? He leaned over her his face so close she could feel his breath on her face. His lips were just a fraction of an inch away from hers. Did she want this? She'd been fantasizing about it, sure, but real life would probably have some ramifications, big ones. And if she stayed in that car any longer, there wasn't going to be any way she'd be able to stop what might be about to happen— because she just wanted it too damn bad. She reached behind her, opened the door, and made a run for it. Chapter 11 Kirsten could hear Cole calling after her, but she kept going. Kirsten! Cole was hanging out of the car and staring after her like she'd lost her mind, which, frankly, she probably had. Sorry, I forgot I have to be somewhere. They were near the park, so she darted up one of the paths and followed the sounds of applause to a small stage that had been set up where actors dressed in Elizabethan costumes were performing an odd pseudo tutor type dance to rock music, like a scene out of that Heath Ledger night movie. Several posters set up near the area proclaimed the performance the work of a local drama club who had thankfully drawn a decent crowd. She wound her way through the people, glancing over her shoulder every now and then. Surely he wouldn't bother. Someone grabbed her arm and she gasped, trying to pull away. Hello, my fabulous retro woman. You'll be perfect. One of the actors had hold of her and was pulling her toward the stage. No, thank you, she said, trying to politely extricate herself. All around her, other audience members were also being pulled onto the stage. Wonderful. She'd managed to wander into an audience participation production. She tried again to pull away from the actor towing her up front until she spotted Cole winding his way through the crowd, heading straight for her. Actually, I think I will join you, she said, surprising the actor as she stopped tugging against him, and instead started pulling him in her wake. They'd almost made the stage when Cole caught up to them. Wait, Kirsten, he said, reaching out to take her arm. Unhand her, sir, the actor said, apparently deciding to milk the situation for all it was worth. He thrust her behind him and drew his wooden sword. The damsel is mine! Cole stared open-mouthed at him for a moment, and Kirsten's consternation turned to flat-out amusement. No arrogant king-of-the-boardroom attitude was going to get him out of this one. She gave him a half-smile, eyebrow raised in challenge. She could almost see him working through his options. He smiled back, and her heart jumped. What in the world was he doing? He stepped fully on the stage and grabbed the sword of an actor standing nearby. The lady is mine. Kirsten was pretty sure her jaw hit the deck. Cole struck a fantastic fencing pose and began to duel the hapless actor to the wild cheers of the crowd. Kirsten put her hands over her mouth, certain she was witnessing the definition of shocked and awed playing out before her. Go for it, Mr. Sexy Pants, someone from the audience called. Well, someone had recognized him. Cell phones were being raised all over, 
and flashes from the cameras lit up the audience. If that hashtag hadn't been trending before, it sure as hell was now. Kirsten tried to hold back her laughter as Cole thrust and parried while the poor actor danced in circles around him. Cole finally jabbed forward, sticking his sword beneath the armpit of the actor who fell to the stage in an overly dramatic and greatly cheered death throw. Cole marched over to her, wrapped an arm around her waist, and hauled her to him. The crowd cheered with many shouts of, "'Kiss her!' tossed their way. Cole gave her a wicked grin, his eyes gleaming." mustn't disappoint the crowd. Before she could say anything, he descended, his lips pressed to hers as he bent her over his arm. She wanted to push him away, fully intended to push him away, but when her hands came up to grasp him, they draped around his shoulders instead, holding on while molten sparks shot through her body. She had jumped from a car to prevent this very thing from happening, and now all she wanted to do was cling to him like a monkey on its mama. Good God, the man could kiss. Her head swam, though to be fair, that could have been from hanging half upside down. Somehow, she didn't quite believe that, or her heart wouldn't be pounding so furiously, and every nerve ending in her body wouldn't be on fire and begging for his touch. Like it or not, she had to admit it was just him. He was kissing her giddy in front of the whole world, and she didn't give even half a flying fuck as long as he kept doing it. Another actor clapped him on the back, leaning in to say, That was awesome, man. The crowd loves you, before moving to the front of the stage to deliver his lines. Cole pulled away and stared down at her his heated gaze sending a fine tremor throughout her body. He leaned in again, but another spattering of catcalls seemed to remind him where they were. He stood her upright, then scooped her up in his arms and strode off stage to thunderous applause. Kirsten expected him to put her down the moment they were clear, but he kept right on marching. What are you doing? she asked. What did you think you were doing? he asked back. What possessed you to jump out of a moving car in the middle of traffic and run off like that? She bit her lip, weighing her answer. Telling him she'd been moments from making out with him in the back of his car wasn't something she really wanted to clue him in on. Well, technically the car wasn't moving, and give me a break, this is New York. If I waited for traffic to clear before crossing the street, I'd be stuck staring at the opposite side forever. He snorted but he still didn't put her down. I can walk, Mr. Harrington. Please put me down. He frowned at her, but he did as she asked, though he kept firm hold of her hand until they'd reached where Luke had the car double parked. They got in, and Luke pulled back into traffic while Kirsten and Cole sat silent in the back seat. Why wasn't he saying anything? She finally couldn't take the silence anymore and cleared her throat. You take fencing lessons as a kid also? No, he grinned. Last year down at the club, best in my class. It shows. Thanks for winning the duel. That got her a grin. You're welcome. You want to tell me why you felt the need to bail so desperately you risked your life to do it? Oh, so they were going to get real, huh? Not at all what she wanted to talk about. I wasn't bailing, I just needed some air. That's what vents and windows are for. Her phone dinged, and she glanced at it gratefully. Any excuse to end that conversation was welcome. Or maybe not. The text from Izzy was a screenshot of Izzy's Twitter feed showing a picture of Cole kissing Kirsten and followed by a WTF question mark, question mark, question mark. Yeah, not one she was going to be able to explain well. Something wrong? Cole asked. Kirsten sighed. 
Not like he wasn't going to find out the moment he logged into any of his accounts anyway. She showed him the picture. Looks like hashtag Mr. Sexy Pants is trending. Cole snorted. I'm sure the PR department is thrilled. Are you? She asked, the words slipping out before she could stop them. Naturally. Good press always makes me happy. And that was definitely one of the most enjoyable ways of going about getting it. She scowled at him and he chuckled. The car pulled up in front of her building before she could say anything else. The car has come to a complete stop. You may now exit the vehicle, he said with a mischievous grin that both made her stomach do flip-flops and made her want to punch him in the arm. Thanks, she said with as much sarcasm as she could layer on. Good night, Kirsten. Good night, Mr. Harrington. That's Mr. Sexy Pants, he said, pulling the door closed before she could respond. She rolled her eyes and headed in, glad he couldn't see the smile she wasn't able to hide. Cole tossed in another handful of chips and looked over at Brooks, waiting to see if he'd fall for his bluff. Brooks eyeballed him, then matched his bet. Christopher Lachlan, friend, colleague, and newest member of their billionaire poker club, looked back and forth between the two of them and folded. I'm certain you're both lying through your pretty cap teeth, but since I've got squat, I fold. Harrison Troy, another buddy from their college days, had made his first million by the time they were sophomores. By the time they graduated, Harrison had offers from every major tech firm in the country from several countries. Now he did something uber-secret for a private space firm and had more than enough money and balls to add to the pot, plus some. Brooks and Cole called, and they showed their cards. They groaned while Christopher just laughed. You boys are having an off night. Ah, uh, it's not Cole's fault. I'm sure Kirsten switched his coffee to decaf when he wasn't looking. That surprised a laugh out of Cole. She actually might have. It would explain why he'd been dragging so badly all day. Or maybe he's exhausted from being, what was it, hashtag Mr. Sexy Pants? Chris said. Hey, it's a dirty job. Harrison shook his head. Leave it to you to turn something like showing up in full medieval drag or whatever the hell you were wearing into a PR move that most people would kill for. I was Louis the Fourteenth, nowhere near medieval anything. It frightens me that you know that, Chris said. Cole just laughed. So she's still trying to get herself fired, huh? Harrison asked. Apparently, it's the only explanation I can come up with for why my perfect assistant has suddenly lost her damn mind. And then there's this, Brooks said, opening up the pool spreadsheet on his phone and tossing it on the table. Just about everyone in the office is betting on who will break first. I'm betting on him. Thanks, Cole said. Brooks laughed and started shuffling the cards. Sorry, man. She's smarter, cuter, and has more motive than you. Motive? Cole asked. Have you ever tried working for you? I'm amazed all your employees aren't on revenge sprees before they jump ship. Cole snorted. Just deal the cards. Cole's phone rang. His mom. He excused himself from the table and took the call. Hey, Mom. Cole, how are you? I'm good. In the middle of poker night with the guys, though. Well, I wanted to remind you that I'm coming into town tomorrow. He frowned a little. I wasn't going to forget. Yes, but you're always so busy. I thought the reminder wouldn't hurt. I didn't forget, Mom. But remember, I'll be stuck in a meeting for most of the afternoon, so I'm going to send a car to the airport for you. I thought we could meet up for a late dinner after my meetings. And then the next day, I'm all yours. All right, dear. I'm sure I can find something to do to occupy myself. Okay, get back to your game. I'll see you tomorrow. Love you. Love you too, Mom. He clicked off and went back to the game, though his mind wasn't really on the cards. Mom still coming to visit for a few days? Brooks asked. 
Cole nodded. I'll be in meetings all day. I hate to leave her on her own for most of the day. Brooke snorted. Yeah, that might not be a good idea. The last time she was alone in my apartment, she feng shuied the whole place. I still can't find half my shit. Cole had to laugh at that. Still, though, he'd rather his mom wasn't left to her own devices for too long. Not because she couldn't handle being on her own, but because when she got bored, she started to meddle. And she was a formidable meddler, critical of everything. And while he was sure it came from a loving place, the last thing he wanted was to come out of his meeting to find that his mother had given everyone the day off because they looked overworked, or worse, find an array of suitable young women she might find acceptable as a daughter-in-law. He needed to find something to keep her occupied. An idea finally occurred to him, and he couldn't help but smile. He's got that evil genius grin going on again, Harrison said, nodding at Cole. I'll take the genius part, but evil is a totally subjective term. Uh-huh. What devious little idea put that particular smile on your face? I'm going to kill two birds with one stone. He glanced at Brooks and grinned. I think Kirsten is about to meet her match. Cole sat watching the emotions running across Kirsten's face. Incredulity, confusion, anxiety, maybe? Suspicion seemed to be uppermost in the cocktail. You want me to hang out with your mother all day? She asked. Yes, I'm stuck in meetings and I don't want her alone in her hotel room all day. I just need you to keep her company, take her to a museum or something, out to a nice lunch. You have the company card. Put anything she wants on that. Okay, she said, her tone implying there was a catch somewhere. And there was. She'd never met his mother before. He loved his mother, but the woman could drive the Pope to murder. Cole's intercom beeped, the front desk informing him his mother had arrived. He smiled and ended the call he was on, standing up as his mother entered the office, Kirsten stood as well, moving to the side so she was out of the way until he needed her. Mother, he said, coming to her with his arms open. His mother could drive him up the nearest wall on the best of days, but she was still his mother. Every time he hugged her, a part of him was transported back to his childhood, before his success and all the money, before their lives had changed so drastically before Piper had gotten sick. He flinched from the thought. Despite being separated by ten years, he'd been close with his sister. She'd been kind of a second mom, and he'd adored her. He still missed her. He gave his mother one last squeeze and stepped back. How was your flight? She shrugged. We didn't crash, so I suppose I can't complain too much. But she would. My air vent stopped working ten minutes after the plane left, and they refused to let me change seats, and the sorry excuse for a meal they have nowadays wouldn't have satisfied a bird. I'm starving. He smiled indulgently and gestured to the seat in front of his desk. So, she said, settling her purse on her lap, you're going to abandon me on my first night in the city? Again? Of course not. Her eyebrows raised in a gesture he recognized as one of his own. Have you done the unimaginable and canceled your meetings? If I could have, I would have, but no. However, I have the next best thing for you. He held his hand out, and Kirsten came forward with one of those smiles on her face that lit up a room. His mother's eyebrows rose again. You're giving me a person. I believe that is illegal, dear. Cole chuckled. No, Mom, this is my assistant, Kirsten. What happened to the other one? Mary, Maria, whatever her name was. She left. Kirsten has been my assistant for several months now. She glanced at Kirsten. Stand up straight, dear. To Cole, she said, You're going to foist me off on your assistant? If I thought for a moment it would be tedious for you, I wouldn't even suggest it. But Kirsten happens to be one of the most intelligent, entertaining people I know. 
I'm sure the two of you will have a great time. Really? His mother looked Kirsten up and down with a speculative gleam that Cole didn't like. Are you the one making out with him in those pictures splashed all over the internet? Kirsten's mouth dropped open, and even Cole was at a loss for words for a second. Yes, ma'am, Kirsten said, her voice only slightly hesitant. It was just a PR stunt. Hmm, she said, glancing at them both. Interesting choice for a marketing campaign. Well, it'd be better than sitting around my hotel room all day, I suppose. Cole tried to hide his smile. If Kirsten didn't quit after a full day with his mother, there was nothing that would make her do so. Well, he said, coming around his desk to help his mother up, you two ladies have fun. Kirsten nodded, her smile strained. I've got a few ideas, Mrs. Harrington, but if there is anything in particular you'd like to do, let me know. Well, we'll see what you had planned before we make up our minds, shall we? Kirsten nodded, gave Cole an uncertain look, and followed his mother out the door. He waited until they left before he laughed. Oh, this was going to be interesting. He almost wished he could go with them just to watch the show. Chapter 12 Kirsten rubbed the bridge of her nose, trying to rid herself of the headache that had formed about thirty seconds after leaving Cole's office. She couldn't believe he'd stuck her with his mother. She had to give it to him, though. This one might make her throw in the towel. The woman was insufferable. Kirsten tried the Met, but Mrs. Harrington had already seen everything. She'd suggested all the usual touristy things— but this wasn't her first time in the city, of course, so none of that flew. She didn't want to use the company box at the theater to catch the new show. Nothing was acceptable. Kirsten had hoped feeding the woman would help. Maybe her blood sugar was low. Cole definitely got hangry when he needed food. So they were currently sitting in Mrs. Harrington's favorite restaurant— and she had still found fault with everything. She hated the table, so they'd had to switch. She wasn't happy with the menu and requested a special dish, which, of course, they wouldn't accommodate, which started another tirade. She was, at the moment, in the bathroom, probably cussing out whatever poor attendant had the misfortune of being in there over the quality of the toilet paper or something— Kirsten had a feeling the woman was just bored and upset that the son she'd come to visit didn't have the time to be with her, and Kirsten was the lucky recipient of her bad mood. Yay! The waiter came by, and Kirsten ordered another bottle of wine. Make it an expensive one. That bad, is it? Mrs. Harrington asked. Kirsten looked up as Mrs. Harrington sat back down. No, of course not, she started to say, but Mrs. Harrington waved her off. I know I'm not always the easiest person to be around, she said. Oh, not at all. You're fine. Mrs. Harrington gave a delicate snort, and Kirsten wanted to kick herself. She should have been able to come up with something better than your fine. The waiter returned with the wine and poured. Mrs. Harrington raised her glass to her. My son is paying, isn't he? Yes. Well, then, she looked up at the waiter. Leave the bottle. Kirsten grinned, genuinely amused for the first time that day. Mrs. Harrington took a deep drink and sighed. Time to get real. No reason not to. If she pissed Mrs. Harrington off, what was Cole going to do? Fire her? She sure as shit hoped so. Okay, Mrs. H. The woman looked at her, eyes wide with surprise. Kirsten put her elbows on the table and leaned in. What is it you really want to do? Mrs. Harrington blinked at her a few times. Kirsten could almost see her weighing her answers. 
Usually, when I come into town, I attend a show, visit a few museums, have tea. Kirsten nodded. And your tone tells me how much you enjoy doing all that. Now tell me what you really want to do. It took another few seconds, but Mrs. Harrington finally looked up at her and smiled. I read an article about these secret speakeasy clubs around the city. That sounds like fun. Done. What else? Mrs. Harrington's smile widened. I heard there is a certain show with a group of nice Australian boys that is in town. Kirsten gave an answering smile and quickly googled the thunder from down under. Woman after my own heart. Done she said, showing her the phone. Let's get out of here. Kirsten flagged the waiter to pay their bill and then headed out with Mrs. Harrington. You know, the show doesn't start for several hours and the clubs don't really open until later in the evening. Why don't we head over to Bloomingdale's and get a little something to wear on our night on the town? My dear, that might be the best idea I've heard from you yet. They burned their way through Bloomingdale's for the better part of the afternoon and then hit up a salon to get completely dolled up. While they were sitting under the hairdryers, Mrs. Harrington's phone buzzed about 30 seconds before Kirsten's. Apologies from Cole. Looks like his meetings are running late, Kirsten said. Typical. That boy always did work too hard. Even as a kid? Dirt on coal, straight from the source. Kirsten couldn't pass that up. Oh, yes. He started with lemonade stands when he was six, subcontracted them out to all his friends. She said, chuckling. He got them started, helped them get set up, made the signs, all that. Then he'd take 10% of their earnings, made enough for a new skateboard without having to do any of the real work. She smiled and shook her head. Moved to mowing lawns, then delivering newspapers. He always had something going on and usually came up with ways to maximize his productivity to make more money. Like with newspapers, folding the things took longer than actually delivering them, so he paid a couple of his buddies to prep them, and then he'd hop on his bike and get them delivered. Sounds like he was a hard-working kid. Always. I worry about him sometimes. A solid work ethic is good, but he takes it too far. Well, you should know. Kirsten nodded. She could indeed vouch that the man never stopped. I always hoped he'd meet a nice girl someday and settle down. Kirsten shoved aside the sudden twinge of jealousy that the thought of some other woman with him sparked. But the last few women he's dated were nothing but gold diggers who broke his heart. Makes it hard for him to date. Kirsten frowned. Cole had said something similar, and once again, she realized how many of her judgments of him had been made on unfounded assumptions. Forty-five minutes later, they were in an Uber headed for the super-secret location of the speakeasy Kirsten had found. To get in, they even had to knock on the door and give a code word. She tipped the hostess generously to give them a table right in front of the stage. Mrs. Harrington looked around the club. Now, this is what I'm talking about. The decor was definitely 1920s Art Deco. Oh, and look, Kirsten said, pointing to the menu their waitress had given them. They specialize in 20s cocktails. I think I'll try a bee's knees, Mrs. Harrington said. Kirsten ordered a Mary Pickford and ordered a second round for them both just to save some time. Mrs. Harrington's eyes widened, but she didn't hesitate to start knocking back her gin cocktail with honey and citrus. Oh, she said, eyes watering a little. Quite refreshing. Kirsten grinned at her and sipped on her own citrusy rum concoction. She didn't get halfway through the drink before the pleasant buzz filled her head. Now, what's the stage for? Mrs. Harrington asked. Well, when I was Googling around, I saw that this particular club has a floor show. She checked her phone. 
That should be starting right about now. A show? Kirsten nodded. One I guarantee you'll love. Before she finished speaking, the music in the club changed into something with a little more beat, and the spotlight hit the low stage. Several well-muscled men marched out, all wearing fitted pinstripe suits and carrying tommy guns. They play-acted a little cop and rum-runner routine, and then the clothes started coming off. Mrs. Harrington's jaw dropped, and she turned to Kirsten, who couldn't help but laugh at the expression on her face. I figure we might as well kill two birds with one stone, she said, raising her voice over the bead of the music. Very efficient of you, dear, Mrs. Harrington said, raising her glass to Kirsten and downing the rest of the liquid inside. The men on the stage started to really get into their routine, and OMG! Woo! Kirsten yelled, waving a 20 in the air. Mrs. Harrington watched, fascinated as one of the glistening, gorgeous men danced his way over to them. Whip out a 20, Kirsten said to her. That much? Are you sure? Sure, I'm sure. If we run out, We'll hit up the ATM, she said with a grin, flashing Cole's credit card. Mrs. Harrington laughed and waved a 20 in each hand. There you go, Kirsten said. They tucked the cash into the guy's G-string and catcalled him as he danced toward another table. Kirsten handed Mrs. Harrington another drink, and they toasted each other before downing them. Mrs. Harrington shuddered and slammed the glass down. I think the room is spinning. Kirsten laughed. Mine too. Somewhere deep in her consciousness, she registered the thought that getting her boss's mother smashed while drooling over half-naked men was probably not the best idea in the world, even if she was trying to get fired. But the dancing hunks in front of her and the alcohol coursing through her system made it a little hard to concentrate on logic like that, which she quite enjoyed. It was nice not to pay attention to logic for once. She ordered them both two more drinks. The song ended, and the men took a beefy bow. Kirsten and Mrs. Harrington cheered along with the other women, kicking it up a notch when a new crop of men came out. Three songs and, well, she'd lost track of how many drinks later. She leaned over so Mrs. Harrington could hear her over the music. So, you've been to a speakeasy and a strip show. Now what do you want to do? Mrs. Harrington knocked back another drink and smiled. I want to get up there with them. Before Kirsten could say anything, Mrs. Harrington was on her feet and climbing up onto the low stage. Kirsten laughed. There was a small part of her that knew she should probably stop her, but the rest of her thought that was a damn fine idea. The men didn't even look phased. Probably something that happened every day, though maybe not with a 60-year-old woman tastefully dressed in a Chanel suit. They took it in stride. One of them grabbed Mrs. Harrington around the waist and started getting down and dirty while the crowd went wild. Kirsten hollered until her throat was sore. Then she noticed security heading toward the stage. Uh-oh. She staggered up onto the stage herself and tried to get Mrs. Harrington's attention. Difficult to do, as the woman was currently having the time of her life, bumping and grinding with a Viking god a third her age. Mrs. H., we have to go, she said, pointing over at the security officers. Uh-oh, Mrs. Harrington said, finally paying attention. Yeah, my sentiments exactly, Kirsten said. Unfortunately, getting up on the stage had been a lot easier than trying to get down when the whole world was spinning. Security made it to them before they made it back to the safety of the crowd. Equally unfortunate, Mrs. Harrington apparently did not like being manhandled by any authority figure not in a tearaway outfit. 
They managed to get her off the stage with Kirsten following behind, trying to calm Mrs. Harrington down and get her away from security. It probably would have been okay, except that Mrs. Harrington decided the security officer escorting her to the door was mighty handsome himself. She wrapped an arm around his neck and tried a few of the new dance moves she'd just picked up. Kirsten tried the new evasion techniques she'd learned, and neither of them were remotely sober enough to attempt anything. Things went fuzzy for a few minutes. There were more men, more uniforms, more fuzzy moments, glimpses of Mrs. Harrington surrounded by men having the time of her life. Then the car door slammed and Kirsten realized they were in the back of a cop car. They looked at each other eyes wide, and then both dissolved into giggles. They leaned against each other, laughing until their sides hurt. When they finally caught their breath, Mrs. Harrington looked around them again. I think we just got arrested. Kirsten nodded. I think you're right. Well, that's new. That set Kirsten off giggling again. Hey, she said after a few more laughs. What's your first name? Mrs. Harrylon Harrystown? She paused and narrowed her eyes, trying to force the right name out of her brain. Harrington is a long name. Harriet, she said, nodding and pointing at herself. Your name is Harriet Harrington? Yes, how's that for a mouthful? Kirsten giggled again. I'm gonna call you Harry, kay? Harry? I think I like that. What do I call you? Kirsten shrugged. You should ask your son. He calls me lots of things. Mrs. Harrington's eyes widened. Like what? she asked in the same tone of voice a seven-year-old might use when an adult is telling them a secret about Santa. Oh, just lots of things, like Christy and Kesty and Crispin. Oh, I like that one. I'm going to call you Crispin, too. Deal, Kirsten said, laughing until she hiccuped. Now what do we do? Mrs. Harrington asked. I'll tell you a secret. Kirsten slurred, leaning over like she was going to whisper in the other woman's ear. I don't know. Never been arrested before. Me either, Mrs. Harrington whisper shouted like it was a huge secret she didn't want people to know. I think we get a phone call, Kirsten said. Oh, good. We can call Cole. He'll come get us. Good idea, Kirsten said. Then she froze, a glaring realization sobering her up a bit. Um, wait. Bad idea. Very bad idea. Mrs. Harrington looked at her, squinting her eyes like she was trying to bring Kirsten into focus. Why? Kirsten had known why not a second ago, but now she couldn't quite grasp the reason. I don't know. Let's call him. Good idea, Mrs. Harrington said. I just have to throw up first. Don't worry. I'll dial, Kirsten said. She patted herself down and fuzzily realized she didn't have her phone on her. Where's my phone? Mrs. H. moaned and looked down into her purse. I don't remember eating that. Do you have my phone? Kirsten asked. Mrs. H. looked back into her purse and then held the bag out to Kirsten. She wasn't positive, but she was pretty sure the black lump beneath Mrs. H.'s lunch was her phone. Ah, oh, nuts. I think I need a new phone. Chapter 13 Cole glanced at the unfamiliar number on his phone. Is that them? Brooks asked. Cole shook his head. 
He had a bad feeling. He'd been texting Kirsten and his mother for the last hour, and neither one had answered. Kirsten might be on her crusade to the unemployment or new employment line, but he didn't think she'd purposely worry him, especially when she had his mother with her. And he knew his mother wouldn't ignore his calls. He'd hoped they had just used his box seats to see the new Broadway production that was playing. But the longer they went without answering him, the more concerned he got. No, I don't know who it is. He swiped to answer. Cole Harrington. He listened to the man on the other end of the phone, his eyes going wide as the officer relayed what had happened. Brooks looked at him and mouthed, What's going on? Yes, she's my mother. Yes, officer. Brooks' eyes widened farther. I'm sorry, can you say that again? Cole wasn't sure if he should laugh or swear at the top of his lungs. I mean, how the hell was a man supposed to react when told his mother had been arrested? In a strip club. For manhandling the performers, assaulting the officers, resisting arrest, and defiling a police vehicle? Yes, I understand. I'll be right down. He hung up the phone, head reeling. Never in his wildest imagination... What's going on? Brooks asked again. That was a nice police officer informing me that my mother and assistant were arrested at a strip club for accosting the dancers. Brooks' eyes went wide. He opened his mouth to say something, closed it, opened it again. Yeah, my thoughts exactly. He sighed and headed for the door to go bail his mother out of jail. He was never going to let her live this down. When he got to the jail, he filled out all the paperwork and paid the fine to get both his mother and Kirsten out of the slammer. He assumed they'd come out contrite and embarrassed for what they'd done. Guess he forgot what happened when people assumed something. They came stumbling out, arms around each other, laughing their asses off, until they looked up and saw him. There he is, Kirsten said. She marched up to him, grabbed his face, and planted a huge kiss right on his lips. If he hadn't been so stunned and standing in a jailhouse with his mother and several amused officers watching, he might have taken a bit more advantage of an opening like that. Then again, she was so drunk the fumes were making his eyes water. Probably not the best time to be making moves on his errant assistant. Told you I'd do it, Harry, Kirsten yelled back to his mother. You go, Crispin, his mother said. Okay, what the actual fuck? He opened his mouth to say something, took another look at Harry and Crispin giggling like 12-year-olds at a slumber party, and shook his head. When Kirsten sobered up, they were going to have a conversation about appropriate pastimes for his mother. Until then, he sighed. He'd just hope he could get them home without one or both of them vomiting all over the car. Speaking of which... Who defiled the police vehicle? His mother raised her hand. Sorry, my purse was full. She held it out to him, but he held up a hand. I'll take your word for it. Oh, and I need a new phone, Kirsten said, wrapping her arms around his. What happened to yours? It's in her purse. She jerked her thumb toward his mother, who gave him a dazed smile. He opened his mouth to respond and then just shook his head. Let's go. He marched them out to the car, ignoring Luke's surprised expression as he wrangled them inside. It took him a few minutes to get them settled, facing forward in their own seats with both feet on the ground, even with Luke's help. Seat belts. Cole said when he finally got them situated. His mother grimaced, but managed to get hers on. Kirsten, on the other hand, grabbed the shoulder strap and stared at it like she'd never seen one before in her life. 
Cole sighed, took it from her, and buckled her in before sitting beside her and buckling his own. Luke watched the process in the rearview mirror, his eyes so wide his eyebrows had disappeared into his hairline. Cole scowled, just drive. Yes, sir, Luke said, his lips twitching. Cole sighed but couldn't blame a man. He was about to lose it himself. Never in his life had he ever seen his mother even remotely out of control. Even at his sister's funeral, when he had been a sobbing wreck, her grief had been kept in hand, dignified. Yet a few hours with Kirsten, and suddenly his mother was doing a damn good impression of a drunken groupie on a rock tour. If either of you needs to vomit, roll down the window. I'll be fine, his mother said. I'm going to need a new purse, though. Yes, you mentioned that, he said dryly. How about you? He asked Kirsten, who was still holding on to his arm. I'm good. I left my purse at home. He bit his lip. No, I meant how do you feel? No vomiting for me, thanks. She cuddled up against his shoulder. You know, you're kind of handsome when you aren't being an ass. His mouth dropped open. Told you, his mother said. He was always a nice boy. He has pretty eyes, too. He stared at her over the top of Kirsten's head, completely speechless. Kirsten took his face in her hands and turned him back to her. He does have pretty eyes. Always liked them. What the hell? He didn't know whether to laugh, call the paramedics, or start filming them to use his leverage later. You need to settle down with a nice girl, Cole his mother said, squinting at him. Either she'd forgotten her contacts that morning, or the alcohol was making her see double. He had his money on the ladder. Crispin's a nice girl, she said. Yep, I'm nice, Kirsten said. I'm not rich, though. He likes some rich. That's not true, he said. Oh, sure it is. It's okay, though. I get it. Oh, wait, I am rich now. There you go, his mother said, waving at them. Nice and rich. Perfect for you. Cole took a deep breath. First of all, I don't only like rich women. Kirsten opened her mouth to argue, but he held a hand up. She sat back with a pout. And second of all, I know how much I pay you, so unless you're embezzling, I wouldn't classify you as rich. Not that that matters. And third of all, he looked at his mother, I'm perfectly happy with my life the way it is. I don't need to get married. It's okay, Kirsten said to his mother. I'll still make sure he has underwear every day. His mother glared at him. Well... I'm not getting any younger, and I would like some grand tacos. Tacos? Kirsten asked, looking out the window. Cole frowned, the ache in his head beginning to throb. You want grand tacos? His mother leaned forward. Pull over, Mr. Driver. Luke glanced in the rearview mirror and met Cole's eyes. No pulling over. Cole said. Luke nodded, though within moments they'd slowed to a crawl with the traffic. Thanks, his mother said, taking advantage of a momentary stop. She popped off her seatbelt and opened the door. Get back in the car, Cole said, leaning across Kirsten to grab at his inebriated mother. I'll get her, Kirsten said, making a break for it, too. Shit, pull over, Cole said though Luke had already begun pulling the car as far off the road as he could. Cole jumped out, cursing the lack of child safety locks in his car, and jogged to the food stand on the corner where his mother had just been handed a large taco, which she promptly shoved in her mouth. Hey, that's five bucks, lady, 
the vendor said. Pay him, Cole, his mother said around a mouthful of spicy meat and crispy tortilla. Mine, too, Kirsten said, holding up a taco in either hand. Cole silently groaned and pulled a fifty from his wallet, handing it to the man. That's too much, he said. Cole yelled, keep it, over his shoulder, and hurried to catch the tipsy twins, who were winding through the crowd, taco juice dripping down their chins as they munched. He grasped each one by the elbow and steered them toward a planter box in front of the building they were passing. Sit, both of you. He parked them and then stood staring down at them, arms crossed. He had to hand it to Kirsten. As far as fireable offenses went, this one was fairly spectacular. It was impressive, really. Neither one of you had better move another muscle. He's so bossy, Kirsten Mock whispered. He ignored her and focused on his mother. I thought you were feeling ill. Not anymore. Now I'm hungry. Heaven help him. Was this what he'd been like as a wayward teenager? Okay, fine. I would have gotten you something to eat. Why did you jump out of the car? That was dangerous. Kirsten and his mother glanced at each other, grinned, and held up their food, both saying, Tacos! before dissolving into another mess of giggles. He rubbed his hand over his face and pulled out his phone to call Luke. He gave him their location and stood back to watch his mother and her new BFF while they stuffed their faces. Those tacos were going to come back to bite them in the ass. He just hoped to be out of the car when they made their reappearance. Chapter 14 Cole sat at his desk, staring at the phone in his hand. 10.13. Kirsten had promised to be at work by nine. Then again, she'd been moments from passing out when he'd finally gotten her home. Chances were good she hadn't remembered a thing either one of them had said or done. Her kiss, drunken dare that it had been, still lingered on his lips. He could still feel her body pressed against him. His shirt still held the faint scent of magnolias that may or may not have tempted him to sleep with the damn thing. That kiss, though, that was something else he'd like to revisit. After he found out why in the hell she'd taken his mother to get smashed at a strip joint and decided whether he'd let her win and fire her. He should. She deserved it. Although no real harm had been done. They did need to get a few things straight, though. But he couldn't talk to her if she didn't show up, and so far she was nowhere to be found. Over an hour late. His mother, at least, was still safely passed out in the hotel, with no plans to leave that spot, as far as he could tell. Kirsten, though. Maybe you should call the cops. Cole glanced up at Brooks with a glare. Brooks just shrugged. What? They had her last time. Funny. Brooks grinned, cracking himself up as usual. Well, she's never just not shown up before, right? Even with this ridiculous deal going on with the two of you. Cole ignored that. No, she hasn't. Well, then, maybe something happened. Or maybe she's sick. You can't drink like that and not pay for it the next day. Hell, she might still be passed out. Although, if she is, that's probably not good. Cole waved him off, hating to admit he agreed with him. Cole had never been the doomsday kind of guy whose thoughts went right to the worst possible scenario. But really, Kirsten had never done anything like this before— and his concern was starting to morph into full-blown worry. Before he could decide one way or the other, Kirsten blew into the office. At least, he thought it was her. He looked her up and down, his eyes widening the more they took in. She wore her typical pencil skirt, but instead of her usual killer heels, she was sporting a well-used pair of Converse, 
and her tailored shirt had been replaced with a baggy sweatshirt. Her hair fell in slightly ratted waves around her shoulders in a picture-perfect bedhead do, and the big brown eyes which usually watched him with all their veiled secrets were covered by a pair of oversized sunglasses. Cole didn't realize that no one had made a peep since she entered until Brooks's voice startled him out of his stunned trance. Hey there, Kirsten. Looks like you had a rough night. You have no idea, she muttered. She came toward Cole's desk and reached for his coffee cup. I already have some, he started to say, but choked it off when she lifted the cup to her lips and took a big sip. Ugh, I don't know how you drink it like this, she said before taking another sip. Then she let out a sigh and slumped into the chair in front of his desk. He opened his mouth to say something but couldn't think of a damn thing. Brooks had a startled grin on his face that was sure to turn into complete laughter any second. Cole jerked his head toward the door. He didn't need any comments from the peanut gallery while he dealt with whatever the hell was up with his formerly perfect assistant. Well, he knew what was up with her, but he'd honestly never expected her to be able to carry it to such lengths. Aggravating lengths at time, yes, but at this point, he'd put up with just about anything to see how much farther she'd go. Plus, there was no way he was losing that damn pool. Brooks sighed and pushed himself out of his chair. Fine, well, I guess I'll be going then. Kirsten lifted a hand and waved. Bye-bye, Brooksy. Catch you around. Brooks stopped short, his jaw hitting the ground. Brooksy? He mouthed. On second thought, I think I'll hang around for a while. He leaned back against the wall, arms folded, and a permagrin plastered to his face. All righty, you stay. I'll go, Kirsten said, pushing herself out of the chair. She took another big slurp of Cole's cup and then put it back on his desk. I'll be in my office. She turned and left without another word, leaving both men staring after her in dumbfounded silence. They watched her through the glass walls that separated her office from Cole's as she went straight to her desk, flopped into her chair, and proceeded to lightly bang her head on the tabletop. What the hell was that? Brooks asked, his voice choked with laughter. Is she all right? I haven't got a fucking clue. Kirsten stopped banging her head and laid her face on the desk, her arms coming up to circle her head. Cole stood up, too many emotions scrambling through him to pick one and stick with it. He scowled at Brooks, who was still watching her with a delighted smile. Don't you have something better to be doing right now? Brooks snorted. Better than watching you deal with Kirsten's imminent implosion? You're joking, right? Cole grimaced. Stay here. He went past his pain-in-the-ass friend into Kirsten's office. He stood in front of her desk a full five seconds, waiting for her to look up. She didn't. He sighed. Kirsten? Kirsten, he said louder when the first time didn't work. Still no response. He leaned closer to shake her shoulder when a faint snore emanated from behind her arms. She's sleeping? Brooks said, breaking out into a full-on laugh. Cole's glare was enough to have Brooks holding his hands out and backing away from the door. Cole picked up the big stack of folders on her desk and let them drop back down with a bang. Kirsten jerked up, her glasses now crooked and revealing one bloodshot eye. Feeling better? he asked her. She put her hand to her head, grimacing in pain. Not really, no. She straightened her glasses and put her hands flat on the desk in front of her. In fact, I think I'm going to have to bail today. 
She pushed herself up and headed for the door. You're going to have to bail? He'd never felt so out of control in his life. His life ran like a well-oiled machine, and the woman who kept it running that way had seriously gone off the deep end. Yep, sorry. I need you to stay. I have a lot of work I need you to get to. Kirsten held up a hand. No can do, boss man. I'll catch you tomorrow. I think. The merger meeting with Octagon Tech is starting in five minutes, and I need you there. She groaned. Fine. The info on their app is in a folder on my desk, somewhere. I'll meet you in the conference room. She walked straight past him and Brooks, who looked as though his day had just been made for the next month, and didn't stop until she hit the elevator. Cole went back into his office and pulled up the security cameras. Brooks watched over his shoulder as Kirsten appeared on the screen, leaving the elevator on the next floor. She didn't even pause, but went straight to the conference room, stumbled inside, and slumped into a chair. He couldn't be sure, but it looked like she might be snoring again. What the fuck? Brooks said. I never thought she'd take trying to get fired this far. Guess that shows you not to underestimate people. Cole snorted. So you going to fire her yet? Brooks asked. Hell no. It's just starting to get interesting. Brooks shook his head. I don't know. I'm starting to think you might have met your match. Ever think you might not win this one? I mean, you stuck her with your mother for the day, and she apparently ended up having the time of her life. Cole gave him a quick grin. I always win. I'll just have to up my game after I get through this meeting. And if she purposely screws that up? Cole stopped at that. It was one thing for Kirsten to mess with him in her quest to get fired. It would be another if she intentionally sabotaged a merger that meant a lot of time, money, and jobs for a lot of people. He didn't think she'd take it that far, though. If she did, I guess I'll just deal with that if it happens. He managed to locate the folder on her desk and made his way to the conference room, where he was greeted once again by the sight of Kirsten out cold and slightly drooling. It might have been the stress talking, but she was kind of adorable all tuckered out. Not that he could leave her that way. Cole considered dropping his files on the desk in front of her again, or maybe shouting her name right in her ear, though that was a little too cruel. He instead leaned down, put his lips right next to her ear, and whispered, Kirsten. He had to whisper a few times before she sleepily turned to him. Hi, she murmured, her eyes still closed. She raised her hand and cupped his cheek, drawing him down to meet her lips. She kissed him, slow and deep and agonizingly perfect. He froze, both because it was not a reaction he remotely expected, and because if he tried to stop, his body would shut down in revolt. In that moment, there was nothing in the world he needed so much as to kiss her. But he should stop it. She had to be at least half asleep, dreaming maybe, and almost certainly not of him. He'd stop it in another minute or two. She finally pulled away and blinked up at him with a sleepy smile. He smiled back. He knew the exact moment she realized where she was and what she'd just done. She jerked with a gasp. He grinned wider. Good morning. Are you ready to work now? You, we, why did you, me? I did nothing. That was all you. And I didn't want to be rude, so... Her eyes grew wide. You didn't want to be rude? Yes. My mother would never forgive me. She opened her eyes to respond, but he continued. Now, Octagon's group will be here any minute. Perk up. Kirsten's embarrassed confusion turned to a glare, and she let out a long sigh. 
Octagon's CEO is a total prick. Cole blinked, though at this point he wasn't sure why anything she did or said surprised him. It was probably fair to say that nothing was off the table anymore. You make a valid point, be that as it may, he said, trying to keep his tone even and not betray too much amusement. We've got a deal to broker. You up for it? Do I have a choice? No. She raised her eyebrows. Am I fired if I walk out anyway? Did she have to sound so hopeful? Sorry. No. She grimaced. Then yes, sir, I suppose I'm up for it. You know, he said, leaning down again so he could speak quietly, not going on a bender the day before a big meeting might be helpful. Kirsten snorted. Talk to your mother. That was all her idea. Before he could respond to that little gem, the door opened and one of the secretaries ushered in Octagon's group. Cole greeted them all. Kirsten remained in her seat, looking a little green around the gills. Maybe he should have let her go home after all, though she'd at least pushed her sunglasses up into her hair and was sitting upright. That was an improvement. Cole got them all seated and then launched into his spiel, outlining the advantages of the merger, all the things the two companies could do for each other. Mr. Daniels, who'd taken a seat next to Kirsten, sat back, his hands folded over his large paunch. He managed to maintain his bored expression throughout Cole's presentation, even though Cole knew the man desperately needed this merger to go through. But he'd been dealing with men like that his whole career, men who were jealous of his success, his youth, and everything that went with it all. It made nearly every meeting a pissing contest, and some men were worse than others. Tyler Daniels was a prime case in point. He shook his head. Well, that all sounds well and good, son, but I just don't know if your company's the right fit to develop my product, with your limited experience. Cole smiled, though he knew the expression didn't reach his eyes. Mr. Daniels, I may not have been in this business as long as you have, but don't mistake my youth for inexperience. I developed my first app before I was out of college and have successfully backed or developed some of the largest products and programs to ever hit the market. There is no one better qualified than me. Says you, but all your fancy charts don't mean much in the real world. Actually, Mr. Daniels, Kirsten said, and Cole held his breath, releasing it slowly when the professional Kirsten he knew and admired spoke. If you look at the chart showing now, you can see what the infusion of capital from our company can do in terms of both production and marketing, and... Mr. Daniels held up his hand, cutting Kirsten off. I'm not sure we're looking at the same chart, sweetheart. Mr. Daniel said, giving Kirsten the sort of indulgent look a parent would give a child who just finished their first finger painting. His condescending use of the word sweetheart had Cole seeing red. His next words didn't help. But if you look at those numbers on the bottom, those show projected revenue, and those numbers don't go up for several months. Maybe Mr. Harrington can explain. Cole inwardly snorted. He wasn't touching this one. Kirsten gave Mr. Daniels a cold smile that both impressed and slightly frightened Cole. I'm aware of what the chart is depicting, Mr. Daniels. I made it. The numbers, well, sure. Any secretary can copy numbers onto a chart, but I don't think you're really understanding what those numbers mean. I'm running a business here with a goal to make money. Kirsten pushed out of her chair. Mr. Daniels, she started, but he interrupted her again. Mr. Harrington, maybe you can explain the reason for that projected profit delay. Then he glanced at Kirsten as if he'd just remembered she was there. Would you get me a water there, hun? Those damn planes always make me parched. That's it. 
Kirsten loomed over Mr. Daniels, who looked up at her like she was a sweet little poodle who'd suddenly grown two heads and was trying to attack. I am too tired to sit here and listen to you mansplain my own chart to me or treat me like your own personal fetch and carry girl. Like it or not, the fact that I don't have a penis does not, in fact, mean I have no brain. You are a rude, condescending ass who doesn't know a good thing when he's got it. Mr. Daniels looked like he couldn't decide if he should be scandalized, angry, or impressed. Cole voted for impressed. Unfortunately, the man couldn't seem to help running his mouth. Whoa there! Just calm yourself, sweetheart. No need to get all emotional about it. Cole almost closed his eyes and groaned. Kirsten just smiled, though the steel in her eyes should have been enough to have Daniels quaking in his boots. Mr. Daniels, you really need to stop talking and start listening. Mr. Harrington is willing to take a chance on you, and you're so busy posturing you're going to talk yourself right out of a deal. Those numbers don't go up for a while because it's going to take us a few months to undo the mess you've made of your business. And you're going to take the deal and gratefully because no one else is interested in it and you want to save your company. He's the only one who's going to be knocking on your door, she said, pointing at Cole. And most of the time, the only way to get to him is through me. So if you want a water, you can damn well get it yourself or ask one of the several gentlemen who are sitting three inches from the bottle to pass one over. Now, if you gentlemen will excuse me, I think I've had about all I can take for the day. She turned and marched out the door without another word. You've got your hands full with that one, Mr. Daniel said. Cole pinned him with as cold a gaze as he could muster, his patience rapidly fraying. Actually, it's more accurate to say Ms. Abbott has her hands full with me. I'm typically the emotional one who needs calming down. She is one of the most intelligent and talented people I know, and it is an honor to work with her. And she was correct. We have the expertise and capital needed to produce and market your product— the numbers she worked up are sound. If you want to keep your company afloat, you'll sign the papers and we'll get started. If not, he stood and nodded at Mr. Daniels. Then good luck to you. I'll give you until the end of the week to make your decision. He left the conference room in time to see the elevator doors closing on Kirsten. He thought briefly about going after her, but between his mother and Mr. Daniels, he figured she'd earned a few hours off, and he needed a reprieve to get himself back in line. Now that Mr. Daniels was no longer in his face distracting him, he couldn't keep his mind off that sleep-induced kiss. If that was how Kirsten woke up, he could only imagine how she went to bed, and he really needed to stop imagining it, or he was going to cross all kinds of boundaries and break every rule he'd ever made— a task not nearly as simple as it sounded, because he'd never wanted to break a rule so badly in his life. He was so screwed. Chapter 15 Kirsten sat on the couch chewing on her lip. She felt much better than she had the day before. She'd slept most of the day after her brief foray into the office and the disastrous meeting— not to mention that kiss beforehand that she couldn't get out of her head. And when her alarm had gone off that morning, she'd been physically well enough to go in. Mentally, well, she'd never taken a personal day. It seemed like a good time to remedy that. Her phone went off again for the third time in less than a minute. She sat slightly forward, but Izzy's voice stopped her. Don't touch it! Wait another full minute at least! Kirsten glanced down at her iPad where she had Izzy pulled up on chat. Izzy leaned out of the frame a bit and then came back into view. He's looking at his phone and starting to pace now. You've got him on the rocks. Don't give up yet. But what if he's calling to fire me? I had to have gone far enough this time. 
I don't know. He looks worried, not pissed, Izzy said. By the way, Cassie said, scooting into view, the pool is up to a grand now. Kirsten blinked at that. How did that happen? Cassie shrugged with a mischievous grin. People saw you yesterday all hungover, heard about the meeting with Mr. Daniels and then no-showing today, and one of the secretaries overheard Mr. Larson talking to Mr. Harrington about what was going on with you, and so, of course, they asked us. And you told? Kirsten asked, not sure if she was more amused that the whole office was now betting on when she'd get fired or terrified Cole would find out what she was up to. The lawyer said we shouldn't tell anyone until we claim it, and he's still getting all our accounts and paperwork in place. Izzy chimed in. Not the whole story, of course. They know you're leaving. They just don't know the real reason why. They must all think I'm insane. Cass snorted. Hell no. They think it's brilliant. Harrington drives everyone nuts. You're their new hero. Before Kirsten could answer that, Izzy said, Oops, he's on the move, gotta go. And the screen went blank. Kirsten's phone rang. Cole. She let it go to voicemail. When the phone rang again, she got up and went into the bathroom. Sitting there staring at the damn phone was going to drive her crazy. To be honest, she was surprised someone from the office hadn't shown up at her door with a box full of her stuff yet. She'd taken the boss's mother to a strip joint, gotten her smashed and arrested, then bailed out of work after chewing out a potential client because she was too hungover to put up with his shit. How the hell could she not get fired? She still thought she should answer the phone in case that was why he was calling. Then again, he probably wouldn't fire her over the phone. Not his style. He liked to watch people squirm live and in person. It had to be driving Cole nuts not to be able to get a hold of her. She ran most aspects of his life. The thought of him running it on his own was almost enough to make her break out into hives. It must be doing a real number on him. Maybe if she took a shower, she could relax. At the very least, the running water would drown out the incessant sound of the phone ringing. She lingered under the hot water for as long as she could, but once the water lost its pleasant, steamy heat and started venturing into lukewarm territory, she climbed out. She dried off, wrapped her favorite fluffy towel around her, and sat on the couch to towel dry her hair. The phone rang again. Okay. She'd let him stew long enough. There was no way she was going to make it all day. She took a deep breath and answered. Hello? Are you dead? She choked off a startled laugh at that. No? Good. Are you coming into work today? His voice was smooth and deep, like a video she'd seen once of Tom Hiddleston reading the phone book, only with no English accent. Despite his more irritating qualities, she'd always loved his voice, even when it was barking at her to do something. No wonder the man was so successful. All he had to do was speak, and he had his opponents hypnotized. Thank God he had no accent. There would be no defense against that. He already had too many cards stacked against him. Kirsten? Her stomach bottomed out at the sound of him saying her name, and she reminded herself that he had no power over her anymore. She no longer needed her job, so there was nothing Cole could do to her. She wished she were better at acting like a badass, like Izzy. Kirsten had never been anything but polite and professional. Never burn a bridge had always been her motto. And there she was, trying to burn the biggest bridge of them all. But seriously, the man had spent the last several months torturing her. A little payback was in order. Nope, just not feeling up to it today. There was silence on the other end of the line, and for a moment Kirsten thought she'd done it. Pissed him off enough he'd cut her loose. Frankly, she'd been stunned he hadn't fired her the moment she'd walked into his office the day before. But maybe a second day of no-showing was enough to break him. 
she was starting to run out of firing offenses to try. Yes, I can imagine. If you're anything like my mother, you're having a few regrets about your choices right now. How is your mother? Still slightly hungover, which is impressive, really, though surprisingly cheerful despite that. Apparently, she had a good time with you. Maybe a little better than I would have liked, but still, it's nice to see her happy. Or at least it will be when she's returned to the land of fully functional adults. I know exactly how she feels. I bet you do. And while I'd love to let you languish in bed while you regret a few of your decisions, I'm afraid I can't dispense with you today. But no worries. I thought perhaps it would be best if I came to you. Someone knocked at the door and Kirsten shot to her feet. What? Come to the door. She stumbled to the door and looked out the peephole. Sure enough, Cole stood there in her hallway, looking for all the world as if it were something he did every day. Hello? She opened the door. So stunned to see him standing there, she momentarily forgot she wasn't dressed for company. At least it slipped her mind until Cole's eyes widened as they roved over her body. She clutched the towel to her, making sure it covered all her perkiest bits. Cole came inside, backing her up a step for every step he took. A small smile played on his lips, and she couldn't help staring. She'd always loved his mouth. A lot of men had thin lips that almost disappeared when they smiled, but Cole's were full, kissable. She shook her head and tried to draw in a deep breath. Having him in her home was throwing her off big time, like trying to understand some mind-bending philosophical quote taken out of context. I'm suddenly feeling a little overdressed, he said, with a heat in his eyes that had that delicious shiver running up her spine again. Well, if you told me you were coming here, I'd have put on something a little less comfortable. Don't feel the need to change on my account, he said, letting his gaze wander again. I think I like the new dress code. She bet he did. I'll be right back. She darted down the hall to her bedroom, her cheeks burning hot. She punched in Cassie's number while she quickly threw on some yoga pants and a baggy sweatshirt, then paused to gather up the strength to walk back out there. Hey, Kirsten, what's up? Cass answered. He's in our apartment, Kirsten whispered loudly into the phone. What? Who? Hang up and call the police. Why did you call me? No! Cole? Mr. Harrington? There was a slight pause. Mr. Harrington is in our apartment? Yes, she hissed. I answered the door in a freaking towel, and now he's just sitting out there on our couch. What the hell do I do now? I don't know. He's probably used to women answering the door in their towels. That got a snort out of her. This is true. Kind of my point, though. He's got a strict policy against inter-office dating. I mean... Even as much of a ladies' man as the tabloids think he is, he has never, that I'm aware of, dated anyone in the office. Well, it's not like you were wearing a sign around your neck that said, Date me. And he came to our apartment. He's the one with some explaining to do, not you. Yeah, that's true. He runs from commitment like you run from spiders. You're not some random model. You're the assistant he spent almost every waking minute with for the last six and a half months. I think if you were putting the moves on him, he'd probably be hauling ass right now. Huh, she said, an idea finally sparking. Despite their recent bouts of flirtatiousness, it hadn't been anything blatant. More spur of the moment unavoidable. What? Cass asked. You might be right. Maybe his close personal assistant suddenly showing a romantic interest might push him over the edge into firing her, especially since I already kissed him yesterday. Wait, you did what? Why didn't you mention that little tidbit? Because it's embarrassing. I was half asleep. Okay, you're going to have to explain that scenario when we've got more time, but right now maybe you should capitalize on that slip-up. 
Because seriously, what's more inappropriate than making a pass at your boss? Okay, so what are you wearing? What? Another voice said. What's who wearing? Who are you talking to? Izzy's voice carried over the phone. Cass put her on speaker and quickly filled Izzy in. Izzy snorted. I'll tell you what she's wearing. The baggiest sweatshirt she can find and a pair of ratty sweatpants or something. Kirsten's jaw dropped. How did you know that? Izzy and Cassie both laughed, and Cassie said, We know you, babe. He saw you almost naked, so you're totally going to overcompensate for it. Yeah, so strip the sweats, throw on something skin tight, and get your ass back out there, Izzy chimed in. And really sex it up, Cass added. We're at the two-week mark. If you get fired today, I win the pool. I'm not sure I can do this, Kirsten said. I mean, I'm a decent flirt. She ignored the scoffing on the other end of the phone. I am. If Brooks were here, I'd have no problem. Well, sure, Izzy said. But that's because Brooks would flirt with your 80-year-old grandmother. He does most of the work, makes it easy for you. Cole Harrington is a totally different story, especially when it comes to you. And why is that? Kirsten asked, already knowing the answer. Because Brooks would be a fun distraction for a minute. With Cole Harrington, it might go somewhere, and that terrifies you. Need some help in there? Cole called out. No, Kirsten said, her voice much too shrill. Get a grip, woman, Izzy said. Take a couple of deep breaths, Cass said. Sure, that'll help. She didn't say that, though. Instead, she said, Be right out. You can't stay in there forever, babe, Izzy said. Why not? Surely he'd go away eventually. Izzy snorted. Maybe, or maybe he'll come in there after you. Kirsten's stomach bottomed out at that suggestion, though she wasn't entirely sure if it was because she would dread that or because she wanted it. Good point, she sighed. Okay, I'm going. Call us later, Cass said. I will. Gotta go. She hung up and quickly grabbed a skimpy tank top from her drawer, switching it for the sweatshirt. She had to suppress a shiver. It was warm in the apartment, but it was not tank top weather just yet, especially when she wasn't wearing a bra, though that certainly wouldn't hurt the master plan any. She took one more deep breath and sauntered out. Chapter 16 Cole took one look at Kirsten and nearly ran from the room. She'd been better covered in the towel. The clothes she wore now left very little to his imagination. The yoga pants hugged every delectable curve of her body, and the tank top made it obvious that it was a bit nipply, uh, nippy in the apartment. Her hair hung in damp tendrils around her shoulders. The color darkened with the moisture. She licked her lips, and he had to clench his fists to keep from hauling her to him. What game was she playing at now? She plopped down on the couch next to him, much closer than he would have expected, and leaned back a little. There was little doubt that she was feeling a bit chilly. So she said, giving him a small smile. What can I do for you? Oh, the possibilities. He let his eyes rove over her one more time and then turned back to his briefcase, popping it open with much more force than was necessary. He needed to take back control of this situation. It seemed once again they were on the same page. If she was planning on driving him stark raving mad or pushing him into doing something physical she could then call him out on, she was off to a fucking amazing start. He'd been in her apartment all of five minutes and was damn near ready to concede defeat if it meant he could wrap himself around all those luscious curves. He yanked a stack of files out of his case and dropped them in her lap. 
She grunted a bit at their weight and frowned down at the pile. What are these? Those are all projects that we've done for the Irwin Foundation in the past. Hmm, she said, picking up a file and lightly running her fingers over it. Cole swallowed hard and got back to his bullshit. I, um... She sucked her lower lip into her mouth, her teeth lightly scraping along the tender flesh, and all the blood drained from his head. As you can see, he said, trying to find a safe spot to stare at on her body that wouldn't have his dick trying to jump from his pants to get to her. He settled on the line of her neck, on the soft pulse of her heartbeat that he could just detect beneath the surface. We haven't done a project for them in the last several years. I want you to go through the files, see if you can find some indication of why they've stopped calling. He leaned in a little closer, and the pulse rate he stared at ratcheted up a notch. Interesting. Something they were unhappy with, maybe. He reached over and ran his finger along one of the files and was rewarded by a quick intake of breath. Something maybe I can do to make them come. Her mouth dropped open in a little O. Oh, back to us. Her chest rose and fell with every breath she took, forcing those ample, pert breasts a fraction closer to him with every inhale. This was such a mistake. He'd meant to unnerve her, invading her home space like this, Instead, she had his head spinning like a teenager in the back seat of his daddy's car, about to hit second base for the first time. She sat forward, and for half a second he thought she might be leaning in for a kiss, but of course she wasn't. She dropped the file she held back in his lap. I already know why they've turned elsewhere for their developing needs. His gaze zeroed in on her lips. Oh, yeah? Why? Because their president, Chauncey Irwin, great guy. We used to play golf together. I know, I used to make your reservations. I hit my last hole in one playing with him. Actually, she said, those full, kissable lips pulling into a smile. He leaned in even closer. A few inches, that's all that separated them. You hit your last hole in one with his daughter. Cole froze, his gaze shifting from her mouth to her eyes. What? Patricia Luscheck, 25, brunette, pretty. She's his daughter? He only vaguely remembered the woman. If he recalled... She'd picked him up in the club bar one day after a rousing game of golf, and they'd compared swings in one of the cabanas. Yep, uses her mother's maiden name. Pretty sure she's no longer allowed at the country club after what you two did to the cabana. Cole rubbed his hand over his face. Well, shit. I guess that solves that little mystery. I guess so, she said with a small smile. Is there anything else you wanted from me? He looked into those big doe eyes of hers, the fresh, clean scent of her washing over him, and jumped up. She blinked up at him, startled. I need to use your restroom, he said, not waiting for her response before he bolted down the hallway. The moment he was inside, he yanked out his phone and texted Brooks. I'm fucked. Brooks's response came back almost immediately. I thought the plan was to get her to make a pass at you. I think you overplayed it. Very funny. I'm serious. I've been here ten minutes, and I'm losing what little control I had. You can't tell me that the great Cole Harrington is being beat at his own game by his timid little secretary. Cole snorted. She might be quiet but she's not timid. Hell, at the moment she's damn near terrifying. 
she answered the door in a damn towel. Need a little help? You know I'm always up for a little three-way action, though having you as the third isn't really a scenario I'd ever envisioned before, but I'd be game if she is. Fuck off. Hey, you texted me. I'm just trying to help. Yeah, help yourself. Well, there's not much I can do for you from here. You're alone in an apartment with a hot, half-naked woman. This shouldn't be difficult. You have no idea. I didn't think she had it in her. She doesn't yet. I keep offering to fix that, and you keep telling me to fuck off. Fuck off. Seriously, if you want me to be serious, you've got to stop setting yourself up like that. I'm only human. Yeah, right. Get back out there, or concede defeat, fire her, and then you can keep her chained to your bed guilt-free. Not going to happen. Fine. Then sack up and get back out there. Don't text me again unless you're inviting me over. Cole snorted and took a deep breath. He could do this. Fucking hell, he had women throwing themselves at him all the time. Now that he was actively trying to get one to do so, it really shouldn't be this hard. Bad choice of words, maybe. But apt. He went back out to the front room, where Kirsten was bent over the back of the couch, her pert little ass in the air as she tried to reach something she dropped over the side. Hey! she said, glancing back at him over her shoulder. Could you help me? I dropped my hairband and can't quite reach it. Cole stared, his body somehow both numb and on fire at the same time. Then he shook his head. He knew when he'd been beaten at his own game. Sorry, I have to run. He turned on his heel and marched to the door. But your briefcase, the files... Bring them to the office with you when you feel up to it. Take as long as you need. He yanked open the door and kept on going. He didn't even care if he was conceding defeat. He was man enough to admit she'd won this round. If he stopped for even a second, the tenuous hold on his control would snap, and he'd have her bent over the couch moaning his name before she had a chance to blink twice. It had been a mistake meeting her on her turf. Next time, he'd make sure he had home court advantage, and then he'd have her right where he wanted her. Kirsten labeled another large manila envelope and got the files ready to send off. Yet another report on another meeting that probably didn't accomplish anything. But everyone in every relevant department still needed to be notified that no changes had been made just so everyone was up to speed. There were a few important documents in her pile, building specs and codes that needed to be sent for approval, financial reports and pending patents on various projects, a business plan for a new app they were developing, leases and rental agreements on other properties. A wicked little idea popped in her head, and she paused, a smile growing on her lips. She grabbed the inter-office memos and pulled them from their envelopes. Opportunities to truly mess with Cole could not be passed up. Nothing would be irreparably damaged if the wrong paperwork was sent to the wrong department. She wanted to wreak a little havoc and make Cole's life a bit more uncomfortable, not destroy his business or irreversibly ruin any projects. However, a few delays here and there wouldn't hurt much while accounting hunted down their paperwork, which was now on the way to... She grabbed the envelope for marketing and shoved the papers in. Or while legal waited for acquisitions to swap their files. Aggravating for everyone, yes, but it wouldn't be fatal. Except, hopefully, to her employment. They'd have to start a new pool if he didn't can her soon. The fact that he'd held out this long blew her mind. She grabbed another file off the stack and took a quick look. Permits for something called Piper's House that needed to be sent to legal for filing ASAP. And an opening night party for the place? 
not one she'd heard of, which was odd. She was familiar with all of Cole's projects. Sounded like he was buying a house for one of his girlfriends. And having a housewarming party? Why hadn't he had her plan it? He always had her take care of that kind of thing. Unless he didn't want to involve her because of what had been happening between them lately. Had anything been happening? Or was it still silent warfare, seeing who would crack and bail first? It was getting hard to tell, which wasn't good. It wasn't like he was ever going to offer her a relationship, not that she'd want one with him. She already handled all the details of his life. Being in a relationship with him would just add more to her to-do list for him, not that he'd want to be with her anyway. As far as he knew, she was just his broke employee, not worthy of relationship status. So why did the thought of this woman make Kirsten's stomach twist, no matter how she tried to shake off the unwelcome and confusing feeling? It certainly wasn't any of her business who he dated or what he bought them, though she hadn't been aware of anyone serious enough to warrant a new house. Maybe he was trying to buy off an old girlfriend, or set up a new one, or... Kirsten? Her head jerked up. Cole stood in her doorway, leaning against the frame in that casual way that probably took hours of practice to achieve. The pose showed off every hard and rippling line of him to perfection. His crossed arms had his biceps straining the seams of the gorgeous, tailored, button-down shirt that probably cost more than her rent. Her eyes traveled down the line of his well-fitted slacks, mouth nearly watering at the view she'd get when he turned to walk away. No matter how aggravating the man was, he was one seriously impressive specimen of manhood. Her eyes darted back to his face, and she nearly cringed at the smug smile he aimed at her. She'd been careless to have been caught ogling, like the man's ego needed any more inflating. Busy? he asked her, nodding at the pile of files in front of her. Oh! she glanced down, remembered the file in her hand, and hastily shoved it in the pile with the others. No, just getting the inter-office files ready for delivery— was there something you needed, Mr. Harrington? He raised an eyebrow. Yes, Ms. Abbott, he said, his tone slightly mocking. Hey, he could mock all he wanted. Keeping it formal helped her keep her hands to herself. Because right at that moment, all she wanted to do was lightly rake her nails down his chest until he pinned her hands down and taught her a lesson for being naughty. She shook her head a little, trying to get a grip. She was supposed to be at war with the man, not crushing on him like he was some high school heartthrob. Would you like me to come to your office? She asked, grabbing her laptop, and wondering why he hadn't just asked her to go over there in the first place. That's not necessary. It won't take long. He came in and sat on a corner of her desk. I wanted to discuss the annual retreat for my poker club. Ah, yes, a retreat for a group of overly rich, overgrown little boys who apparently needed to go to some exotic location to sling their cards around. She grabbed a pencil and her notepad. Any special requests for this year? Yes, we can't fly anywhere. Christopher has an ear infection from his deep-sea diving trip last week, so we need somewhere in driving distance. Her eyebrows rose. In driving distance of the city? Last year they'd gone to Monaco. The year before that, it had been Rio. These men liked their annual retreat, and they liked it exotic and expensive. If they couldn't fly, she couldn't even set it up for Vegas. Cutting out flying limits your options quite a bit. Somewhere in the city, perhaps? No, we want to get out of town. The Hamptons? He waved that off. Somewhere different. These retreats are a chance for us to get out of our regular lives and just relax for a few days. Nowhere we'd normally go. And it needs to be for this weekend. What? But you usually go at the end of the summer. We have too many schedule conflicts this year. 
I know it's short notice, but I'm sure you'll come up with something. He leaned in, close enough she could smell the subtle hint of his soap. I have total faith in you. He gave her a cheesy wink and then slid off her desk to swagger his way back out the door. Oh, and I'll need you to come along with us this year. There are some time-sensitive projects that may need your immediate attention. It will be easier if you are on hand. He left and headed for the elevator. Within thirty seconds, Cassie and Izzy both invaded and plopped into the chairs in front of her desk. What was that about? Cass asked. The annual Billionaire's Poker Club retreat, Kirsten said, clicking open a browser window so she could start Googling locations within a few hours of New York City. Izzy rolled her eyes. What in the hell do these guys need to retreat from? They need a change of scenery? Is the shine on their massive penthouses starting to fade? They need a change of pace from the regular five-star resorts they usually frequent? Kirsten shook her head. I don't know. All I know is they want to be wowed. Go someplace they've never been before, different from the places they usually visit. Oh, and it has to be this weekend, and within driving distance of the city due to an ear infection. I usually have months to plan this thing. Cass's eyes widened. Well, they don't ask for much, do they? Izzy jumped up. Oh my God, I've got the best idea. Send them to Amish country. Cass's jaw dropped open and Kirsten started laughing. They definitely wouldn't be expecting that, though I'd probably go straight to hell for inflicting those four on the poor Amish. They'd never recover. Of course, I have to go with them this year, and if I'm going, I want electricity. But maybe I can stay at a nearby B&B or something, and I wouldn't be able to tell the boys where they were going or they'd bail before I got them there. It'd be hard to mess with them if I can't get them to show up. Izzy sat back. Good point. Oh, what if you sent them on a little scavenger hunt or something? Make them think you've booked them in one place and then send them somewhere else. Like, send them to some dodgy pit hole? Make them think that was the joke so they'll be happy to continue on to the real destination with too many questions? Kirsten smiled. Oh, this could be fun. Cass frowned. What else is close enough they can drive to that might be remotely entertaining enough to get them to go? Niagara Falls? Izzy asked. Kirsten frowned. Maybe. There are hotels there, at least. She kept scrolling through the options on the Google list she'd pulled up and stopped at one. She clicked on it and then on a link to hotels in the area. An idea formed in her head and her smile grew. Oh, this'll be good. What? Cass and Izzy both said, jumping up to look over her shoulder. She picked up the phone and dialed the number of the hotel she'd selected, so excited at the prospect of planning this trip she was almost giddy. When the front desk answered, she quickly went through the process of reserving the room she needed and then hung up. Izzy and Cass stared at her for a second, and then all three broke down into laughter. Oh, this is going to be perfect, Izzy said. Cass shook her head, though she was laughing. He's going to kill you. How? As long as he fires me first, that's all that matters. Now, if you'll excuse me, ladies, I have a few more arrangements to make. Cass and Izzy paused at the door for a moment to compose themselves before going out on the main floor. Then they left her to her master plan. You want strange and exotic, Mr. Harrington? Kirsten muttered under her breath with a diabolical little smile. You are so going to get it. Chapter 17 Cole slammed his hand of cards face down on the table. Damn. Harrison's flush had just beat his two pair. You must be cheating. Your luck is never this good. 
Harrison laughed and scooped up his winnings. Ah, come on, sport. You can't win them all. My track record says otherwise, Cole said with a wink. Cocky bastard. Harrison's soft British accent made even the insult sound charming. Speaking of always winning, Chris said, gathering the cards to reshuffle. How are things going in the battle against your assistant? She quit yet? Cole took a sip of his beer. No, she's held out longer than I thought she would. Brooks laughed. You've held out longer than I thought you would. I'd have fired her after the first time she forgot my coffee. No, you wouldn't. Cole took his cards and spread them out in his hand. Great, another pile of shit. He dropped three cards and gathered up the new ones he was dealt. True, Brooke said. But then again, I'm not you, and you definitely would have fired anyone else. Cole shrugged. It's been entertaining. Harrison dropped two cards and dealt himself two more. She's not still planning a retreat, is she? Of course. The three other men stopped what they were doing and stared at him. Cole popped a pretzel into his mouth and shrugged. What? The other men exchanged glances. Chris said, This woman has been actively trying to get fired for a couple of weeks now, purposely botching her assignments. You don't think having her plan our retreat might have been a bad idea? Cole shook his head. She hasn't screwed with anything really important. She does stuff to me personally, sure, but... Wouldn't this count as something that involves you personally? Brooks asked, tossing another thousand-dollar chip into the pot. Yes, Cole said, matching his bet. But it involves all of you as well. She knows how important these trips are to us. I don't think she'll mess with it. You don't think, Harrison said, laying out another winning hand. Cole swore and tossed his cards down. I'll admit, she's been surprisingly creative. The blood started draining from one head to the other at just the thought of her last creative move on him. He cleared his throat and took another long pull from his beer. But I've limited her options with this one, so we should be relatively safe. Brooke's eyebrows quirked up. Oh? How so? I told her Chris had an ear infection and couldn't fly. He grinned at his friend, who grimaced and chucked a pretzel at him. So she'll have to pick something within driving distance. The options are limited. Not really. Brooks said. There are plenty of horrible places she could dump us, like Disney World. What do you have against Disney World? Chris asked. Brooks cocked an eyebrow. I'm sure it's fabulous if you've got a minivan full of kids, but not really my first choice and destinations for an exclusive poker retreat. I don't think you have to worry about Disney World. That would require flying, Cole said. Oh, right. Brooks looked slightly relieved. Look, she might try and get a dig in, Cole said, but I'm sure she won't take it too far. She might put us somewhere that's not as luxurious as we prefer, but at least we know we won't get stuck in some drug den in Cambodia. And it's not like we won't be able to leave if we want to. She's not going to lock us up somewhere, I don't think. No, but we could end up in some quaint B&B &B in Connecticut run by someone's little old grandmother. Chris shook his head like that would be the worst punishment in the world. Or we could just take care of the arrangements ourselves, Harrison said. Brooks snorted. Nah, he doesn't want that. Harrison frowned. Why not? He's having too much fun. They all looked at Cole again, and he shrugged. I'm not going to deny. I'm curious to see what she comes up with. Harrison shook his head. Let's hope what she comes up with isn't a particularly fireable offense. Well, as a safety precaution, I'm having her come along with us this year. Wherever she chooses, she'll be staying also, Cole said. How bad can it be? 
Turns out, it could be bad. Very, very bad. Cole stood with his boys outside the hotel. At least he thought it was a hotel. Maybe it was a motel. He didn't even know what the difference was. All he did know was that Kirsten had outdone herself. Oh, he'd been sure she'd pull something. Frankly, Chris's B&B &B idea had seemed the most likely and not a circumstance Cole would have hated. This, though? Even he couldn't put a good spin on this. He looked down at the address in his phone one more time. This can't be the place. Harrison said, glancing up at the cracked plaster walls of the exterior. The sign that proudly proclaimed the junk heap in front of them as Poseidon's den sparked a bit as one of the neon lights flickered. Cole looked at his boys and then took a deep breath. He immediately regretted that decision. The air around the place permeated with a ripe stench that had his gag reflex kicking in. What is that smell? Chris asked. Cole tried not to inhale too deeply while breathing. If I had to guess, I'd say human sewage and vinegar, maybe, though I can't imagine anyone purposely mixing the two. He had to admit terrified and disgusted or not, he was impressed. She delivered the whole package, seedy establishment, environmentally unfriendly atmosphere, ear-splitting proximity to the freeway. It was a slumlord's wet dream. He pushed away from the car and headed toward the front office. There was no access from the outside, but there was a barred window, like a ticket booth for a rundown movie theater. The sketchy employee inside didn't even look up from his phone when Cole asked if there was a reservation there under his name. He just slapped a key card on the counter and pushed it through the narrow slot. Number 14, he said. Top of the stairs, end of the hall. Everything is set up. Cole took the card, resisting the urge to wipe it down before he touched it. He didn't bother asking what was set up. At that point, he wasn't sure he really wanted to know, though morbid curiosity demanded he check it out. He went back to his boys, who were all staring at him like he'd lost his damn mind, and held up the card. Brooks laughed. You gotta hand it to her. She's creative. Understatement of the year, Chris said. We aren't actually going in there, are we? Harrison's eyes flickered around the motel like he expected to be jumped by a swarm of cockroaches at any moment. Cole shrugged. Well, the guy said that everything was set up. Aren't you at least curious? Harrison snorted. You know that whole saying about curiosity killing the cat, right? I'm pretty sure it stemmed from situations like this. I'm going up. Cole turned and headed for the flight of concrete stairs leading to the outdoor hallway of the second floor of the motel. The other men trooped gamely behind him. Number 14 was the last door at the end of the hallway. Well, at least we're near the ice machine, Brooks said. Chris looked like he was ready to throw Brooks over the side of the railing. Cole slipped the card into the reader. It took three tries before the little green light signaled the door was unlocked. The interior wasn't as bad as he expected. It appeared relatively clean, at least, although clean was a subjective term. There wasn't filth caked on the walls, so that was a plus. There was, however, a suspicious stain on the carpet and a smell he didn't want to attempt to identify. The room was a suite. The main area had a living space with a couch, a television from the 80s on a rickety stand in the corner, and a folding table that had been set up for their poker games. Well, set up might be stretching things a bit. The table was standing, and on top of it was a box containing the table green, a box of cards, and a set of multicolored chips. Two doors stood open on either side of the living space, and Cole could see the bedrooms. 
One was occupied by two full-size beds. The other looked like it had a king and a rollaway cot. A small kitchenette was inside the door. He glanced at his crew, who were staring around the place with various expressions of open-mouthed surprise, some more horrified than others. Harrison, who'd been raised in an honest-to-God castle, would probably need therapy. Cole went into the kitchen and opened the fridge. It was fully stocked, with bargain basement beer and five-dollar bottles of champagne. Brooks was going through the cupboards. He pulled out a bag of generic pretzels and a box of cigars that still had the fluorescent orange clearance sticker on it and grinned at Cole. I think you underestimate your girl, he said with a laugh. Cole pulled a bulk-sized container of New Jersey's finest imitation crab meat out of the fridge and grinned. I'd say so. He put the meat back in the fridge, went into one of the bedrooms and pulled out his phone. She picked up on the second ring. Hello? Just the sound of her voice got his blood flowing faster. What was it about this woman? Kirsten, we just arrived at the hotel, or whatever this place is supposed to be. Great, I'm glad you found it. I was afraid the directions might not be clear enough. Oh, they were clear enough. Good, everything should be all ready for you. I left explicit instructions for the front desk. All the basics seem to be here, which, considering the help at the front desk, is probably a small miracle. Excellent. I'll admit I was a bit worried they wouldn't get all the details right. Oh, I'm certain they did exactly as you requested. He wouldn't be surprised if she'd also requested they purposely infect the room with bed bugs, or at the very least make the beds with the most stained bedding possible. He glanced down at the bedspread and took a step back. He sincerely hoped she requested the worst they had, because if that was the best, he suppressed a shudder. It's definitely different than our usual places. Well, you did say that's what you wanted, nowhere you'd normally go, something new. I didn't think you'd want some place too quiet or out of the way, but with such limited options for locations and with your vast experience, I had to get a little creative. His lips twitched. Oh, yes, he definitely underestimated her. Well, you get full marks for creativity. Thank you. What room are you in? Oh, I'm not staying there. He stopped smiling. You're not? She laughed. You guys are far more adventurous than I am. I'm happy with the plain old regular places. Where are you? He was torn between laughing and throttling her. At this luxurious little B&B &B I found. I can't believe how beautiful it is here. Amazing what hidden gems you can find when you look hard enough. Okay. He'd expected her to pull something, but putting them up in some shithole while she was in the lap of luxury, he wasn't sure if he should fire her or give her a raise for sheer size of her balls. The views are incredible. Oh, Kirsten, sorry, Mr. Harrington, I've got to run. My masseuse is here. Have a great time. She hung up on him before he could say another word. He stared open-mouthed at the phone for a minute. Then just as he lifted his finger to dial her back, his phone buzzed in his hand, a text from Kirsten. Gotcha. There should be a limo waiting out front to take you to a lot a few blocks up from where your helicopter is on standby to take you to your real destination. I will meet you there. Cole breathed a sigh of relief and went out to tell the guys the good news. He shot back a text. That is excellent to hear. You had me worried. She sent back a smiley face. That was a first. Followed by, No worries. I went through a lot of trouble to find you the most pristine accommodations available. It is a bit simpler than you are used to, but in a truly beautiful location. And I cleared the flight with a physician. The helicopter won't ascend high enough that it should bother Mr. Lachlan's ear. 
that sounded more like the efficient assistant he knew and low appreciated, though he'd feel better if she released a few more details. He texted back, Where exactly is this place? He waited a moment, and then a few more. She didn't respond. He turned on his heel and marched from the room to tell the boys they were leaving. He had a few words to say to his assistant when he finally caught up with her. Chapter 18 The helicopter touched down, sending Kirsten's stomach into a mass of writhing anxiety and excitement. She had quite the weekend planned for these boys— she only wished she'd started another pool for how long it would take them to revolt. The door to the helicopter opened, and four very confused billionaires climbed out and looked around at the beautiful farmland surrounded by small, rolling hills in which they'd just been deposited. The co-pilot quickly unloaded their bags and climbed back inside. The helicopter lifted off again less than three minutes after landing. Cole's gaze caught hers and held. He marched over, and Kirsten sucked in a breath. Showtime. How was your trip? Comfortable, I hope, she said, acting as though it was every day that one of the masters of the technological world was dropped into Amish country for a rollicking holiday. Kirsten, where the hell are we? He said, those gray eyes of his boring down into hers like molten steel. You might want to watch your language around here, she said. Your hosts probably wouldn't approve. What hosts? The crease in his brow deepened. If she drew it out any longer, that vein that popped out when he was angry would probably burst. Let's go inside and I'll show you around. She tried to turn to go, but Cole caught her arm and drew her into him. He leaned down so he could speak quietly, and she had to resist the urge to cuddle into him. Her nights had been plagued with dreams of him ever since that kiss. Very realistic, erotic dreams. Dreams that had her waking every morning, lips tingling, panties soaked, and every inch of her craving his touch. She needed to get away from this man, for her own sanity, if for no other reason. Kirsten, he said again, pulling her even closer, until she rested against his chest. A fine tremor ran through her that she prayed he couldn't feel. Explain. Now. She glanced up at him. You said you wanted different. I found you different. Now we really should get you settled. Before he could say anything else, a horse-drawn buggy carrying an Amish family rolled down the lane in front of the cottage. Cole watched it pass by in silence, then looked back at her, his eyes wide. Kirsten? She pulled from his grip and headed toward the cottage. Chris, Harrison, and Brooks were staring at their surroundings, similarly dumbstruck. She would pay a large chunk of her money if Izzy and Cass could have been there to see the looks on their faces as they realized they were indeed smack dab in the middle of Amish country. The men followed her into the cottage, and the silence as they took in their surroundings was priceless. So, this is the sitting room, and you can see the kitchen through there. She pointed to a room off to the left. The bathroom and bedrooms are down the hall. Wait, I'm sorry, Brooks said, raising his hand like a kid in school. Did you say bathroom? Singular? Kirsten bit her lip to keep from smiling. Yes, there's just the one, but there is running water. All four men stared at her, mouths slightly open. Was there a doubt about whether there'd be water? Harrison asked. Well, we are on a genuine Amish farm. There aren't many of these rentals around, so we were lucky to find one that was available this weekend. And the whole point is an authentic experience. But I did think you might want the plumbing. Though there's an outhouse if you'd like to try that out. However, there's no electricity. 
All four men protested at once. Kirsten clapped a hand over her mouth to keep from full-out grinning. She'd known that wouldn't go down well. In fact, there had been another cottage for rent that did have electricity. But where was the fun in that? Gentlemen, she said, raising her voice to get their attention. When they'd stopped bitching and looked at her, she continued. You all wanted something different, a new experience. Well, you got what you asked for. I know this might not be the level of pampering you're used to, but you aren't in a tent in the woods. You're in a comfortable cottage with running water and cushy beds covered in quilts that people pay thousands for. I think you'll survive. They looked at her with varying expressions of bewilderment, surprise, maybe a smidge of amusement, and after her admonishment, a bit of bucking up. Excellent. Time for these pampered princes to do a few things for themselves for a change. It would do them good. Now, she said, glancing at them all in turn to make sure they weren't going to interrupt again, there are only two bedrooms, two full beds in each. Again, she said, holding up a hand to stave off protests, you'll survive, I promise. The family who owns the farm will bring you meals today and tomorrow, not on Sunday. The helicopter will be here at 11 Sunday morning to pick you up, so if you'd like something to eat before you leave, you are welcome to gather some eggs from the hen house, and there will be bread and fruit and vegetables and some baked goods left over that you can eat also. Is there anything else we need to know? Cole asked, staring down at her with an intensity that made her want to squirm. Now came the fun part. Or maybe dangerous with the way Cole was smoldering down at her. It could go either way. Everything you need for your game has been set up in the sitting room. The Amish don't approve of gambling, of course, but you have complete privacy here. As long as you don't go on any drunken forays about the village, I'm sure you'll be fine. And? Cole said. Um, yes, well, like I said, this is a genuine working farm. Cole raised an eyebrow. Yes? She straightened her back. She'd specifically chosen this place for all the wonderful opportunities it afforded, Opportunities that absolutely had to get her fired. Cole had stepped up his game with the whole foisting his mother off on her thing, though luckily for her that had backfired spectacularly, as Harry had turned out to be a fabulous broad. So she'd stepped it up, too. This was supposed to be the fun part. A little hard to remember with a glowering Cole staring down, though. She squared her shoulders. Time to jump all in. The cottages actually weren't for rent when I checked on them, as the owners were going to be busy building a new schoolhouse. But I thought this place would be so perfect. You know, a type of adventure you haven't experienced before. So I doubled the usual asking price for the cottage and volunteered you all to help with the building raising. She was sure she heard their jaws hit the floor. It'll only take a few hours, she said, and then the rest of the weekend is yours, though... There's more? Brooks asked. Kirsten risked a glance back at the other three men, who all stood with mixed expressions of horror and amusement. The amusement seemed to be aimed at Cole. It's not a big deal, but guests typically come here for an authentic experience, so they are encouraged to help out with the chores. Chores? Harrison asked, his soft, posh British accent highlighting the fact that he'd probably never done a chore in his life. Nothing big, really. I mean, you won't be scrubbing toilets or anything. Just helping out around the farm, milking cows, feeding the pigs, that kind of thing. Cole took a step toward her. She took a step back. I thought it might be fun for you. Give you a new life experience. Get out and get some fresh air in between games. Commune with nature. Get back to your roots. Learn about a new culture. Are you done? Cole asked. Yes? Her voice almost squeaked when it came out. Boys, 
I'd like a moment alone with my assistant, Cole said, not taking his eyes from her. Where should we go? Chris said, looking around the small place. I don't care. Go find a cow that needs milking. Cole stepped toward her and she stepped back, right up against the wall. Let's go check out the yard, Brooks said, opening the door to herd the other men out. Don't kill her, he said, clapping Cole on the shoulder. They'd probably make us clean up the mess. Kirsten's jaw dropped, but Brooks just winked at her and went out, closing the door behind him. Bravo, Cole said, closing the remaining distance between them. I definitely underestimated you. Kirsten gave him what she hoped was an innocent expression. I don't know what you mean. Oh, yes, you do. You are one of the most intelligent people I've ever met. You never do anything without knowing exactly what you're doing, and you execute every task you undertake to perfection. Wow, didn't know you thought so highly of me. If I didn't, I'd have fired you a long time ago. She really wanted to ask him what the hell she had to do to get fired now, but it's not like he'd tell her. This was a war. You didn't give your enemy the blueprints to your strategy. You didn't give me many options, but I still gave you everything you asked for. He brought his arms up, caging her in. Did you? He leaned in a hair, and her breath caught in her throat. And where will you be staying? You said there were only two bedrooms, two beds in each. Are you sleeping on the sofa? No, at a B&B &B down the road. Cole frowned. That won't do. I said I wanted you with me. She swallowed hard, trying to force her lungs to work. Cole, as his normal self, was imposing. Cole, with his king-of-the-world persona full strength, was overwhelming. You said you wanted me on hand. I'll be here for the important stuff, just a few minutes away. You don't really want me hanging around all weekend. Don't I? She tilted her head up to meet his gaze and noticed how close his lips were. She could still feel them moving over hers. Still craved the electricity shooting through her at his touch. The fact that this exasperating ass of a man had the power to turn her into a quivering, panting bundle of need with a mere look had to be the single most aggravating thing that had ever happened happened to her. He leaned closer. She didn't turn away. She should. She should push him from her and get far, far away as fast as possible. But she didn't. She couldn't have made her body move if the damn cottage had been on fire. I thought this was against the rules, she said, her voice catching in her throat. When it comes to you, I don't seem to care about the rules. His lips brushed across hers, and she forgot how to breathe. He cupped her cheek, his mouth moving over hers again. Her brain insisted she pull away. Her body told it to shut the hell up. She rose on her toes to deepen the kiss, fully aware she was being a complete idiot and not caring in the slightest. She'd care later. Right now, she wanted to be devoured. A knock at the window right beside them had Kirsten jerking back with a gasp, her heart pounding. Cole, however, remained cool as ever. His hand still cupping her face, he merely turned his head toward the window. Brooks stood there, beaming at them. Kirsten's cheeks burned. She pulled away from Cole as Brooks came through the door. Sorry to interrupt he said, his grin widening. What do you want? Cole asked. Brooks's grin faded a bit. There are some buggies here and a nice man in a hat who said he's supposed to drive us to the school. Tell them we aren't going. No, wait, you can't do that, Kirsten said. Cole frowned at her. Why not? She resisted the eye roll. 
Really, that man needed to be told no more often. Because the whole story has already been leaked to the press. What? This time there was no amusement in his voice. Why? For one, because you're the one who was so fond of free press, but mostly because I knew if the whole world was watching, you couldn't bail. Brooks laughed. She's got you there. Cole glared at him and Brooks shrugged. Well, she does. It'll be tasteful, Kirsten said. I only invited one reporter who had to sign a contract stating he wouldn't take or print pictures of the Amish themselves, just you boys in the building, and we get full approval before the story runs, so I can make sure it's respectful. I have no desire to exploit our hosts. Harrison poked his head in the door, his face contorted in disgusted confusion. I just stepped in horse dung. Kirsten bit her lip. There are changes of clothes for each of you in your rooms, including work boots. I'd suggest changing. And quickly. Cole flashed her another look. This isn't over. You and I still have a few things to discuss. I bet, Brooks said with a snort. Kirsten and Cole gave him twin glares and he choked off a laugh. I'll, um, just go get changed. Escaping sounded good to Kirsten, too. I'll wait outside, she said, darting out the door before Cole could stop her, the promise of further talking ringing through her head. After what had just happened, being alone with him was something she really needed to avoid. What the hell did she have to do? She dropped his ass in the middle of Amish country for his legendary poker retreat, and instead of firing her on the spot, he'd kissed her? She'd thought this would be so easy, but it seemed the worse she behaved, the more she tried to push his buttons, the more things heated up between them. Well, he had a hard day of labor ahead of him, and she'd made sure he'd have a very early morning. We'll just see how he's feeling come tomorrow morning, she thought with a growing smile. Surely even Cole Harrington had his limits, and she was about to test them. Chapter 19 Cole rolled over and tried to glare at the rooster that was crowing outside his window. He'd never ached so badly in his life. He'd always been athletic, played soccer and football in high school, hit the weight room regularly. In fact, up until the moment he'd picked up that hammer, he'd thought he'd been in good shape. Then he'd hammered, carried lumber, sawed, raised walls, and tried his hand, badly, at roofing. They'd all been so tired by the time they were dropped off at their cottage that they'd been falling asleep in their candlelit supper. They hadn't even discussed playing a few hands of poker. He'd managed a shower and then had dropped right into bed. And now some scraggly chicken was crowing outside his window at the ass crack of dawn. He'd never been interested in hunting. But if he had a shotgun or, hell, even a bow and arrow, he'd happily turn the thing into their next dinner. He rolled over and grabbed his phone, fully intent on calling Kirsten over to chase it away. If he had to be up and suffering, he saw no reason not to share the pain, seeing as how she was the one responsible for it all anyway. Except his phone was dead, and the cottage wasn't wired for electricity, so he couldn't charge it. He threw his arm over his head and groaned. The rooster shut up long enough that he'd almost drifted back to sleep when a knock on the front door jolted him awake again. He ignored it. Whoever it was could go the hell away. Instead of going away, the door opened and Kirsten's voice floated to him from the entryway. Good morning. Cole, Brooks grunted. No offense, but I'm going to kill your assistant. Cole snorted. I'll help you bury the body. Kirsten poked her head in the bedroom. Good morning, boys. I know it's early, but if you want breakfast, we need to gather the eggs and help out with the animals. Kirsten, 
Cole said. I mean this in the most professional way possible. But if you don't get out of here, I'm going to put you over my knee and spank the perkiness right out of you. I'll hold her down for you, Brooks chimed in from under his mound of blankets. Kirsten laughed. Oh, come on, boys, it's not so bad. I've got coffee. Those might have been the only words in the world that would have gotten him out of that bed. Well, that and maybe, I'm naked, come get me. But since that possibility was slim, he'd have to settle for the coffee. He sighed, hauled himself up, and yanked on a pair of loose sweatpants. Don't do it, Brooks said. It's a trap. Cole just grunted. Do you think she's going to give up? Brooks moaned again. No, the woman is relentless. He rolled over and pulled the quilts up to his ears. Do us all a favor and go fall on the perky grenade for us, okay? Cole stood, stretched, and then reached under Brooks's mattress, efficiently flipping his friend to the floor. Then he walked out the door. The sound of Brooks's curses filling his ears. He walked into the kitchen and stopped short. Kirsten stood framed in the window, the soft glow of candlelight behind her and the faint light of the pre-morning sun highlighting her features. His heart thumped almost painfully in his chest. He'd never seen anyone so breathtakingly beautiful in his life. For a moment, he wished circumstances were different. But he was well aware he had trust issues, and with Kirsten, it was doubly challenging. She made no secret of the fact that she hated him. Hell, she'd spent the last couple of weeks purposely torturing him, apparently just for the fun of it. She was attracted to him, sure. That she couldn't hide, even though there was no doubt she wanted to. But that was just sex. You could want someone you loathed. Love? That was something else completely. She turned and noticed him standing there, and the smile she gave him nearly knocked him to his knees. If he could see that smile every morning for the rest of his life, he'd live and die a happy man. He gave himself a mental kick in the nuts. She was off limits for a whole variety of reasons. Employee probably a soon-to-be former one, possibly disgruntled. Social disparity, snobbish and completely detestable, he agreed, but it was what it was. Someone with money was a lot less likely to screw him over just to get paid, and the minor detail of her lukewarm-at-best feelings for him on a personal level. Kind of hard to wiggle around that one. That smile, though... Would she be smiling like that at someone she hated? He shook his head. He could play this game all day, and for once, he wasn't sure if he'd win. Better to stop while he could pretend he was ahead. She handed him a brimming cup of coffee, hot enough to still be good, but cool enough he could down it quickly. Apparently, she didn't want to waste any time this morning. Are the others coming? She asked. He peeked in at Chris and Harrison, who were both dead to the world, and Brooks was snoring under his pile of blankets on the floor. She went into the kitchen and retrieved a cooking pot and a big wooden spoon. Plug your ears, she said, holding them up with a wicked grin. He laughed. Oh, please, let me. She handed him the pot and spoon and wedged her fingers in her ears. Cole grinned and started banging. He'd never seen the guys move so fast in their lives. I might have to keep that handy, he said, handing it back to her. She laughed and helped to get them all coffeed up and herded outside. Chris and Harrison she set to gathering eggs, led by a pair of adorable kids whose parents owned the property. Brooks disappeared to do something with cows that Cole really didn't want to know about. The last time he saw him, Brooks was sitting looking at the business end of a cow, full udders swinging in his face. Cole had been led to the pigsty. 
Ignoring the muddy mass of writhing pink flesh that was waiting for the slop he held, he glanced around the farm. He had to admit, the view was incredible. Just the sort of place his sister would have loved. Piper had always been happiest outdoors. Hiking, camping, boating. If it was in the fresh air, she wanted to be doing it. He stared at the lush, rolling hills and the sparkling water of the farm's pond reflecting the rising sun, and swallowed past a lump that rose in his throat at the thought of his sister never again seeing something so beautiful. But he took a small comfort in the project he named for her. He'd found the most beautiful property he could on which to build her legacy, a place she would have chosen if given the opportunity. He hadn't been able to help her, but maybe he could help others in her name. Mr. Harrington? He looked up. Kirsten sat on a nearby fence, her face creased in concern. Are you all right? He forced back the memories of his sister and nodded at the pigsty. Just trying to decide how badly I want breakfast. She laughed and folded her arms, raised eyebrows daring him to go for it. He knew theoretically what was supposed to happen. Put food in the trough, pigs eat food. Stay out of said pig's way. Plus, he was supposed to spread a little around one area of the pen the farmer had pointed out so the pigs could root around. Seemed easy enough. He picked up a bucket of feed and leaned over the fence, pouring it smoothly into the trough. Not so tough. He picked up a second bucket filled with leftover food items, crusts of bread, vegetable peelings, and the like. He leaned over to dump that one as well. However, the pigs, alerted to the presence of food, had made a run for the trough, bumping into the fence here and there as they went. One massive sow charged right at him, knocking the bucket from his hand. It fell to its side, behind the trough. Kirsten jumped down from the fence and hurried over. You've got to get it. They'll trample each other trying to get at it. Tell me something I don't know, he said, already on his knees, reaching through the fence. It was wedged in, but if he shimmied down a little farther, not an easy task as the ground around the sty was soggy and muddy, he could get his arm around the fence post and grab the handle, once he had a hold of it, he reached through the fence slats one at a time, handing the bucket up to himself each time until it was high enough he could reach over the top of the fence and grab the handle. Mr. Harrington, Kirsten called. He climbed on the fence and again leaned over to dump the bucket. I got it. No, Mr. Harrington, she said more insistently. He glanced up right as the large sow charged at the fence. Shit, he muttered. He dumped the rest of the slops, not worrying about whether they were evenly distributed, but she was almost on him. He jumped backward just as she crashed into the fence, and he landed on his back right in the middle of a mud puddle. He lay there for a moment contemplating the peaceful serenity of the morning sky and of his life before Kirsten had decided to wage war. With the muck oozing into his nether regions, he had to admit this battle went to her. Touché. And speak of the devil. Kirsten's face appeared above him, her mask of concern more than a little tinged with amusement. You okay down there? He blinked. I've been better. Need help up? She held out her hand. Well, wasn't she a trusting little soul? Sure. He reached out, grabbed her hand, and pulled her right into the mud with him. She shrieked and scrambled to get away, but only succeeded in slipping farther. He laughed, grabbing her around the waist and hauling her back. She came back to him all right with a fistful of mud she casually smeared all over his face. Much better, she said, cocking her head to look at him. Now the left side matches the right. 
and you don't match at all. No, 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 she said, holding her hands out with a laugh. He wrapped his arms around her waist and rolled, rubbing himself all over her until she was as covered as he was, and they were both breathless with laughter. They subsided for a moment, seeming to realize at the same time the interesting position they'd gotten themselves in. Cole sat in the mud, Kirsten straddling him, her hands on his chest for support, while he still held her waist. He stared into those warm, mahogany eyes of hers, the faint scent of her magnolia perfume still present, even through the muck. She didn't move away from him, didn't say a word, just sat on his lap, dragging in lungfuls of air and watching him the way he watched her. He leaned forward, going slowly so she could stop him at any time. Her hands tightened in his shirt not dragging him forward, but not stopping him either. He was so intent on the woman in his arms, he didn't hear anyone approaching until it was much too late. The bucket of cold water hit them square in the face. Kirsten flailed backward, swatting at it like it was a swarm of bees, which, of course, did her no good. Cole sputtered and choked then glared up at the trio of men staring down at them. Before he could talk, Brooks held up a finger, his expression keeping Cole silent more than any hand gesture. Kirsten blinked through the water dripping down her face and frowned. What happened to you? Brooks glanced over at her from under a mop of soaking wet hair. His shirt was also drenched with trails reaching down to his jeans. It peed on me, he said. Kirsten's hand tightened in Cole's shirt again. His gaze flickered to her, and from what he could tell from her expression, it was all she could do to keep from bursting out laughing. He knew the feeling. Harrison held up a hand that had been wrapped in a bandage. I got pecked. This time, Kirsten bit her lip. She did manage to say, Oh, you poor thing. Did you get the eggs at least? Harrison's face actually cleared with a proud smile. I did. Six of them. Excellent, Kirsten said, pushing herself off coal and carefully maneuvering until she was on more solid ground. And you? She asked Christopher, who was holding a baby goat and looking at them all like they'd escaped from an asylum somewhere. He shrugged. I did great. Found eight eggs. And this little guy. He held up the baby who bleated at him. He set the kid down and glanced back over at Brooks. No pecks. Maybe you got the crotchety ones. Harrison's eyes narrowed. Lucky me. If you'll excuse me. Brooks said, dropping his bucket. I'm going to go take a shower now. Kirsten's gaze returned to Cole, her eyes roving over the t-shirt now suckered to his chest, with a heat in her eyes he'd only seen glimpses of before. Interesting. She quickly looked away. I'll get breakfast started. She headed back to the cottage, stopping at a rain barrel near the door to clean up the worst of it first. Cole just needed a minute alone. He and Kirsten had been having too many moments of late. He was supposed to be trying to get her to quit, not trying to get her into bed. It seemed his brain had different plans than the rest of his body. Well, his brain needed to get shit under control. Kirsten wasn't a one-and-done type of girl. A relationship with her would be a disaster. He'd never know for sure if he could trust her. If she was just with him out of some crazy revenge scheme, hanging in there as long as she could until she could hit payday, or if she genuinely cared. With her being his employee on some crazy vendetta, his normal trust issues were amped up beyond his power to control them. He needed to get a grip and a nice cold shower because the feel of her slippery body writhing on him was one he wouldn't forget for a long time. 
Chapter 20 Kirsten turned the tap, cutting off the hot water streaming into the giant clawfoot tub in her room, soothing aromatherapy oils and soft music permeated the room, the salts in the water pleasantly fizzing and waiting for her to soak. She'd taken a quick shower to get the dirt off her. She loved baths, but had never been fond of stewing in her own filth. Baths were more for relaxing than getting clean. She went into the bathroom to get a hair tie and picked up the papers she'd been going through— their lawyer had sent over the final documents they needed to have everything in place before they claimed their money and had all those millions transferred into the waiting accounts. It was surreal, beyond surreal. She could stay in a place like this every night for the rest of her life. Hell, she could buy a dozen places just like it and live in them forever. The possibilities that were now open to her toasted her mind into a little crispy nugget she couldn't even process yet, and it was all just a week away. Her mind shifted to Cole, as it often did. She wished she had hidden some nanny cams somewhere so she could have captured the look on their faces when they'd been dropped in the middle of Amish country and seen their poker paradise. That had been a priceless hallmark moment right there. A total shame she couldn't share it. She signed the papers and set them on the table. She'd give them to Cass and Izzy to sign when she got back in town, and they'd be in business. In the meantime, she was going to get her relaxation on. Trying to get fired was stressful work. Speaking of which, she was going to drop the whole thing and simply quit— Trying to get Cole to do anything he didn't want to do was an exercise in futility. For some reason, he didn't seem inclined to can her ass. She was ready to admit defeat before any more crazy moments happened between them. Too many lines were getting fuzzy. Time to bail while she still had some sanity left. She dropped her robe and went back into the bathroom, slipping into the water with a sigh. She quickly whipped up some breakfast for the boys before heading back to her own accommodations. Making sure the eggs were exactly as Cole liked them, of course. Orange juice, no pulp. Toast, extra butter. Coffee, sickly sweet. Everything perfect for him. Making his life perfect was exhausting. She couldn't imagine doing it for the rest of her life. Luckily, Cole had taken his sweet time, so she'd been able to get out of there before he'd come out of the bathroom. She wasn't ready to see him again just yet. And for once, she didn't have to worry about him calling her. With no electricity, his phone had to be dead by now, and he was a long way away from his backups. While she didn't like to give Cole the satisfaction of winning, she was beginning to think he'd never fire her. Who knew why? Maybe he hated losing. Or maybe he truly wasn't bothered by the stuff she was doing. If that was the case, she wished she'd known about it a lot sooner. It would have saved her a great deal of time stressing out over pissing him off. The reason why was probably irrelevant. The fact of the matter was that he still hadn't fired her, despite her best efforts. She really didn't know what else she could do— if taking his mother to a strip bar and getting her drunk and arrested hadn't done it, not to mention dropping him and his friends in the middle of a literal pigsty, she didn't know what would. There was a knock on the door. She slumped farther into the water and ignored it. It would take more than a knock to get her ass out of that water. Within a few seconds, the knock sounded again, and then again. Oh my God, come in already, she yelled. She hadn't locked the door. Middle of nowhere Pennsylvania had seemed safe enough. It was probably the innkeeper with more towels or something. She sighed and laid her head back. The edge of the clawfoot tub was high enough that whoever it was wouldn't be able to see anything as long as they didn't get too close. It never failed. Just as she was about to relax, something always came up to ruin it. 
usually something coal-related. She only wanted five minutes where she could empty her mind, focus on herself for once. This was exactly why she didn't take baths often. She could never relax enough for them to do much good. It was the whole shutting off her mind thing. She had friends who would fall asleep almost as soon as they hit the water. Not her. Usually she laid there with a million things running through her mind. Today, though, she was bound and determined to enjoy herself. Cole was down the road at his Amish paradise. She had no illusions about him staying there after the night and morning he'd had. In fact, she wouldn't be surprised if he hijacked a buggy to take him to a phone so he could order the helicopter back for an emergency pickup. He was probably already in some five-star suite, purelling the shit out of his hands. Literally. She snorted. Something amusing. She screamed, her eyes flying open as she sat up, trying to cover everything relevant with her hands. What the hell are you doing here? She asked, glaring at Cole. He leaned against the doorframe of the bathroom, and his eyes devoured her. Enjoying the view, he said with that wicked little grin of his. Well, maybe I'm too slow to grasp it then, so you can enlighten me. But shouldn't you be at your poker table about now? What? The one you had set up down at Amish Central? Sorry, we weren't really in the mood to play after all the barnyard experiences. The boys ate their breakfast and went right back to bed. His eyes raked over her, and she trembled under his gaze. He took a step closer, and she forced herself to speak. So the accommodations weren't to your liking? His lips pulled into a half-smile. Are you surprised by that? She returned his smile. Well, you did say you wanted something new and different. And with your vast experience, like I said on the phone, I had to think outside the box a bit. Turn around, please. He raised an eyebrow but did as she asked. Her robe was out in the bedroom, but the towels were large and fluffy, and he'd seen her in less or at least more revealing clothing, which should seriously bother her. Unfortunately, all it did was send a rush of heat southward so fast it made her head spin. She got out and wrapped the towel around her as quickly as she could. How did you get here? she asked him. He nodded to the window, and she ventured into his territory to look out. A horse stood tethered to a post in the front contentedly nibbling on the fresh grass. You stole a horse? Rented, for a generous fee. Horse riding lessons as a kid, too? He shook his head. Polo. Three years ago. It didn't go well. Did okay with the horse part, though. She dropped onto the chaise long that sat in front of the fireplace. What are you doing here? He stepped closer. Close enough, he pressed against her legs. He shifted slightly, nudging her thighs apart. Her mouth dropped open in a silent gasp, but she let him in, though she kept the towel firmly clutched to her chest. He lightly trailed his hands up her arms, and she shivered. Why are you trying so hard to get fired? Her gaze shot to his. Why are you trying so hard to get me to quit? He gave her a slow, burning smile that had little sparks of heat shooting off all over her body. He dodged that question as effectively as she did. You've been impressively creative. I'll give you that. Normally, I'd say I love a little ingenuity. His hands traveled over her shoulders, skimming the column of her neck. She tilted her head up both to keep her gaze locked on his and to allow him access to her mouth. Should he want it, which it seemed he did, his fingers slipped into her hair, tightening ever so slightly. He leaned in, so close, hovering. Then he paused and sighed. He released her and stepped back, ramming his hand through his hair. But 
he said from where he'd trailed off. Maybe this was a bit too much originality. His rejection stung. She knew it shouldn't. He was being smart. She was sitting there completely naked beneath a towel, glistening wet and well-primed thanks to a few too many close moments over the last few weeks. If he kissed her now, it wouldn't stop at that. And neither of them wanted that to happen. Right? It would be a disaster. Even with their work relationship dissolved, it would never work. She didn't even know how to be with him without work as a buffer. Still, it hurt that he could turn away from her so easily when she was sitting there so tightly wound up with the want of him that she was about ready to spontaneously combust right there on the spot. And this, whatever has been happening between us, has that been part of the game? Just another way to mess with me? She asked, not wanting to meet his gaze. I could ask you the same question. She did meet his gaze at that and gave him a faint smile. I asked you first. A total cop-out. But it worked. No backsies. He stared at her long enough she wasn't sure he'd answer. No, I wasn't just messing with you but acting on whatever this is wouldn't be the wisest course of action. We're too different, I think. You certainly aren't anything like the type of women I usually date. She completely agreed, but somehow it still hurt being on the receiving end of that statement. She stood and tightened her grip on the towel. I get it. It's fun to talk about a little adventure, but you draw the line at slumming it. Good to know. She turned to walk away, but he was in front of her before she'd taken two steps. Is that how you think I think of you? Of anything happening between us? You think I'd consider it slumming? He shook his head, both anger and sadness in his eyes, and closed the distance between them. I'm not sure if I should yell at you for thinking so little of me and yourself that you'd accuse me of that or... Or what? She asked, glaring up at him. He grasped the back of her neck and hauled her to him. She was too startled to protest, and the second their lips met, she had no desire to fight it. He kept one hand threaded in her hair and used the other to press her against him, keeping her captive against his body. She melted into him. She was so done fighting him, fighting herself. She craved this since the first moment she'd walked into his office and saw him sweating it out on his treadmill. True, his personality had gotten in the way for a bit, but then again, so had hers. It was a miracle they hadn't killed each other yet. You aren't like the women I date, he said, kissing her again. You're real. You matter. You aren't someone I can sleep with and walk away from. He angled his head for a deeper kiss, and she groaned, holding on to him just to keep her legs from giving out beneath her. It might be a mistake. It would definitely change things. Then again, everything was going to change anyway. And who knew? A relationship with Cole might not be as disastrous as she feared. He was a good man. Aggravating, arrogant maybe, but at the end of the day, good. Even if he didn't like to show people that side of himself, there wasn't much he hid from her. He suddenly stopped and pulled away. I'm sorry. I didn't mean. Cole? She said. His eyes widened at her use of his first name. She smiled and let go of the towel she held. The towel dropped in a pool at her feet and Cole's heart tried to punch through his chest. Fucking hell. He'd never seen anyone so beautiful in his life. She stepped closer to him, slowly, like she was afraid she'd spook him if she moved too quickly. He lasted exactly two and a half seconds before he had her in his arms again. He picked her up and carried her back to the chaise, dropping to his knees in front of her. She pulled at his clothing, and they broke apart long enough for him to rip his shirt off. 
They kept their lips fused together while she undid the button of his jeans and yanked them down. Her hands slipped inside, and he jumped. Kirsten. Shh, she said, trailing kisses across his chest. Stop talking. He wanted to, but he knew he shouldn't, for both their sakes. He wasn't good for her. He wasn't good for anyone. He didn't know how to be in a relationship. And what would their relationship even be? She was his assistant, for the moment anyway. Maybe he should fire her so they could figure out what they really wanted to be to each other. Then again, how the hell could he fire her now? Not that he wanted to fire her at all. But he certainly couldn't keep treating her as a mere assistant after this weekend. He should stop this at least until they talked things out, though it was probably already too late for that, unless she said no. He didn't have the strength to put the brakes on for anything else. He wanted her so badly his body nearly vibrated with it. She smiled up at him and his heart jumped, and that was his answer right there. This strong, beautiful, amazing woman was worth whatever consequences would ensue more than worth whatever price he had to pay. Her hand slipped lower, and the decision was out of his hands, literally. Kirsten, he said. Cole, shut up and kiss me already. He smiled down at her. Yes, ma'am. Neither of them were drunk. They were both responsible adults and perfectly capable of making a rational decision, it might be the stupidest thing they'd ever end up doing, but at that exact moment in time, he really didn't care. He leaned into her and groaned, then wrapped his hand in her hair and pulled enough to raise her face for his kiss. She opened beneath him, inviting him in, her lips and tongue moving frantically with his own. He broke away long enough to ask, Bed? A quickie on the chaise didn't seem good enough for her, not for their first time. But he honestly didn't know if he could make it across the room to the plush bed behind the doors. Next time, she said. She hauled him back to her and wrapped her legs around him, which put him dangerously close to the edge. He had just enough presence of mind left to ask. Condom? She groaned, jumped up, grabbed her purse from the table near the couch and upended it. He stripped his shoes, socks, and pants the rest of the way off. When she turned with a box of condoms in her hand, he stood there, waiting and more than ready. She tossed him the condoms and came back, slowly. He opened the box and grabbed a packet, tearing it open and rolling it on while keeping his eyes glued to the incredibly gorgeous woman sauntering toward him. She got to him and looked him up and down. Then she put her hands on his chest and drew them down, lightly raking him with her nails from his neck to the tops of his thighs. The tenuous hold he had on his control snapped, and he grabbed her arms, draped them around his neck. He picked her up, and she wrapped her legs around him. The heat of her core pressed against him. He backed her up against the nearest wall, his mind a haze of emotion and desire. He sank into her, his lips covering hers. With the first thrust, his world shattered. He stared into her eyes and thrust again. She gasped and clung to him, but her eyes never wavered, never left his. Every pulse, every heartbeat, every breath they shared. He'd been so worried about how she'd feel, react. He should have been worried about himself. Somehow she'd found a way past all his defenses battered through them steadfastly and quietly until there was nothing left, nothing but her. He was hers, whether she wanted him or not. No one else would ever compare. 
she was home for him. He could feel her beginning to pulse and shudder around him. He held on tighter, thrust deeper, and when her eyes began to flutter closed, he changed his tempo harder, faster, until she cried out and tensed in his arms. Only then did he find his own release, burying himself in her so deeply he was lost, body and soul. They kept still for a moment, relearning how to breathe. He kissed her once more. Then he moved away from the wall, keeping her in his arms as he moved to the bed. He laid her down and climbed in beside her, pulling her against his side, breathing her in. How in the world had they gotten to this place? When had it happened? The moment she defied him for the first time? Or even earlier? From the moment she'd walked into his office, that sparkle in her eye that she couldn't hide even when she wanted to? How did I come here to chew you out for the barnyard experience and end up in your bed? She laughed, a husky, well-loved chuckle that had him ready for round two. You can't blame me for that, she said. Had I known you were coming, I'd have made sure I had clothes on. You seem to have a real knack for showing up when I'm naked. Hmm. He brushed her hair out of her face and kissed her softly. Maybe I have built-in radar. I wouldn't doubt it. Sounds like something you'd come up with. Actually, she said, her forehead creasing, it's probably something Mr. Larson would come up with. Cole laughed at that. You're probably right, although I'd rather not think of him at this particular moment. Did you leave them back at the cottage? Yes. She laughed. I'm surprised they aren't beating down our door yet. Cole sighed and rolled onto his back, bringing her with him so she lay snuggled up to his chest. I doubt they'll wake up until early next week. I'm sure they'll track you down eventually. I rented out this whole place, by the way. I didn't really plan on torturing you for the whole trip. Maybe I don't want them to find me. Kirsten leaned up on her elbow. You mean that? Surprisingly, yes, he did. He'd like nothing more than to spend the weekend alone with her, preferably in bed. In fact, he sat up. Let's go. She frowned at him. Let's go where? He opened his mouth to tell her what he had in mind, but then shut it again. It's a surprise. Come on, he said, giving her a quick kiss. He climbed out of bed and went to grab his clothes from the front room. Are your things in the closet? He asked, pulling his clothes on. Yes, but why won't you tell me where we're going? I told you I want it to be a surprise. Let me have a little fun, will you? She smiled. Fine. Bring everything, though you won't need much. I don't plan on letting you out of bed for most of the weekend. Her cheeks blushed red at that, though there was nothing shy about the smile she gave. Get packing. I have to make a few phone calls. He stopped short. Do you have a charger? She laughed and pointed to the wall where it was plugged in. He came to the bed and kissed her, then kissed her again. He finally tore himself away with a groan. Pack quickly. He plugged in his phone and started dialing, then looked back up. And don't forget the condoms. Chapter 21 Kirsten tried not to get too tongue-tied when Cole ushered her onto a private plane that was nicer than her apartment. He left her for a moment to talk to the captain, and she took the time to geek out without losing her cool in front of him. It was smaller than any plane she'd ever been in before, which made her a little nervous, but it was really spectacular. Cream-colored, leather-covered large captain's chairs that faced each other in groups of four on one side of the plane. She sat in one of these and buckled up. The other side held a couch that was larger than the one at home. 
While that looked like it might be more comfortable, she wasn't sure how she felt hurtling into the air riding sideways. She liked the secure feeling of the more enclosed seat. A large flat panel television was set into one wall for their in-flight entertainment, she assumed, and all the blonde wooden features and gold fixtures gleamed with polish. Cole came back and sat in the chair beside her. She wasn't going to say anything. Act totally nonchalant. After all, she'd known he had a private jet. He used it every time he had to fly anywhere. She just hadn't had the chance to go on it yet. In the end, though, she couldn't keep it to herself. Okay, this thing is incredible. Cole chuckled. I'm glad you like it. Unfortunately, there's no bedroom like there is on mine. But once we're in the air, we can lay the chairs back and kick the feet up. This isn't your jet? She asked. No, mine is back in New York. This belongs to a friend. He's letting me borrow it for the weekend. Nice friend. When it suits him. Speaking of friends, you think yours are surviving? He laughed again. They'll be fine. The vacation will do them good. The flight attendant came through and made sure they were comfortable and buckled in. We're fine for now, thanks, Cole said. She nodded, going back into the galley and closing the door. Kirsten looked at him, eyebrow raised in question. She won't bother us again unless I ask for her. Before Kirsten knew it, they were taxiing out. Cole leaned over and slipped his hand past the waistband of her skirt. She gasped and grabbed his hand, meaning to pull it away. Instead, she pushed him closer, her eyes fluttering closed when his fingers slipped inside her. He played with her while they picked up momentum. She could feel the speed better in the small plane than she'd been able to on the larger plane she'd ridden on. It was hard to focus on anything other than Cole's fingers caressing her, though. By the time they hit the end of the runway, she was ready to whip off her seatbelt and join him in his seat. The man was a genius with his fingers. The plane launched into the air, the jump pressing her back in the seat. Cole pressed in hard and deep at the exact same moment, and she cried out. He leaned over to capture her lips, his tongue mimicking the movement of his fingers. She nearly sobbed with need for him, grabbing his hand to keep him captive. He grinned against her lips. Come on, baby, come for me. She convulsed against his hand, her face pressed against his neck as she climaxed. Cole pulled a condom out of his pocket and unzipped his pants just enough to free himself and roll it on. Come here, he said, undoing her seatbelt. She didn't hesitate. He pulled her to him, seating her on his lap, with her back to his chest, her legs straddling his. He moved aside her panties and pulled her back until he was seated deep inside her. The plane leveled off with a bump, jolting her back against him. She threw her head back at the sensation, and he held her tight. His hands roamed up and under her shirt, pushing aside her bra so he could massage her aching breasts. She angled her head so she could capture his lips, her arms wrapped around his head to keep him molded to her. Their lips devoured each other as she moved on him, the combination of the plane hurtling through the air while he rocked into her built an excruciatingly amazing pressure she almost couldn't stand. She gripped the armrests and pushed herself back against him as far as she could, riding him until the pressure reached its peak and burst in wave after wave of sheer pleasure. His hands gripped her waist and he drove himself into her over and over again until he tensed beneath her. He pulsed deep inside her, his head resting against her back while they both came down from their high. She laughed, breathless, and looked back at him. Did I just join the Mile High Club? She asked. He grinned at her. I think we both did. You mean that's the first time you've... 
She couldn't quite bring herself to say it, which was probably ridiculous because he was still inside her. Yes, he said, pulling her back so he could kiss her, and it was fucking amazing. He kissed her again. Hell yes, it was. She eased herself off his lap, and he pointed toward the back. There's a bathroom back there if you want. Thanks, she said, heading back to clean up and straighten everything up again. When she came out, Cole was spreading blankets out on the couch. He dropped a pillow at the head and held out his hand. We've got about seven hours in the air. You might as well get some sleep. She sat on the couch and kicked off her shoes. What about you? I've got a little work I need to do. Then I'll kick back in one of the chairs. They fully recline. She frowned. We could both fit on here. He knelt beside her and gave her a soft kiss. Not comfortably. No worries. Once we get to our destination, you won't be able to peel me from your side. For now, I'd rather you be comfortable. He kissed her again and she lay down. The couch was surprisingly comfy, and despite everything that had just happened, or maybe because of it, it wasn't long before her eyes drifted shut. Almost immediately, or at least that's what it felt like, she blinked her eyes in the rising sun. Cole was smiling down at her. We're starting our descent. Time to buckle up again. Oh, wow. She tried to smooth her hair with her hands. Did I sleep the whole time? He chuckled and kissed her forehead. Yes, all that plotting must have been exhausting. She playfully shoved him and stood up to stretch. You've got time to use the bathroom quick if you need to. She nodded and headed back to the ridiculously ornate bathroom. After using the toilet, which had a heated seat, she went through the drawers and found a hairbrush and several unused, still-in-the-package toothbrushes. She freshened up as quickly as she could and went back out to a smiling coal. It was going to take some time to get used to seeing him like that. He seemed lighter, somehow, happy. The thought that she might have had something to do with that warmed her heart. So can I know where we're going now that we're here? You can know part of it. He gestured to the window and Kirsten looked out. She gasped and plopped into her seat, her face almost pressed up against the window. A bustling city sprawled beneath them, and off to the left, the Eiffel Tower sat overlooking it all. We're in Paris? Cole grinned at her. Oui, madame. Though, it's not our final destination, so don't get your heart set on any romps up the tower. He refused to say anything else about their final destination, no matter how much she begged, pleaded, or bribed. When the plane landed, he escorted her into a waiting limo, which took them directly to a helipad. The scenery spread out below them as they flew over the French countryside, took her breath away. Then, in the distance, a literal, honest-to-goodness castle appeared nestled among some rolling hills, right on the banks of a small river. She grabbed Cole's arm. Is that where we're going? He picked up her hand and kissed it. Do you like it? Like it? She had to blink back the tears that threatened. Okay, don't mock me. But with last night and then on the plane, and now you're taking me to a real life fairy tale castle, I just. I know it sounds stupid, but I feel like a princess. His smile widened, and he leaned forward to kiss her. Good, he said, kissing her again. That's exactly what I was going for. Her heart nearly beat from her chest when the helicopter landed, and Cole led her up the manicured lawns and through the ancient doors into the castle itself, or chateau, she supposed it was called. It was as if she'd stepped back in time. He took her on a quick tour through the great hall where she could absolutely imagine a duke holding court for all his vassals, through drawing rooms filled with tapestries and suits of armor, 
past a library that was straight out of Beauty and the Beast and made her want to cry all over again, and finally up the grand staircase and into a suite that was fit for a queen. The massive four-poster wooden bed was carved with roses and cherubs and covered in luxurious down comforters and pillows. A fire crackled in the ancient stone fireplace, and the iron-paned windows looked out over the river and gardens into a fairy tale wonderland. Cole came to stand behind her, wrapping his arms around her waist. She leaned back against him. Thank you for bringing me here. She turned so she could wrap her arms around him. This place is amazing, beautiful. I can't believe it's real. He cupped her cheek. I could say the same about you. She looked into those storm-gray eyes of his, so overwhelmed with the crash of emotions within her she couldn't speak, so she didn't even try. Instead, she rose on her toes and pressed a kiss against his lips. He wrapped his arms tighter around her, drawing her in closer, and deepened the kiss. This time, there was no hurried frenzy of out-of-control passion, no frantic grasping or animal hormones taking over. There was just the two of them in the peace and quiet of their own little kingdom. He slowly undressed her, worshipping every inch of her body that he uncovered with such heart-rending tenderness that each caress, each kiss, was burned into her memory forever. He stood and let her do the same to him. She took her time, learning every line and plane of his body. He picked her up, cradled her against him, and gently laid her on the bed where he continued to stoke the slow-burning flame within her until her body raged with it. She had so misjudged him. Yes, he was tough, driven. He demanded perfection of everyone around him, but she hadn't noticed before that he demanded the same of himself. And it wasn't because he was a jerk who liked to inflict misery on his employees. It was because he cared so much. She reached out, her body begging for him. And this time when they joined, she knew she was lost. She may have started out on a mission for revenge before she walked away forever, but it had backfired. She'd never be free of him now. Even if she climbed out of that bed and walked away for good, she'd never be free of him. The gentle touch of his hands, the intensity of those hauntingly beautiful eyes that stared down into hers while he moved over her, in her, branded her as his. No matter what happened now, a little piece of her would belong to him forever. He'd shattered her world and rebuilt it, one kiss, one touch, one stroke at a time. She was changed, irrevocably, and she'd never felt such all-consuming joy. This time, when the pleasure crashed over her, he was right there with her, his voice mingling with hers. They lay together for a long time wrapped around each other while they slowly came back to earth. Would you have any objection if we stayed in bed and did that a few dozen times? She asked. He chuckled and kissed her neck. Your wish is my command, though there is a great big tub in the next room should you care to go for a swim, and a picnic lunch all packed and waiting for us in the kitchen. You've thought of everything, haven't you? I try, he said, his tone matter-of-fact, though his smile betrayed how pleased he was that she was happy. Thank you, Cole. It really is perfect. He pulled her closer and kissed her until her head swam. Only because you're here. She snuggled against him, perfectly content for the first time in her life. Oh, there'd be a lot to iron out when they got home, the work situation, for one. 
This weekend effectively put an end to her campaign to make him miserable, but she also wasn't going to keep working for him. She needed to tell him about the whole lotto thing as well. His lips moved lower and other thoughts invaded her mind. She pushed everything else away for the moment. If she only got to live in a fantasy world for one day, she was going to enjoy every second of it. She'd worry about the real world later. Chapter 22 Cole leaned over and kissed Kirsten's forehead. It was the perfect morning. He didn't think he'd ever had one before, but right then, with them basking in the light of the morning sun after an amazing weekend together, he couldn't think of anything better. He'd have loved to stay at the chateau forever. That wasn't a realistic possibility, but he could certainly buy something similar as a vacation home. They could get away to it whenever possible. He'd have to look into it when he got back to the office, if he ever made it back. Right at that moment, he'd very happily stay in bed, wrapped around Kirsten for the rest of his life. Good morning, she said, smiling up at him. What's all this? She sat up a little and looked at the tray he laid at the end of the bed. I made you breakfast. Her mouth opened in a little O. Oh, you made me breakfast in bed? She bit her lip, her eyes suspiciously bright. No one has ever done that for me before. Then it's about time someone did. He handed her a strawberry and brushed a soft kiss across her lips. You lie there and relax. I'll take care of everything. He pulled the tray closer, and she leaned forward and captured his lips, kissing him until he was ready to shove the tray away and devour her whole. He pulled away while he still had the willpower to do so. Eat, he said with a laugh. You're going to need your strength. She grinned. Promises, promises. She ate far less than he would have liked, but he finally put the tray aside when he couldn't coax another bite into her mouth. His phone rang and he flopped back against the pillow with a groan he hadn't used since his schoolboy days when his mom had to haul him out of bed for school. Kirsten leaned over and kissed his chest. Let it go to voicemail, she said, trailing her lips along his skin. Her teeth lightly scraped over his nipple and he jerked slightly, then captured the back of her head to keep her right where she was. He could feel her smiling against him. He let it go to voicemail and kissed her again. She sighed and snuggled against him. Hmm, a girl could really get used to this. To what, waking up to me in her bed? He nuzzled at her neck and she laughed like it tickled and playfully pushed him away, though she kept a hand on him so she could pull him back again. Well, that goes without saying, she said, pulling him down for a kiss. Then she flopped over on her back. But I meant all of this, luxury suites, room service, soft sheets, she said, feeling the material beneath them with a smile castles? If I'd known all of this was up for grabs, I'd have made a move on you a long time ago. He frowned, and she glanced up, catching his expression, her forehead wrinkled in concern. Is something wrong? You know I'm just kidding, right? Sure. He smiled, though it must not have reached his eyes because she didn't buy it. But he didn't want to start an issue where there probably wasn't one by telling her he didn't find that comment remotely funny. He'd been used enough in the past by women who didn't see him, what he had to offer, who only saw his bank account. She knew that. He took a deep breath and let it out. Being overly sensitive to something that wasn't her fault wasn't fair to her. She seemed to genuinely care for him, but it was hard to get over years' worth of relationship issues. Impossible, probably, in just one weekend. How could he ever know if she was sincere? I'm going to freshen up, 
she said, giving him a quick kiss. He caught her and pulled her back for another one. Hurry back. She bounced out of bed and he smiled after her. Whatever their issues, he was sure they could work them out. The alternative wasn't something he wanted to contemplate. His phone beeped. Voicemail. Cole sighed. It was never-ending. He got up and went to his briefcase, flipping through a few papers that he needed to send off before they got back. In the back of his case was a copy of the mock-up prenup he'd shown to his last girlfriend, stating she would get nothing no matter the cause of marriage dissolution. He pulled it out, looked it over, and imagined giving it to Kirsten. He knew how she'd react, the same way anyone would react— it was designed to protect his interests and his alone, and he'd never give it to Kirsten, no matter what happened between them. He hadn't realized it until that moment, until the image of her storming out for good trampled through his brain. He didn't care if she was only in it for the money. She could have it all. If it made her happy, he'd give it to her gladly. He didn't trust her completely yet, but he no longer cared— he wanted to be with her, whether it was for a day or twenty years. He'd take her as long as he could have her, whatever the cost. She was priceless. He crumpled the paper up and threw it into the fire. He took a deep breath while he watched it burn, taking all his inhibitions with it. It had been a long time since he'd felt so free. Maybe he'd join Kirsten in the bath. He hadn't been able to join her the last time he'd caught her in the tub. Definitely time to remedy that. He walked around the table and tripped over Kirsten's satchel, scattering several papers. Shit, he muttered, bending to pick them up. Lawyer contracts? Was she having legal problems? He knew it was none of his business, but if he could help... He took a quick glance through the paperwork, his eyes growing wider with every word. What the fuck? Cole, I've got the tub filled, Kirsten said, popping her head out of the bathroom. She stopped short when she saw what he was reading. What are you doing? I tripped over your bag and the papers fell out. Sorry. I saw they were from a lawyer and thought maybe I could help. Kirsten? he said, holding them up with a huge grin. You won the fucking lottery? She came toward him and took the papers, sliding them back into the manila envelope and putting them back in her bag. Yes, with Izzy and Cass. He ran his hands down her arms from behind and wrapped his arms around her waist, giving her a squeeze. That is incredible. Ah, so this is why you were leaving me. She turned and pulled away from him. I won't really need to work anymore. Why didn't you tell me? She opened her mouth but didn't say anything. It doesn't matter, he said. He could guess the answer. He drew her into his arms again. Well, I guess we're on more even footing than I thought. Not that it mattered to me. I'd already decided I wanted you regardless. Wanted this. Us. He kissed her forehead. But I guess it does give me some peace of mind that you aren't with me just for my money. He smiled down at her, but she pulled away again. You think I'd do that? Only be with you because you're rich? He frowned slightly, not liking where this was going. No, but it's been an issue with other women. I'm not other women, Cole. I thought you knew me better than that. His frown deepened. I said that it didn't matter to me. Whether you have money or not doesn't have any relevance here. I guess the timing seems a little odd because you weren't talking about anything lasting past this weekend until after you found out about the money. So you'll have to forgive me if I don't quite believe that you would have been offering a relationship if you hadn't just found out I'd won the lotto. Cole's eyes narrowed anger burning away the happiness he'd never thought he'd find. Maybe he hadn't found it after all. No, I'm not sure I can forgive that. I've told you that it doesn't matter, that I'd made my decision before I found out. You should trust that I'm telling you the truth. In fact, 
You should have trusted me with this in the first place, he said, pointing at her bag. Instead of telling me and quitting your job like a normal person, you decided to carry out some weird revenge plot against me. I'll admit I was amused by it, but now, even if you were set on revenge, why didn't you tell me after things had changed between us? I would have told you, she said, folding her arms, but it's not like I've really had a chance. You whisked me off onto a plane and brought me here, and we've been a bit occupied since then. What should I have done? Rolled over right after we made love and said, Oh, hey, by the way, I won the lotto. You should have... His phone rang again, and he closed his eyes with a groan. God damn it. He grabbed his phone, frowning when he saw the caller ID. I have to take this. She threw her hands up and turned to go back to the bathroom. Just hang on, he said, not wanting her to storm off, but he had to take this call. She plopped into a chair and crossed her legs, the movement causing her robe to fall open. The sight of her bare legs, her foot bouncing in agitation, was almost enough to make him chuck the phone through the window so he could drag her back to bed and make love to her until their petty squabbles meant nothing. But it was his party planner. It must be about Piper's house. He had to take it. He answered it. Yeah, he said, foregoing his usual greeting, which was probably just as well, because on the other end of the line was his extremely agitated party planner, insisting that the permits she'd been waiting on for the opening night gala for Piper's house had somehow never been filed. Calm down, he said, yanking on some pants. What do you mean the permits aren't there? I had all the paperwork drawn up and signed and had them sent over. His gaze met Kirsten's, and his voice trailed off. Calm down, he said again, his eyes never leaving hers. I'll get it handled. You keep getting everything ready. I'll get this cleared up. He hung up and stared at Kirsten. Did you do this? Do what? Some paperwork for one of my projects never made it to the permit office. Piper's house. I put them on your desk to send over to legal. They were urgent. Apparently, they never made it in, and now the opening is at a standstill until we can get everything ironed out. What happened to them? She frowned. I'm not sure. What do you mean you're not sure? You are the most efficient, competent person I know, or at least you used to be. This is inexcusable. She glared at him. I'm sorry, sir, but I'm sure we can get the permits handled in time for your party. I doubt it'll be delayed. And if it is, I'm sure whoever Piper is can wait a couple of weeks to throw a party for her new house. Cole stared at her, his brain taking a second to realize what she'd said. She didn't know what Piper's house was. You think I'm throwing a housewarming party for some old girlfriend? Did you even read the papers before you decided to send them off into no man's land? She started to shake her head and then stopped, like she suddenly remembered something or decided to confess. Oh my God, I... I didn't purposely do anything, I swear. And no, I didn't have time to read the papers because you interrupted me. It's called Piper's House. What else would it be? He rubbed his hand over his face. It really shouldn't matter what it is. Fucking hell, he said, turning to pace to the opposite side of the room and back. Damn it, Kirsten. I can't believe you took it that far. I know you've had your little vendetta against me going, but I didn't think you'd purposely sabotage a project. People's jobs are on the line. Invitations have already gone out. She was already shaking her head. This wasn't part of some vendetta. It was a stupid but unintentional accident. I didn't mean for any of this to happen. Well, intentional or not, whatever you did with those forms means all my guests will be standing in the parking lot until the permit's clear instead of being lodged in their rooms, which those forms would have taken care of. We have a tight schedule. The date for the welcoming party has already been set, and people have been notified. 
Some of them have had to make extensive arrangements. Those permits must be filed. What did you do with those papers? I didn't do anything with them. It had to have been you. I had the paperwork drawn up, ready to go. They just needed to be mailed out. I put them right on top of the pile with all the inter-office mail so you'd be sure to see it. I did see them, she said, her face contorting like guilt was swimming through her. Look, I didn't mean for anything to happen to them. I had them in my hand, and then you came in the office, and I put them down on the stack. Whoever picked up the mail must have picked them up also. Yes, well, from what I heard, that paperwork went a little haywire. She sighed. Yeah, look, I thought it might be a little funny to send a few memos and files to the wrong recipients. I didn't see anything that was urgent, nothing that would get completely messed up if something went wrong. I was trying to be a nuisance, not cause any actual problems. I had started looking through those papers when you came in and put them in the pile with the rest. I didn't purposely send them bouncing all over the office. Maybe not, but you had important papers in your hand, and it didn't occur to you after we were done talking to get back and make sure you have them? Sure, it would have if I'd known they were important. I'd looked at them for maybe ten seconds before you came in and wanted me to plan your poker retreat. So you got so busy ruining an important weekend for me that you failed to file even more important project papers. Important weekend? Are you serious? Four rich playboys go off to lie around and play poker all weekend? Give me a break. It's not like you're curing cancer or anything. Although, with the combined bank accounts of the four of you, you probably could. But by all means, spending your time getting drunk and trading your money back and forth sounds like a much worthier use of your time. And ruined is a bit strong. You helped some good people build a schoolhouse for their children and got some fresh air. I don't think any permanent damage was done. Regardless, with respect to the project, it was a complete accident. Cole breathed deep, trying to control his temper. This weekend had turned out so perfect, but nothing was ever perfect. He should have known it would never last. Even if it was, it doesn't change that fact that we'll be delayed weeks now until everything gets sorted. Delays are unacceptable. She closed her eyes and took a deep breath. Looks like he wasn't the only one trying not to let the situation devolve into a shouting match. Cole, I'm sorry. I truly am. I will do whatever I can to make sure the permits are found and filed as quickly as possible. But is this worth getting this upset over? She asked, her voice getting that tone that she got when she was truly pissed. Well, he definitely knew that feeling. Are you serious? Is it worth getting upset over? Of course it is. No matter what kind of project it is, it would be important to me. And because of you, the whole thing is in jeopardy. But this project, this one especially, has my heart. She jerked back like he'd struck her, an expression of hurt. She couldn't quite hide, creasing the corners of her eyes. Well, that would have been nice to know before this weekend. If this piper is so important to you, what the hell are you doing with me? The pain in her voice tempered his anger. He didn't want to hurt her, but she had no idea what she'd done. He didn't know how much longer he could keep his rapidly fraying emotions in check. Piper, he said, trying to keep his voice low and even, was my sister. She died a few years ago from scleroderma, a miserable disease that has no cure and wreaks painful havoc on your body. Piper's house... He had to clench his jaw to keep the emotion from seeping into his voice. Piper's house is for people like her, 
a place for them to get treatment, a retreat. Invitations for the opening gala have already gone out. It was planned with plenty of time to have everything ready to go, and the first group of patients will be on their way in a matter of days. But now... Kirsten stared back at him, her face stricken, eyes wide and shiny. Oh, Cole, I'm so sorry. I didn't know about your sister. He turned his back. He didn't talk about his sister for a reason. Why didn't you tell me about the party? I always plan this stuff for you, or at least consult with the party planner on it. I wanted to do it myself this time. He stopped and cleared his throat. I wanted it to be perfect. I knew what Piper would have liked, and I did entrust the most important part to you, something I hesitated on with all your odd behavior, but even with your obvious attempts to get fired, you never messed with my clients. I assumed I could trust you with this. Apparently, I was wrong. She flinched, and then she walked over to the closet and went inside, coming back out a few moments later in fresh clothes, her shoes in her hands. She sat on the edge of the bed and pulled them on. "'What are you doing?' he asked. He was still pissed, but he didn't want her leaving with things between them the way they were. Then again, he had no idea what else to say at that moment." He was still far too angry over the current fiasco to have a reasonable conversation about it. Maybe it was better if they tabled things for later. I'm going back to the office. There are only a few places those papers could be. It'll be faster locating them if I just go myself. It won't matter. The permit offices are closed, and they have to be filed a week in advance. I'll fix it, Kirsten. She held up her hand. You don't need to say anything. She grabbed her phone from the bedside table and slipped it into her pocket. She paused for a second, then looked up at him. I truly am sorry, Cole. I know I've been a little unreliable lately, but I wouldn't have purposely sabotaged your project, no matter what it was. I hope you know that. He didn't answer. He didn't know that. The only thing he did know was that a few minutes ago his life had been perfect. He'd actually thought he had a shot at a real relationship with the woman of his dreams. And true to form, it had gotten screwed all to hell. The door closed quietly, and he let his head hang. It didn't matter anyway. She was gone. Chapter 23 Kirsten moved a stack of manila envelopes out of the way and started on another bin. The sheer number of them that were left to go through was daunting, but there was no way in hell she was going to give up until she found those permits. She yawned, her jaw cracking with the force of it. She'd gotten one of the chateau staff to drive her to the airport, where she'd been able to catch a last-minute flight home. She had no idea if, when, or how Cole had gotten home— Cass shoved her stack aside and stretched her back. Kears, it's five in the morning. We've been looking all night. I hate to say it, but don't even, she said, grabbing another stack to flip through. We are finding those damn papers. How do you know they are even down here? I checked all the departments they could have gone to. Nowhere. They've got to still be in here. I didn't put them in an envelope, so either they are floating around or got shoved in another envelope. So keep looking for anything that came from Cole's office. They've got to be here somewhere. Wait! Izzy's head popped up from the stack she had going on the mailroom floor. I got them! Kirsten jumped up and rushed over, grabbing them from Izzy's hand. She did a quick flip through. Yes! She grabbed Izzy's face and planted a kiss full on her lips. I so owe you one. Izzy laughed and pushed her away. Well, now you've got them. What are you going to do with them? I'm going to walk them down to the permit office and sit there until their doors open so I can be first in line. And I'm not leaving until everything is completely ready to go. Then what? 
Cass asked. Then I'm going to make sure the opening gala goes off without a hitch. And then? Izzy asked. Kirsten sighed. I'm going to walk away, claim my money, get the hell out of this town, maybe travel around the world. Anything that's far away from this place. And him. Her friends exchanged a glance, but she wasn't in the mood to discuss it. Thank you for helping me find them, she said, waving the papers a little. Our pleasure, Cass said, though her smile didn't quite reach her eyes. Kirsten took the papers and gathered her things, leaving without saying anything else. She knew her friends worried, but she couldn't talk about what she didn't understand either. For a moment, all had been right in her world. Cole was aggravating, infuriating, sexy as hell, and so much a part of her life she didn't know what to do with it without him there. She'd been afraid that any relationship between them would be an extension of her job, her taking care of his needs. But he'd spent the weekend pampering her, surprising her, catering to her needs. It had been perfect while it lasted. She would have to figure out how to keep going without him because he was never going to forgive her for the crap she pulled. She didn't really blame him. She'd screwed up, royally. It was sadly ironic that the one thing she hadn't purposely messed up was the one thing she'd had the most success with. She'd finally pissed him off enough to deserve termination. Only... He still hadn't fired her. Well, she wasn't going to sit around and wait for it anymore. It wasn't like she needed the severance package. In a few days, she'd have more money than she knew what to do with. She could do whatever she wanted, and it didn't matter who won their little war. Neither of them won. But she had to do what she could to fix her royal fuck-up. Luckily, things went smoothly at the permit office, Everything was filed and in place. Residents could now check into Piper's house, and they could throw a gala with all the extras. She logged into the computer the second she got back to the office and pulled up all the relevant info for the party. Cole had it in a file marked Piper. Anything with a woman's name, she didn't touch. No wonder she hadn't seen it before. Unfortunately, the first phone call she made didn't go so well. What do you mean the venue has been rebooked? The permits have all been filed. We're only a couple of days late. Ma'am, the permits need to be filed at least two weeks in advance for a gathering of this size. Now, I do see that a special waiver was granted in this case, but only on the condition that the paperwork was received in our office by Friday, which it was not. The next party on the waiting list was informed first thing this morning, and their paperwork is in order. I'm afraid there's nothing I can do. Have a good day. The woman hung up the phone, leaving Kirsten to stare off into space in a blind panic. How could she make sure Cole's party went off without a hitch if she'd lost the venue? There was no party to hitch. She stared at her computer screen, praying a solution would present itself. She had to make this right for him. Where else could they host this thing? It couldn't be another park. They'd run into the same problem. She could probably book some fancy indoor venue someplace, but Cole had obviously been going for a more casual, commune-with-nature type thing. She bumped the mouse on her desk, and her screensaver disappeared, revealing the website for Piper's house that she'd been on earlier. It was such a beautiful place. The sister would be proud. Kirsten sat up a little straighter an idea occurring to her. She clicked open the gallery and found herself looking at picture after picture of gorgeous outdoor beauty. The facility itself looked like a mini castle, not unlike the chateau he'd brought her to, she realized with a pang. And the grounds, with their manicured gardens and exotically beautiful plants, made the whole place look right out of a fairy tale. Why not hold it there? It was a little bit of a drive for the guests, but the place was stunning. And Cole would then get to celebrate the opening and show the place off all at once. And being his own property, he wouldn't need to go through the hassle of permits or any other red tape. 
She went back to the file folder on Piper's house and pulled up the guest list, vendor list, and anyone else relevant to the party, conferenced in the party planner, and then went to work begging, borrowing, pleading, and in many cases outright bribing, until everyone who needed to be there had been informed of the change. Hours later, she sat back and took a long, cleansing breath. It was done. The party was salvaged and, she hoped, would be even better than the original. This way, Cole got to show off the amazing thing he'd done. She hoped it would make him happy. She couldn't unbotch everything, but she'd done everything she could to make it right. It would be nice to tell him so in person, but he hadn't been back to the office, nor had he called her, a fact she might normally enjoy. The man usually blew her phone up to the point that she wanted to blow the damn thing up for real. But this time, she swallowed past the huge lump in her throat. This time, there were no words from him. Nothing. He wouldn't answer her calls or texts, either. And he always had that damn phone in his hand. So she knew he was getting them. He'd climbed out of her bed and, it appeared, out of her life. Perhaps it was better that way. They'd have only made each other miserable in the end. She printed out all the relevant information and left everything in a folder on his desk with a giant hot pink memo that said, Read me. Then she looked around the office. Cole had driven her nuts. She would downright loathed him most days, but these offices had been her home for a long time, even more so, she thought, than her actual home. And not just because she spent more time there. It felt like home because he had been there. Well, it wasn't home anymore. Of course, he still hadn't fired her, but at this point it was probably safe to assume he didn't want her around anymore, and she couldn't entirely blame him for that. A quiet knock on the door drew her out of her thoughts. She looked over her shoulder, hoping for half a second that it was him. Of course it wasn't. He wouldn't knock on his own door. Cass and Izzy smiled at her from the doorway. You ready? Izzy asked. It's freedom time. Mr. Meyer is waiting for us in a car downstairs. He came personally, wanted to make sure everything went off without a hitch at the claiming office. Kirsten took one more look around. Yeah. She walked past them and grabbed her purse from her office, shoving any sad emotions back into the little box in the back of her mind. She'd deal with them later. For now, she smiled. Let's go get filthy rich. Cole sat at the table, running his fingers over the cards in his hand, not really seeing them at all. He glanced at backup phone number three, Number two had gone the way of most of his phones and taken a nosedive into the sink a few days earlier. No missed calls. No texts. He'd really thought she'd at least show up to the opening of Piper's house, since she'd worked so hard to save the event. The gala had been spectacular, according to everyone who attended. Cole had been so busy watching the entrance waiting for Kirsten to show that he hadn't been able to enjoy it. He dropped the phone on the table right into the condensation ring from his beer. If he wasn't careful, number three would be out of commission before midnight. A record, even for him. Hey, Brooks said, waving his cards at Cole. Cole blinked his eyes back into focus and looked at his friend. Sorry, my mind's not on it right now. Brooks shrugged one shoulder. Well, that stands to reason, I suppose. Cole frowned. What? Why? You just walked away from the love of your life, mate. Even you can't escape from that unscathed. Harrison tipped his beer at him and took a drink. Cole snorted. She's not the love of my life. She's just a disgruntled employee who I let get too close. Brooke's eyebrow went up. Maybe if you say that enough times, you'll convince yourself you mean it. I do mean it. Unlike you, I do tend to think of something other than women from time to time. I have to meet with that ass Daniels tomorrow and finalize the merger. I've already got a headache, and he's not even in the room yet. 
A merger that wouldn't be happening without Kirsten, by the way, Brooks said. Cole grimaced and tossed back another slug of his beer. He slammed the bottle down. Don't we have anything stronger in here? He went to the liquor cabinet in the corner and pulled out a bottle of scotch. The boys watched him while he poured a glass and tossed it back. Their eyes on him bored into his skin, making it crawl. He downed another swallow, savoring the liquid burning its way down his throat. What? he said, gently putting the glass down. He wanted to slam it down. Or throw it against the wall. But that would betray emotions nobody needed to know he had, especially for the woman who'd weaseled her way into his life to wreak havoc and destruction. Besides, quiet was scarier, tended to make people back down faster. He made eye contact with Brooks and sighed. Okay, it made most people back down faster. I know she did a number on you and pulled a few stupid stunts, Brooks said, but I don't think she was trying to hurt you. That's exactly what she was trying to do. I don't think so, Harrison said. She was trying to give you a little taste of your own medicine, and whether you want to admit it or not, you enjoyed the fight. And, you said yourself, she never did anything that would cause permanent damage. She just tried to drive you a bit crazy. Right, Chris chimed in. Your projects, the really important stuff she left alone. You don't think she'd leave all that alone and then try to sabotage the one you cared about more than all the others, do you? Brooks asked. Cole turned his back on them and stared out the window at the city skyline. He loved the city at night. Everything seemed muted somehow, softer. Even the endless lines of traffic were beautiful from up above the only things visible being the white and red lights streaming in their lines around the city. I don't know what was going through her head, he finally said. All I know is that I've been working on this project for years. It's finally ready. It's for Piper, my legacy for her, for me. Out of all my projects, this is the one I want to be known for. I want to make a difference, make people's lives better. Maybe have my name associated with something other than dating models and being an ass of a boss. You're already known for more than that, Cole, Brooks said, serious for once in his life. Do you really think people will only remember you for being a dickhead and serial model dater? Cole gave him a wry smile. Okay, maybe it sounded a bit lame said out loud like that. Brooks wasn't done yet, though. Your name is on half the factories in the Midwest. You've developed more ideas for apps and products than anyone in town and employ more people than the rest of the moguls in this city put together. You've managed to do it better and at a younger age than any of them. That takes someone who is a bit of a hard ass. The model thing? Well, that's just a perk of the job. Cole snorted. Yes, well, I'm tired of that particular perk, especially since most of the women I've dated have viewed me as little more than a perk themselves. They wouldn't care who I was or even what I look like, as long as they had access to my bank account. Except for Kirsten, Chris said. Cole's gaze shot to his friends and held. He couldn't argue with that. Kirsten knew him better than he knew himself. He shook his head. It was her job to know me. No, Brooks said. Like you once told me, it was her job to know your business, how you liked your coffee and whether you were running late to your next meeting. That folder she left on your desk, the one with all the party details, that was done by someone who knows you inside and out. Cole's eyes widened. Where did you see that? Brooks just smiled at him. Don't ask questions you don't want the answer to. Oh, and get a briefcase with a better lock. You picked the lock? Do you really want me to answer that? Cole's lips twitched. No. He shook his head and then resumed his pacing from one side of the room to the other, stopping in front of the table again. 
Okay, so what if she really did love me and wasn't using me, something I could never really know for sure anyway? What difference does it make now? The accusations I made, and right after... Brooks's eyebrows lifted and cold, damn near blushed. He glowered at his friend. She must hate me. Brooks shrugged. We all do every now and then. We get over it. So will she. Harrison and Chris nodded in agreement. Fuck you guys, Cole said. They just grinned at him like a bunch of idiots. Even if she'd talked to me, how do I convince her that money isn't an issue, that I already trusted her before I found out about hers? You'll figure it out, Brooks said. Cole shook his head. Helpful, thanks. Brooks picked up his beer and drained it. I've known you for a lot of years, Cole. I've never seen you even remotely as happy as you've been in the last few weeks. Even before that, ever since Kirsten's been in your life, you've been, I don't know, more focused, calmer, less stressed. Now, you know I'm the last one on the planet to advocate monogamy, but shit, you could do a hell of a lot worse. And I seriously doubt you could do any better. If Kirsten wasn't so obviously taken, I might go for her myself. That earned Brooks another glare, but he just grinned it off. A faint headache took up residence behind Cole's eyes. He knew what he wanted. He wanted her. He'd always wanted her. But how the hell was that even going to be possible now? She'd never trust that her money didn't matter. He knew because he'd spent his entire adult life focusing on nothing but how much it did matter when it came to his relationships. He never believed the women who'd told him it didn't matter. His boys were right. Kirsten knew him better than anyone, which meant she knew his hang-up on the money thing. And he hadn't told her it didn't matter anymore until after he knew about the lotto, there was no way he could fix that, make her believe him. Don't do it, my friend, Harrison said. I can see the wheels turning in that thick skull of yours. The others nodded agreement. You're actively trying to talk yourself out of fighting for her, Chris said. Do you blame me? Cole said, throwing his hands up. No, Brooks said. But that doesn't mean you should let it derail you. This time, at least. Kirsten is the most level-headed woman I know, and the fact that she spent the last month trying her hardest to drive you insane only proves to me she's perfect for you. When is the last time anyone even spoke to you out of turn, let alone treated you the way she's been treating you? Cole opened his mouth to argue, but couldn't. He sat down, his forehead creasing again as he thought of everything that had gone on in the last month. How refreshing it had been to have someone not just be a yes man, but state her true mind. Kirsten had never been much of a yes man before that. Oh, she did what he asked, but she also had a way of asserting her own opinion without negating his own and he realized she was one of the few people he trusted to handle stuff without having to micromanage everything she did. In fact, he valued and relied on her opinion on just about everything. The thought of not having her in his life bothered him much more than he'd ever have thought possible, for many reasons. He sighed. I still have the minor problem of her not trusting me, she left after that fight, and I haven't heard from her since. I wouldn't blame her if she never wanted to see me again. So, what are you going to do about it? Harrison asked. Cole glanced around at his friends, his mind churning over one idea after another. He finally just laughed and shook his head. <laughs> I have no idea. But you are going to do something, yes? Chris asked. Because, like I said, Brooke said, I'd be happy to step in and you stay the hell away from her, Cole said, grinning at his friend. She's mine. 
Chapter 24 She was rich, loaded, filthy, stinking rich. She sat at the restaurant with Izzy and Cass, champagne glass in her hand, her mind still spinning from the events of the past week. They'd gone with their lawyer and claimed the money. After that had been a whirlwind of photographs and interviews. They'd agreed to keep things as calm as possible. No press conferences or talk show interviews. They'd gotten their picture taken holding the giant check, but that had been the extent of it. Even that would be bad enough, though. There had been news cameras there. The lawyer and newly appointed financial people were already getting phone calls from organizations and supposed long-lost relatives asking for donations. The bright side, though, she could go anywhere, do anything, travel, found a charity, buy her parents a house and pay off all their bills, quit her job. She took a sip of her champagne, and then another, larger sip. This shouldn't even be a question right now. Of course she was going to quit her job. She hated her job. She dreamed of this day forever. Her freedom ticket had finally paid off. She should just send Cole a text and tell him she quit. Or better yet, call HR and tell them. Then she wouldn't have to have any contact with him. Not that he seemed to want to see her. She avoided the office for the last several days, using a few of the personal days she'd accumulated over the years. He hadn't tried calling. He hadn't taken her calls. So maybe she'd just make it easy on both of them. Have Cass or Izzy drop off her keys and company phone so she didn't even have to go back to the office. That was the coward's way out. But at the moment, she was feeling cowardly. She didn't know if she could face him and keep her resolve. Despite the ugly things he'd said, she still had feelings for him. Had always had feelings for him, really, despite how much he drove her nuts. She'd always admired him for his success, his focus, and now, with what he was doing with Piper's house, well, it just made her admire him more. She prayed the gala went off without a hitch. She should probably stop in to make sure. She didn't even have to see anyone. She could stay in the back. This one last thing she could do for him before she walked away forever. Why are you sitting there looking like someone just died? Izzy asked, nudging her. This is the best day of our lives. She gave her friend a faint smile. It's a very good day, but not the best of her life. Not even close. No, her best day featured a powerful, sometimes arrogant, drop-dead gorgeous jackass with flashing gray eyes and thick hair that her fingers ached to touch again. Cass gave Izzy a knowing look that made Kirsten cringe. She hated being so obvious. So, what are you going to do? Cass asked. With the money? Kirsten asked. No, with Cole. Kirsten took a deep breath and slowly released it. I have no idea. She swirled the champagne around in her glass. Her gaze focused on the sparkling amber liquid. You should at least talk to him, Izzy said. I'd say if you want to, but it's obvious you do. She looked up, startled. It is? Cass snorted. Honey, we just claimed a shit ton of money. Everything is a possibility for us now. Everything we ever wanted, anywhere we ever wanted to go. Most people would be peeing their pants in excitement. But you're sitting there staring off into space and playing with champagne from an $800 bottle instead of drinking it. So yes, I'd say it's obvious you've got something on your mind. Kirsten opened her mouth, then closed it, then opened it again. She didn't want to say the words that trembled on her tongue. They were weak, stupid, and she couldn't help it. I miss him. Instead of rolling their eyes or laughing like she expected, Cass and Izzy each looked at her with expressions of understanding and concern, which kind of freaked her out. 
You're not going to tell me I'm an idiot? Cass shrugged. What good would that do? You love him. Whether that is advisable is kind of moot at this point. How can it possibly be moot? Isn't it the whole point? Izzy raised an eyebrow and grabbed a breadstick. Honey, you have never been one to easily fall in love. You let your head get in the way too much. So if this man weaseled past all your defenses, it doesn't really matter if it's a smart decision or not. It's a done deal. That doesn't mean it should stay a done deal, Cass said. If you want to walk away, walk away. Kirsten went back to staring at her drink. I don't know if it matters how I feel. He made it obvious how he felt. Cass grabbed her hand and gave it a squeeze. He was upset. I doubt he meant all that. Kirsten frowned. No, he meant it. I can't even really blame him. Well, I can. You know, Kirsten said, their fight running through her mind over and over. I don't even think I'm upset that he was angry. I nearly destroyed something that meant the world to him, something he'd been working on for years, because I wanted to play some stupid pranks to get revenge for him being a tough boss. Hell, he probably had decent grounds to get me arrested for corporate sabotage or something. But he didn't even fire me. She looked back and forth between her two friends. That's odd, right? That he didn't fire me? I'd have fired you. Izzy said. Cass shushed her, and Izzy shrugged. What? I would have. She turned to Kirsten. So the fact that he didn't says a lot to me. Isn't he the man who fired his assistant for taking time off for her own wedding? She actually quit, but good point. Kirsten frowned again. So what does that mean? Izzy laughed. I'd say it means he's got it bad for you. Cass nodded. Ditto. That made Kirsten's heart jump, but it didn't really change much. She sighed again. Maybe he doesn't want to get slapped with a sexual harassment lawsuit or something. Firing me when I'm still sitting there in nothing but a sheet. Yeah, Cass said. That'd be cold. Izzy snorted. <laughs> Literally. Or maybe he just loves you, Cass said. Kirsten shook her head. We're too different. I'm not his type. Izzy's eyebrows rose again. When has that ever stopped anyone? Besides, I'd say being whisked away so you can sex it up medieval style all weekend says otherwise. Shh, Kirsten said. What? Izzy said. I'm not wrong. If he wanted a quick lay, there are faster and cheaper ways of doing it and faster and cheaper women to do it with. Nice, Cass said. It's the truth, and you both know it. I didn't mean it like that, Kirsten said. What I meant was, what? Izzy asked. The money? Yeah. He didn't start talking relationship until after he saw those papers, after he knew I wasn't some gold digger. I know that's always been an issue with him, but honestly... I don't think it matters when it comes to you, Cass said. He's used to being with the rich and famous. He dates models and actresses. But you two have been dancing around each other for months, and even after everything you did, after dumping him in Amish country for crying out loud, he still wanted you. You said you spent an amazing weekend together, before he knew about the money. Yeah, Izzy said. And this might not be what you want to hear, but what difference does it make if it does make him feel better that you have money? I mean, do you blame the guy? You've been rich for less than a week and already have people coming out of the woodwork with their hands out. He's been dealing with that for years. He's probably never dated anyone who wasn't after his money. Will you ever be able to trust that a guy is with you for you and not your money again? Well, damn. That was a good point. It's going to take a long time to wrap that fact around her brain. All this does is put you on equal footing. 
Now neither of you has to worry about being used for your money. Come on, Kirsten. Is that why you're hesitating? Or are you afraid to take a shot and get turned down? Izzy asked. Wouldn't you be? Sure, but I'd rather get shot down than wonder about what would have happened for the rest of my life. Kirsten sighed. That was an excellent point. Not that she could do anything about it when he wouldn't answer her calls. She glanced down at her phone. She almost missed hearing it ring. Well, Izzy said, I guess we can at least notify everyone that no one won the pool. You both held out longer than we all thought. Yeah, unless he finally picks up the damn phone and fires me today. Who has the last day? Izzy pulled out her phone. Um, huh. Okay, that's weird. What? Cass and Kirsten both leaned over to look. The last day of the month didn't have a name. Just a phrase. Never, because he can't live without her. Kirsten's stomach flipped. She sat back, stunned. Who would have put that? Cass frowned. I don't know, but whoever it was wasted a square. We can't pay out winnings on never. It doesn't matter, Kirsten said. I'm going to quit. Cass took her hand again. Are you sure? She nodded. I can't go back to being his assistant. I'm not going to work for a man I've slept with, and I'm sure as hell not going to work for him if we are together. The relationship wouldn't last a week. Izzy shrugged. I don't know. It's lasted so far. We weren't in a relationship before. You kind of were, Cass said. You spent more time with him than you did with us, and you live with us. She snorted. Sure, but I spent most of that time running his errands and making sure his life ran smoothly. If that's your definition of a relationship, you might need a time machine back to the 50s. True, Izzy agreed. It's got to be nice not waiting on him hand and foot. If that's how he treated you as an assistant, it probably would have been a whole lot worse living with him. You pick out the guy's clothes for him every day. It'd be like having a large child instead of a boyfriend. Kirsten snorted. She'd had that same thought on more than one occasion, but... I don't know. Yes, I did some ridiculous things. But this weekend, when we were together, he took care of everything. It would have been easier to fall back into our normal roles, let me handle it all. But he didn't. He did everything. He even brought me breakfast in bed that he made himself. She said, smiling at the memory. Maybe, maybe it wouldn't be like I always thought it would be. She rubbed her head. This whole last month has been one surprise after another. He never reacted the way I expected. Perhaps I misjudged him. And if you did? Izzy asked. She shook her head. I don't know. Maybe it's too late to matter. I did what I could to fix it all. I heard the opening at Piper's house went perfectly. I still can't get him to answer my calls. Maybe it's just over. Too little, too late. Oh, babe, Cass said. It's never too late. She raised her glass. Kirsten and Izzy joined her. To freedom she said. Then she looked at Kirsten. And whatever we choose to do with it. Kirsten took a deep breath. That was the question, wasn't it? What would she do with her newfound freedom? She looked at her phone again. Still silent. Still no messages. All right, that's it, she said, shoving away from the table. Where are you going? Izzy asked. He might hate me. He might never want to see me again, but there's no way in hell I'm going to let him just ignore me. If he wants me out of his life, he's going to have to tell me to my face, after I tell him a few things first. She downed the rest of her drink and turned to march out the door. Her friends scrambled to grab their things, Cass throwing enough on the table to cover the tab and tip. Wait for us, they called after her. They'd better hurry if they wanted to come. She had a wayward boss to track down. 
Chapter 25 Kirsten blazed out of the elevator, Cass and Izzy hot on her heels. She marched straight through the office, ignoring the whispers and craned necks that followed her. In fact, she was pretty sure she'd picked up a crowd as she headed straight for the conference room, where Cole sat with that ass of a man, Mr. Daniels. She didn't care about any of them. Her attention zeroed in on Cole. She pushed open the conference room doors and marched right up to the table, much to the surprise of Cole, who stood eyes wide and staring, and his guest. Kirsten, Cole said. Excuse me, young lady, Mr. Daniel said, but you are interrupting a very important meeting. Now, why are you here? She said, glaring at him. He blinked at her, obviously taken aback. Then he straightened up, his chin jutting into the air a bit. I decided to swallow my pride and follow your advice for the sake of my company. Congratulations. Now sit down and hush. He'll get back to you in a minute. Kirsten? Cole started again, but she turned on him next. You sit down and shut up, too. His lips twitched, but he did as she said sitting back in his chair and lacing his fingers lightly together while he waited for her to speak. She pointed to his phone. Does that work? He frowned, obviously confused. Yes. Why? For months, you have been blowing up my phone, day, night, in the middle of parties, at dinners, when I'm asleep, or hell, even when I'm in the restroom, and I have never, not once, not answered. Even if you hadn't been my boss, it's just common courtesy. At least shoot me a text telling me to get lost, but to completely ignore me for days is inexcusable. I agree, but I'm not finished yet. He held up a hand. My apologies. Continue. I know things got out of hand, and I'm more sorry than I can say that I almost messed up Piper's house. I never would have done that on purpose. I hope you believe that. It's so beautiful, Cole. It really is. I'm so proud of you. Thank but, she cut him off. That doesn't justify the complete freeze out you've been giving me, especially after everything that's happened between us. How could you just... He held up his new phone. It's a new phone. I just found out today my backup info didn't transfer over for some reason, so they had to set me up with a new number. I never got your messages. Oh, she said, some of her bravado fading a little. She glanced around, finally noticing that the entire office had gone dead silent because they had their faces pressed against the glass of the conference room walls, watching and listening, since she'd flung the doors wide open to every word she said. The same people who had listened to her bitch and complain about Cole every day for the last two years, along with Brooks, Harrison, and Chris, who had come in at some point without her noticing and were watching the whole show with avid interest. All right, then. She turned back to him. His eyebrows were raised, that aggravating smile back on his lips. Was there anything else you wanted to say to me? She hadn't planned on making a total spectacle in front of everyone, but the hell with it. Yes, she took a deep breath. You are the most stubborn, aggravating pain in the ass I know, and I am totally, unconditionally, head over heels in love with you. The collective gasp from her onlookers would have been comical if she hadn't just declared her love for the boss who might still hate her guts. Is that so? He asked. Oh, so he was going to make her work for it. Fair enough. She deserved a little torture for everything she'd put him through. Yes, that's so. Cole stood. And what do you think I should do about that? He took another step toward her, and her heart tripped a beat or two. I think you should forgive me so we can get back to dating. Listen to her, son, Mr. Daniels chimed in. She seems like a smart lady. You could do a hell of a lot worse. 
That grin of Cole's twitched again, but he shook his head. Kirsten's stomach dropped to her toes. No. No? She said, her body somehow flushing hot and running cold at the same time. No. It's not enough. She forgot how to breathe. What do you mean? You are the most infuriating, frustrating woman I have ever met in my life. Marry me. This time, the collective gasp was followed by a few hoots, hollers, and a rush of excited whispers. She looked back at Cole, trying to get a grip long enough to breathe properly. Her hammering heart must have affected her lungs and her hearing, because nothing seemed to be working. Did you just ask me to marry you? Yes. But what about everything I did? He took another step toward her. I don't care. What about the money? His next step brought him within touching distance. What about it? I don't care. We both have some great. I loved you before I knew about yours, and I don't care if you love me because of mine. You can have it all. I don't want it. I just want you. Her heart thundered in her chest. That's easy enough to say. He smiled. I'll sign a prenup. She cocked an eyebrow. I've seen your prenup. He turned and snagged a legal pad and pen off the conference table and handed them to her. Write your own. Anything you want, I'll sign it. Cole, Chris said, but he ignored him, his gaze fixed on Kirsten's. Anything? He nodded. She stared at him for a moment more, then laid the pad on the table and wrote, Prenup. Anything she says goes. He didn't even read it, just took the pen and leaned over to sign. Cole, you can't just sign. Chris started again, but Cole had already signed. He tossed it over to Izzy. Send that down to legal, he said. Cole, Kirsten said, but he pulled her to him, apparently done talking. He sighed deeply and rested his forehead against hers for a moment before pulling back enough to meet her gaze again. I'm sorry for what happened, what I said. I was out of line. No, you weren't, she said, reaching up to squeeze his hand. I'm sorry, too. They held each other's gaze for a second, then spoke at the same time. I quit. You're fired. They both laughed, and he pressed her closer. I love you, Crispin, he whispered. She laughed again, her heart nearly bursting with the joy flooding through it. Crispin Harrington, she smiled. I think I like the sound of that. A proper engagement with a massive rock will be forthcoming. I just need to wait to gather my winnings from the termination pool. What? she asked, her heart skipping a beat. The last square, it was mine. Well, technically no one wins. I quit and you fired me at the same time. It kind of cancels each other out. I still think I should collect. On what grounds? Pain and suffering. She laughed. I'll consider it. She leaned back so she could look into his eyes. So you're the one who wrote never because he can't live without her? He took her hand and kissed it. Yes. But... That was filled in weeks ago. He kissed the other hand. I know. He tugged gently, and she melted against him. Why didn't you tell me you knew about the pool? His shoulder shrugged beneath her cheek. Where's the fun in that? Why didn't you tell me about winning the lotto? Where's the fun in that? She echoed him with a grin. Besides, I think I just want something even better. Better than the lotto? He asked, eyebrows raised. Well, I don't know if I can live up to that, but I can promise I'll spend the rest of my life trying. She cupped his cheek. As long as I no longer have to work for you, pick out your clothes, make your three-in-the-morning paperwork runs, grocery shop for you, lay out your damn underwear, I'm sure we'll get along just fine. You know, I did all that just to mess with you in the beginning at least the underwear part. But you just did it so well. I had to keep it going. 
She gasped and slapped at his shoulder, and he laughed, wrapping his arms around her until she melted into him. He swallowed hard, his jaw clenching briefly. I really don't deserve you, he said, his voice husky with an emotion that made her eyes swim with tears. He pulled her in for another kiss and then stopped, leaning back to meet her gaze. Just, next time I do something to piss you off and we both know that's going to happen, talk to me about it first. I'm not sure I can survive another month-long spree of creative revenge. Kirsten laughed and wrapped her arms around him. Deal. He wrapped his arms around her waist, lifting her off her feet and holding her close as he spun them around. When he set her down, he kissed her like he was drowning, and she was his last breath of air. She loved every second, and so did everyone else. The room thundered with whistles and cheers as she went back for more. She never would have predicted that winning the lotto would lead her to winning the love of her life, but she'd bet on them any day of the week. Epilogue Cole watched Kirsten working for a moment before stepping back into the office, two steaming cups in his hands. She picked up her empty tea mug and frowned down into its empty depths. Before she could get up, he set her refill on her desk. It was my turn to get the refills, she said. He shrugged and pulled her up, switching places with her so he could pull her down to his lap and nestle her against him. I was up anyway. I think I'll be getting up soon myself, about time for another bathroom run. He grinned and cupped his hand around her growing belly. His daughter delivered a powerful kick, and he laughed. She's getting strong. Kirsten's hands joined his on her belly. Yes, she is. Brooks poked his head in, pausing to lean against the door frame while he watched. Is he really more comfortable than your new cushy chair? He asked, going over to slump into the chair that Cole had vacated. Kirsten grinned at him from behind her desk. Yes, he is, she said, snuggling down. Cole smiled and wrapped his arms tighter around his wife. A word that still thrilled him, even though they'd celebrated their second anniversary a few weeks before. He still had a hard time believing this was his life now. Kirsten, their new partner at the firm, working beside him every day, sleeping beside him every night. And now they were about to bring a new little life into the world, a circumstance that hadn't been planned, but after he'd gotten used to the idea, he was very much looking forward to it. The crippling fear that he'd completely screw the poor child up was still one he wrestled with. But with Kirsten as her mother, surely he wouldn't be allowed to screw up too badly. The belly beneath his hand suddenly tightened, and Kirsten hunched around it with a gasp. Fear shot through him. Was that a contraction? She didn't respond for a few seconds, finally relaxing against him and releasing her breath. Wow, I think so. She turned to him, excitement blazing in her eyes. Brooks shot to his feet. She's in labor? Do we need to go to the hospital? Should I call a car? What do you need me to do? Kirsten and Cole both stared at him. Cole grinned. I think we have a little time. Another contraction turned Kirsten's belly into a rock-hard ball, and she gripped the back of his shirt and tried to breathe through it. Yikes! That one hurt! Cole tried to keep his voice level and calm, though adrenaline was now rushing through him hard enough to make his head spin. Wasn't that kind of fast for another one to hit? I'm not sure. The others were farther apart, but... Others? What others? She looked up at him, though he could tell her attention wasn't really on him but focused on what was happening with her body. She rubbed her belly and shifted on his lap, probably trying to ease the discomfort. I've been having a few little ones here and there since early this morning. 
What? Cole said, shooting out of his chair, though he had the presence of mind to make sure his wife didn't end up on the floor as a result. Why didn't you tell me? She shrugged. They weren't very strong or consistent. I thought they were just Braxton Hicks or something. You should have said something, he said, settling her back into the chair. He marched over to their assistant's office, Kirsten's old office, and started issuing orders. They'd had a plan in place for months now for this exact moment. Now that it was here, he hoped everything ran smoothly. I knew we had time. It's our first baby. My mom was in labor for 36 hours with me. If I'd said something, you'd have made me stay home or go to the hospital or something, and... She paused while another one hit her. Cole exchanged a panicked look with Brooks. Kirsten released her breath slowly. And you haven't picked out a delivery present yet. He wrapped an arm around her, lending his support in case she needed it. Delivery present? She rolled her eyes. You still haven't read the prenup, have you? I don't need to. I already agreed to anything you wanted. Yeah, well, you might want to take a look at the specifics, Brooks said. She's been adding to it again. Cole chuckled. You already get a million dollars every time I forget an anniversary, a hundred thousand for every date night I'm late for, and was it five or ten thousand every time I leave my socks on the floor? She panted through another contraction. It was five. I upped it to ten after the gym socks incident. Ah, yes, they were exceptionally ripe. He glanced up at Brooks, trying to keep his voice level despite the volcano of panic that was reaching the breaking point inside. ETA on a car? Calling now, Brooks said, eyeing Kirsten like she was an overblown balloon getting ready to explode. I can't believe you didn't tell me, Cole muttered. We have too much to do for me to be sitting at home on my butt, she said. Kirsten had been working on the expansion for Piper's house. The next three locations were set to open within the month and there was a huge fundraiser planned for the following week. She had everything planned down to the last detail, so everything would run smoothly no matter when the baby decided to make her appearance. But still, there had been last-minute details that she didn't trust anyone but herself to take care of. And now she was sitting in his office, ready to give birth to his daughter on his desk. "'I'm going to grab your bag,' Keep everything, he waved at the general direction of his daughter's exit point. Inside, she snorted, working on it. He ducked into the restroom in the office and grabbed the baby bag out of the closet. They had them stashed in several strategic locations throughout the building and their house. He wasn't leaving anything to chance. He nodded at Brooks, who was on the phone ordering the car to be brought to the door. Kirsten was on the phone with the caterer, confirming the menu and delivery times. Cole stared at her, not sure whether to laugh or chew her out. He finally settled for plucking the phone out of her hand. She'll have her assistant call you back, he said before disconnecting the call. Kirsten glared at him. I had time for one more. Oh, she moaned and blew her breath in and out. Cole! Come on, Crispy. Time to go meet our daughter. He helped her out of the chair and wrapped an arm around her. Brooks took up position on the other side, offering his arm to lean on and hand to grip. They made their way slowly out of the office. Congratulations, people called out to them as they passed. He nodded his thanks to everyone. Then someone called, let us know when she's born. We've got a pool going. Cole and Kirsten looked at each other and burst out laughing. Kirsten's laugh broke off in a groan, and the men hurried her into the elevator. Brooks punched the lobby button while Cole rubbed Kirsten's back, trying to ease her pain. The contractions were coming much faster than he'd expected. At this point, he just hoped they made it to the hospital before the baby made her appearance. They hurried as fast as they could through the lobby and out to the waiting car. Brooks got them inside and poked his head in. I'll finish up things here. Don't worry about anything. And let me know when my goddaughter is here so I can come visit. 
He leaned in far enough to kiss Kirsten on her forehead. Then he waved to Cole and backed away so the car could leave. Ready? Cole asked. Kirsten looked up at him, eyes creased with pain but still burning with excitement. So ready, though, just so you know, I'm holding out until tomorrow if at all possible. Why? That's the date I picked for the baby pool. Cole grinned. Well, I picked today, so I hope you don't mind that I'll be encouraging a quick delivery. We hope you have enjoyed our presentation of 69 Million Things I Hate About You by Kira Archer, performed by Kate Waldron. Performance copyright 2017 by Brilliant Publishing, Inc., all rights reserved. For further information concerning this program or other Brilliance audio titles, please call the following toll-free number, 1-800-222-3225, or visit our website at www.brilliantsaudio.com. No part of this recording may be played for an audience or reproduced in any form. It may not be streamed, downloaded, broadcast, or copied without written permission. Address all inquiries to Brilliance Audio, P.O. Box 887, Grand Haven, Michigan, 49417.